8. Of the Bond Svenk, and Sigurd Olstrang. There was a man called Svenk Steinarsen, who was very wealthy, and dwelt in Viken at the Gott River. He had brought up Hakon Magnusson before Thorer of Stieg took him. Svenk had not yet submitted to King Magnus. King Magnus ordered Sigurd Olstrang to be called, and told him he would send him to Svenk with the command that he should quit the king's land and domain. He has not yet submitted to us, or shown us due honor. He added, that there were some lendermen east in Viken, namely Sven Brigjofat, Dag Ilifsen, and Koldron Klack, who could bring this matter into right bearing. Then Sigurd said, I did not know there was the man in Norway against whom three lendermen besides myself were needful. The king replied, Thou needst not take this help, unless it be necessary. Now Sigurd made himself ready for the journey with a ship, sailed east to Viken, and there summoned the lendermen to him. Then a thing was appointed to Viken, to which the people were called who dwelt on the Gott River, besides others. So that it was a numerous assembly. When the thing was formed they had to wait for Svenk. They soon after saw a troop of men coming along, so well furnished with weapons that they looked like pieces of shining ice. And now came Svenk and his people to the thing, and set themselves down in a circle. All were clad in iron, with glowing arms, and five hundred in number. Then Sigurd stood up, and spoke. My master, King Magnus, sends God's salutation in his own to all friends, lendermen and others, his subjects in the kingdom, also to the powerful bonds, and the people in general, with kind words and offers of friendship. And to all who will obey him he offers his friendship and goodwill. Now the king will, with all cheerfulness and peace, show himself a gracious master to all who will submit to him, and to all in his dominions. He will be the leader and defender of all the men of Norway, and it will be good for you to accept his gracious speech, and this offer. Then stood up a man in the troop of the Elfgrims, who was of great stature and grim countenance, clad in a leather cloak, with a halberd on his shoulder, and a great steel hat upon his head. He looked sternly, and said, Here is no need of wheels, says the fox, when he draws the trap over the ice. He said nothing more, but sat down again. Soon after Sigurd Ulstrang stood up again, and spoke thus, But little concern or help have we for the king's affairs from you, Elfgrims, and but little friendship, yet by such means every man shows how much he respects himself. But now I shall produce more clearly the king's errand. Thereupon he demanded land dues and levy dues, together with all other rights of the king, from the great bonds. He bade each of them to consider with himself how they had conducted themselves in these matters, and that they should now promote their own honour, and do the king justice, if they had come short hitherto in doing so. And then he sat down. Then the same man got up in the troop of Elfgrims who had spoken before, lifted his hat a little up, and said, The lads run well, say the Laplanders, who have skates for nothing. Then he sat himself down again. Soon after Sigurd arose, after speaking with the Lendermen, and said that so weighty a message as the kings ought not to be treated lightly as a jest. He was now somewhat angry. And added, that they ought not to receive the king's message and errand so scornfully, for it was not decent. He was dressed in a red or scarlet coat, and had a blue coat over it. He cast off his upper coat and said, Now it is come so far that every one must look to himself, and not loiter and jest with others, for by so doing every man will show what he is. We do not require now to be taught by others. For now we can see ourselves how much we are regarded. But this may be borne with, but not that ye treat so scornfully the king's message. Thereby every one shows how highly he considers himself. There is one man called Svenk Steinarsen, who lives east at the Gott River, and from him the king will have his just land dues, together with his own land, or will banish him from the country. It is of no use here to seek excuses, or to answer with sharp words, for people are to be found who are his equals in power, although he now receives our speech so unworthily. And it is better now than afterwards to return to the right way, and do himself honour, rather than await disgrace for his obstinacy. He then sat down. Svenk then got up, threw back his steel hat, and gave Sigurd many scornful words, and said, Tut! Tut, 
Tis a shame for the dogs, says the proverb, when the fox is allowed to cast their excrements in the peasant's well. Here will be a miracle. Thou useless fellow! With a coat without arms, and a kirtle with skirts, wilt thou drive me out of the country? Thy relation, Sigurd Woolsack, was sent before on this errand, and one called Giel the back thief, and one who had still a worse name. They were a knight in every house, and stole wherever they came. Wilt thou drive me out of the country? Formerly thou wast not so mighty, and thy pride was less when King Hakon, my foster son, was in life. Then thou wert as frightened for him when he met thee on the road as a mouse in a mouse trap, and hid thyself under a heap of clothes, like a dog on board a ship. Thou wast thrust into a leather bag like corn in a sack, and driven from house and farm like a year old colt from the Mares, and dost thou dare to drive me from the land? Thou shouldst rather think thyself lucky to escape from hence with life. Let us stand up and attack him. Then all his men stood up, and made a great clash with their weapons. Then Sven Brigjofot and the other lender men saw there was no other chance for Sigurd but to get him on horseback, which was done, and he rode off into the forest. The end was that Svenk returned home to his farm, and Sigurd Ulstrang came, with great difficulty, by land north to Thrandjum to King Magnus, and told the result of his errand. Did I not say, said the king, that the help of my lender men would be needed? Sigurd was ill pleased with his journey, insisted that he would be revenged, cost what it will, and urged the king much. The king ordered five ships to be fitted out. And as soon as they were ready for sea he sailed south along the land, and then east to Viken, where he was entertained in excellent guest quarters by his lendermen. The king told them he would seek out Svenk. For I will not conceal my suspicion that he thinks to make himself king of Norway. They said that Svenk was both a powerful and an ungovernable man. Now the king went from Viken until he came to Svenk's farm. Then the lendermen desired that they might be put on shore to see how matters stood, and when they came to the land they saw that Svenk had already come down from the farm, and was on the road with a number of well-armed men. The lendermen held up a white shield in the air, as a peace token, and when Svenk saw it he halted his men, and they approached each other. Then said Kolbjorn Clack, King Magnus sends thee God's salutation in his own, and bids thee consider what becomes thee, and do him obedience, and not prepare thyself to give him battle. Kolbjorn offered to mediate peace between them, if he could, and told him to halt his troops. Svenk said he would wait for them where he was. We came out to meet you, he said, that ye might not tread down our cornfields. The lender men returned to the king, and told him all was now at his pleasure. The king said, My doom is soon delivered. He shall fly the country, and never come back to Norway as long as the kingdom is mine. And he shall leave all his goods behind. But will it not be more for thy honour, said Kolbjorn, and give thee a higher reputation among other kings, if, in banishing him from the country, thou shouldst allow him to keep his property, and show himself among other people? and we shall take care that he never comes back while we live. Consider of this, sire, by yourself, and have respect for our assurance. The king replied, Let him then go forth immediately. They went back, therefore, to Svenk, and told him the king's words, and also that the king had ordered him out of the country, and he should show his obedience, since he had forgotten himself towards the king. It is for the honour of both that thou shouldst show obedience to the king. Then Svenk said, There must be some great change if the king speaks agreeably to me, but why should I fly the country and my properties? Listen now to what I say. It appears to me better to die upon my property than to fly from my Udal estates. Tell the king that I will not stir from them even an arrow flight. Kolbjorn replied, This is scarcely prudent, or right. For it is better for one's own honour to give way to the best chief, than to make opposition to one's own loss. A gallant man succeeds wheresoever he goes. And thou wilt be the more respected wheresoever thou art, with men of power, just because thou hast made head so boldly against so powerful a chief. Here are promises, and pay some attention to our errand. We offer thee to manage thy estates, and take them faithfully under our protection, and also never, against thy will, to pay scat for thy land until thou comest back. 
we will pledge our lives and properties upon this. Do not throw away good counsel from thee, and avoid thus the ill fortune of other good men. Then Svank was silent for a short time, and said at last, Your endeavours are wise. But I have my suspicions that ye are changing a little the king's message. In consideration, however, of the great goodwill that ye show me, I will hold your advice in such respect that I will go out of the country for the whole winter, if, according to your promises, I can then retain my estates in peace. Tell the king, also, these my words, that I do this on your account, not on his. Thereupon they returned to the king, and said, that Svank left all in the king's hands. But entreats you to have respect to his honour. He will be away for three years, and then come back, if it be the king's pleasure. Do this. Let all things be done according to what is suitable for the royal dignity and according to our entreaty, now that the matter is entirely in thy power, and we shall do all we can to prevent his returning against thy will. The king replied, Ye treat this matter like men, and, for your sakes, shall all things be as ye desire. Tell him so. They thanked the king, and then went to Svank, and told him the king's gracious intentions. We will be glad, said they, if ye can be reconciled. The king requires, indeed that thy absence shall be for three years. But, if we know the truth rightly, we expect that before that time he will find he cannot do without thee in this part of the country. It will be to thy own future honour, therefore, to agree to this. Svank replies, What condition is better than this? Tell the king that I shall not vex him longer with my presence here, and accept of my goods and estates on this condition. Thereupon he went home with his men, and set off directly. For he had prepared everything beforehand. Coldjorn remains behind, and makes ready a feast for King Magnus, which also was thought of and prepared. Svank, on the other hand, rides up to Gotland with all the men he thought proper to take with him. The king let himself be entertained in guest quarters at his house, returned to Viking, and Svank's estates were nominally the king's, but Coldjorn had them under his charge. The king received guest quarters in Viking, proceeded from thence northwards, and there was peace for a while. But now that the Elfgrims were without a chief, marauding gangs infested them, and the king saw this eastern part of the kingdom would be laid waste. It appeared to him, therefore, most suitable and advisable to make Svank himself oppose the stream, and twice he sent messages to him. But he did not stir until King Magnus himself was south in Denmark, when Svank and the king met, and made a full reconciliation. On which Svank returned home to his house and estates, and was afterwards King Magnus' best and trustiest friend, who strengthened his kingdom on the eastern border, and their friendship continued as long as they lived. 9. King Magnus makes war on the southern Hibuids. King Magnus undertook an expedition out of the country, with many fine men and a good assortment of shipping. With this armament he sailed out into the West Sea, and first came to the Orkney Islands. There he took the two earls, Paul and Erland, prisoners, and sent them east to Norway, and placed his son Sigurd as chief over the islands, leaving some counsellors to assist him. From thence King Magnus, with his followers, proceeded to the southern Hibuids, and when he came there began to burn and lay waste the inhabited places, killing the people and plundering wherever he came with his men. And the country people fled in all directions, some into Scotland Fjord, others south to Cantyre, or out to Ireland, some obtained life and safety by entering into his service. So says Bjorn Crefend. In Lewis Isle with fearful blaze. The house destroying fire plays. To hills and rocks the people fly. Fearing all shelter but the sky. In Uist the king deep crimson made. The lightning of his glancing blade. The peasant lost his land and life. Who dared to bide the Norseman's strife? The hunger battle birds were filled. In sky with blood of foemen killed. And wolves on Tyre's lonely shore. Died red their hairy jaws in gore. The men of Mull were tired of flight. The Scottish foemen would not fight. And many an island girl's wail. Was heard as through the isles we strife sail. 10. Of Lagman, King Gudrod's son. King Magnus came with his forces to the holy island, Iona, 
and gave peace and safety to all men there. It is told that the king opened the door of the little Colum's kirk there, but did not go in, but instantly locked the door again, and said that no man should be so bold as to go into that church hereafter, which has been the case ever since. From thence King Magnus sailed to Islay, where he plundered and burnt, and when he had taken that country he proceeded south around Cantyre, marauding on both sides in Scotland and Ireland, and advanced with his foray to Man, where he plundered. So says Bjorn Crefend. On sandy east plain our shield they spy. From Isla smoke rose heaven high. Whirling up from the flashing blaze. The king's men o'er the island raise. South of Cantire the people fled. Scared by our swords in blood dyed red. And our brave champion onward goes. To meet in man the Norseman's foes. Lagman, Lawman, was the name of the son of Gudrod, king of the Hibuids. Lawman was sent to defend the most northerly islands, but when King Magnus and his army came to the Hibuids, Lawman fled here and there about the isles, and at last King Magnus' men took him and his ship's crew as he was flying over to Ireland. The king put him in irons to secure him. So says Bjorn Crefend. To Gudrod's son no rock or cave. Shoreside or hill, a refuge gave. Hunted around from isle to isle. This lawman found no safe asyle. From isle to isle, o'er firth and sound. Close on his track his foe he found. At Ness the Agder chief at length. Seized him, and iron chained his strength. 11. Of the fall of Earl Huge the Brave. Afterwards King Magnus sailed to Wales. And when he came to the sound of Anglesey there came against him an army from Wales, which was led by two earls, Hugo the Brave, and Hugo the Stout. They began immediately to give battle, and there was a severe conflict. King Magnus shot with the bow, but Huge the Brave was all over in armor, so that nothing was bare about him excepting one eye. King Magnus let fly an arrow at him, as also did a Halagaland man who was beside the king. They both shot at once. The one shaft hit the nose screen of the helmet, which was bent by it to one side, and the other arrow hit the earl's eye, and went through his head, and that was found to be the king's. Earl Huge fell, and the Britons fled with the loss of many people. So says Bjorn Crefend. The swinger of the sword. Stood by Anglesey's ford. His quick shaft flew. And Huge slew. His sword gleamed a while. O'er Anglesey Isle. And his Norseman's band. Scoured the Anglesey land. There was also sung the following verse about it. On the panzer's arrows rattle. Where our Norse king stands in battle. From the helmet's blood streams flow. Where our Norse king draws his bow. His bowstring twangs, its biting hail. Rattles against the ring-linked mail. Up in the land in deadly strife. Our Norse king took Earl Huge's life. King Magnus gained the victory in this battle, and then took Anglesey Isle, which was the farthest south the Norway kings of former days had ever extended their rule. Anglesey is a third part of Wales. After this battle King Magnus turned back with his fleet, and came first to Scotland. Then men went between the Scottish king, Melcom and King Magnus, and a peace was made between them. So that all the islands lying west of Scotland, between which and the mainland he could pass in a vessel with her rudder shipped, should be held to belong to the king of Norway. Now when King Magnus came north to Cantyre, he had a skiff drawn over the strand at Cantyre, and shipped the rudder of it. The king himself sat in the stern sheets, and held the tiller. And thus he appropriated to himself the land that lay on the farboard side. Cantyre is a great district, better than the best of the southern isles of the Hibuids, excepting man. And there is a small neck of land between it and the mainland of Scotland, over which longships are often drawn. 12. Death of the Earls of Orkney King Magnus was all the winter in the southern isles, and his men went over all the fjords of Scotland, rowing within all the inhabited and uninhabited isles, and took possession for the king of Norway of all the islands west of Scotland. King Magnus contracted in marriage his son Sigurd to Byadminia, King Merkjartan's daughter. 
Merkjartan was a son of the Irish King Thialf, and ruled over Connaught. The summer after, King Magnus, with his fleet, returned east to Norway. Earl Erland died of sickness at Nidaros, and is buried there, and Earl Paul died in Bergen. Skopt Ogmundsen, a grandson of Thorberg, was a gallant lenderman, who dwelt at Gisk in Sunmore, and was married to Gudrun, a daughter of Thord Follison. Their children were Ogmund, Finn, Thord, and Thora, who was married to Asolf Skullison. Skopt's and Gudrun's sons were the most promising and popular men in their youth. 13. Quarrels of King Magnus and King Inga Steinkel, the Swedish king, died about the same time, A.D. 1066, as the two heralds fell, and the king who came after him in Svithjad was called Hakon. Afterwards Inga, a son of Steinkel, was king, and was a good and powerful king, strong and stout beyond most men, and he was king of Svithjad when King Magnus was king of Norway. King Magnus insisted that the boundaries of the countries in old times had been so, that the Gott River divided the kingdoms of the Swedish and Norwegian kings, but afterwards the Venner Lake up to Vermeland. Thus King Magnus insisted that he was owner of all the places lying west of the Venner Lake up to Vermeland, which are the districts of Sundal, Nordal, Veyr, and Vardinier, with all the woods belonging thereto. But these had for a long time been under the Swedish dominion, and with respect to Skat were joined to West Gotland, and, besides, the forest settlers preferred being under the Swedish king. King Magnus rode from Viken up to Gotland with a great and fine army, and when he came to the forest settlements he plundered and burnt all round, on which the people submitted, and took the oath of fidelity to him. When he came to the Venner Lake, autumn was advanced and he went out to the island Kvaldensee, and made a stronghold of turf and wood, and dug a ditch around it. When the work was finished, provisions and other necessaries that might be required were brought to it. The king left in it three hundred men, who were the chosen of his forces, and Finn Skoptesen and Sigurd Ulstrang as their commanders. The king himself returned to Viking. 14. Of the Northmen When the Swedish king heard this he drew together people, and the report came that he would ride against these Northmen. But there was delay about his riding, and the Northmen made these lines. The fat-hipped king, with heavy sides. Finds he must mount before he rides. But when the ice set in upon the Venner Lake King Inga rode down, and had near three hundred men with him. He sent a message to the Northmen who sat in the burg that they might retire with all the booty they had taken, and go to Norway. When the messengers brought this message, Sigurd Ulstrang replied to it, saying that King Inga must take the trouble to come, if he wished to drive them away like cattle out of a grass field, and said he must come nearer if he wished them to remove. The messengers returned with this answer to the king, who then rode out with all his army to the island, and again sent a message to the northmen that they might go away, taking with them their weapons, clothes, and horses. But must leave behind all their booty. This they refused. The king made an assault upon them, and they shot at each other. Then the king ordered timber and stones to be collected, and he filled up the ditch. And then he fastened anchors to long spars which were brought up to the timber walls, and, by the strength of many hands, the walls were broken down. Thereafter a large pile of wood was set on fire, and the lighted brands were flung in among them. Then the northmen asked for quarter. The king ordered them to go out without weapons or cloaks. As they went out each of them received a stroke with a whip, and then they set off for Norway, and all the forest men submitted again to King Inga. Sigurd and his people went to King Magnus, and told him their misfortune. 15. King Magnus and Japard When King Magnus was east in Viking, there came to him a foreigner called Japard. He gave himself out for a good knight, and offered his services to King Magnus, for he understood that in the king's dominions there was something to be done. The king received him well. At that time the king was preparing to go to Gotland, on which country the king had pretensions, and besides he would repay the Gotland people the disgrace they had occasioned him in spring, when he was obliged to fly from them. He had then a great force in arms, and the West Gotlanders in the northern districts submitted to him. He set up his camp on the borders, intending to make a foray from thence. When King Inga heard of this he collected troops, and hastened to oppose King Magnus, 
and when King Magnus heard of this expedition, many of the chiefs of the people urged him to turn back. But this the king would not listen to, but in the night time went unsuspectedly against the Swedish king. They met at Foxhorn, and when he was drawing up his men in battle order he asked, Where is Japard? but he was not to be found. Then the king made these verses. Cannot the foreign knight abide? Our rough array, where does he hide? Then a scald who followed the king replied. The king asks where the foreign knight. In our array rides to the fight. Jepard the knight rode quite away. When our men joined in bloody fray. When swords were wet the knight was slow. With his bay horse in front to go. The foreign knight could not abide. Our rough array, and went to hide. There was a great slaughter, and after the battle the field was covered with the Swede slain, and King Inga escaped by flight. King Magnus gained a great victory. Then came Japard riding down from the country, and people did not speak well of him for not being in the fight. He went away, and proceeded westward to England, and the voyage was stormy, and Japard lay in bed. There was an Iceland man called Eljarn, who went to bail out the water in the ship's hold, and when he saw where Japard was lying he made this verse. Does it beseem a courtman bold? Here to be dozing in the hold. The bearded knight should danger face. The leak gains on our ship apace. Here, ply this bucket. Bail who can. We need the work of every man. Our seahorse stands full to the breast. Sluggards and cowards must not rest. When they came west to England, Japard said the Northmen had slandered him. A meeting was appointed, an account came to it, and the case was brought before him for trial. He said he was not much acquainted with law cases, as he was but young, and had only been a short time in office, and also, of all things, he said what he least understood to judge about was poetry. But let us hear what it was. Then Eljarn sang. I heard that in the bloody fight. Japard drove all our foes to flight. Brave Japard would the foe abide. While all our men ran off to hide. At Foxhorn the fight was won. By Japard's valor all alone. Where Japard fought, alone was he. Not one survived to fight or flee. Then said the Count, although I know but little about Skaldcraft, I can hear that this is no slander, but rather the highest praise and honor. Jepard could say nothing against it, yet he felt it was a mockery. 16. Battle of Foxhorn The spring after, as soon as the ice broke up, King Magnus, with a great army, sailed eastwards to the Gott River, and went up the eastern arm of it, laying waste all that belonged to the Swedish dominions. When they came to Foxhorn they landed from their vessels. But as they came over a river on their way an army of Gotland people came against them, and there was immediately a great battle, in which the Northmen were overwhelmed by numbers, driven to flight, and many of them killed near to a waterfall. King Magnus fled, and the Gotlanders pursued, and killed those they could get near. King Magnus was easily known. He was a very stout man, and had a red short cloak over him, and bright yellow hair like silk that fell over his shoulders. Ogman Skoptesen, who was a tall and handsome man, rode on one side of the king. He said, Sire, give me that cloak. The king said, What would you do with it? I would like to have it, said Ogmund, and you have given me greater gifts, Sire. The road was such that there were great and wide plains, so that the Gotlanders and Northmen were always in sight of each other, unless where clumps of wood and bushes concealed them from each other now and then. The king gave Ogmund the cloak and he put it on. When they came out again upon the plain ground, Ogmund and his people rode off right across the road. The Gotlanders, supposing this must be the king, rode all after him, and the king proceeded to the ships. Ogmund escaped with great difficulty, however, he reached the ships at last in safety. King Magnus then sailed down the river, and proceeded north to Viking. 17. Meeting of the Kings at the Gott River The following summer a meeting of the kings was agreed upon at Konghel on the Gott River. And King Magnus, the Swedish king, Inga, and the Danish king, Eirik Sveinsson, all met there, after giving each other safe conduct to the meeting. 
Now when the thing had sat down the kings went forward upon the plain, apart from the rest of the people, and they talked with each other a little while. Then they returned to their people, and a treaty was brought about, by which each should possess the dominions his forefathers had held before him. But each should make good to his own men the waste and manslaughter suffered by them, and then they should agree between themselves about settling this with each other. King Magnus should marry King Inga's daughter Margaret, who afterwards was called Peace Offering. This was proclaimed to the people, and thus, within a little hour, the greatest enemies were made the best of friends. It was observed by the people that none had ever seen men with more of the air of chiefs than these had. King Inga was the largest and stoutest, and, from his age, of the most dignified appearance. King Magnus appeared the most gallant and brisk, and King Eirik the most handsome. But they were all handsome men, stout, gallant, and ready in speech. After this was settled they parted. 18. King Magnus' Marriage King Magnus got Margaret, King Inga's daughter, as above related, and she was sent from Svithjad to Norway with an honorable retinue. King Magnus had some children before, whose names shall here be given. The one of his sons who was of a mean mother was called Eistian, the other, who was a year younger, was called Sigurd, and his mother's name was Thora. Olaf was the name of a third son, who was much younger than the two first mentioned, and whose mother was Sigurd, a daughter of Sax of Vic, who was a respectable man in the Thrandjum country, she was the king's concubine. People say that when King Magnus came home from his Viking cruise to the western countries, he and many of his people brought with them a great deal of the habits and fashion of clothing of those western parts. They went about on the streets with bare legs, and had short kirtles and over cloaks, and therefore his men called him Magnus Barefoot or Bare Leg. Some called him Magnus the Tall, others Magnus the strife lover. He was distinguished among other men by his tall stature. The mark of his height is put down in Mary Church, in the merchant town of Nidaros, which King Harold built. In the northern door there were cut into the wall three crosses, one for Harold's stature, one for Olaf's, and one for Magnus, and which crosses each of them could with the greatest ease kiss. The upper was Harold's cross, the lowest was Magnus and Olaf's was in the middle, about equally distant from both. It is said that Magnus composed the following verses about the emperor's daughter. The ring of arms where blue swords gleam. The battle shout, the eagles scream. The joy of war, no more can please. Matilda is far o'er the seas. My sword may break, my shield be cleft. Of land or life I may be reft. Yet I could sleep, but for one care. One, o'er the seas, with light brown hair. He also composed the following. The time that breeds delay feels long. The scald feels weary of his song. What sweetens, brightens, eases life. Tis a sweet-smiling lovely wife. My time feels long in thing affairs. In things my loved one ne'er appears. The folk full-dressed, while I am sad. Talk and oppose, can I be glad? When King Magnus heard the friendly words the emperor's daughter had spoken about him, that she had said such a man as King Magnus was appeared to her an excellent man, he composed the following. The lover hears, across the sea. A favoring word was breathed to me. The lovely one with light brown hair. May trust her thoughts to senseless air. Her thoughts will find like thoughts in me. And though my love I cannot see, affection's thoughts fly in the wind, and meet each other, true and kind. 19. Of the quarrel of King Magnus and Skopt. Skopt Ogmunson came into variance with King Magnus, and they quarreled about the inheritance of a deceased person which Skopt retained. But the king demanded it with so much earnestness, that it had a dangerous appearance. Many meetings were held about the affair, and Skopt took the resolution that he and his son should never put themselves into the king's power at the same time. And besides there was no necessity to do so. When Skopt was with the king he represented to him that there was relationship between the king and him. And also that he, Skopt, had always been the king's friend, and his father's likewise, and that their friendship had never been shaken. 
He added, people might know that I have sense enough not to hold a strife, sire, with you, if I was wrong in what I asked, but it is inherited from my ancestors to defend my rights against any man, without distinction of persons. The king was just the same on this point, and his resolution was by no means softened by such a speech. Then Skopt went home. 20. Finn Skoptison's Proceedings Then Finn Skoptison went to the king, spoke with him, and entreated him to render justice to the father and son in this business. The king answers angrily and sharply. Then said Finn, I expected something else, sire, from you, than that you would use the law's vexations against me when I took my seat in Kvaldensee Island, which few of your other friends would do. As they said, what was true, that those who were left there were deserted and doomed to death, if King Inga had not shown greater generosity to us than you did, although many consider that we brought shame and disgrace only from thence. The king was not to be moved by this speech, and Finn returned home. 21. Ogman Skoptison's Proceedings Then came Ogman Skoptison to the king. And when he came before him he produced his errand, and begged the king to do what was right and proper towards him and his father. The king insisted that the right was on his side, and said they were, particularly impudent. Then said Ogmund, It is a very easy thing for thee, having the power, to do me and my father injustice, and I must say the old proverb is true, that one whose life you save gives none, or a very bad return. This I shall add, that never again shall I come into thy service, nor my father, if I can help it. Then Ogmund went home, and they never saw each other again. 22. Skopt Ogmundsen's Voyage Abroad The spring after, Skopt Ogmundsen made ready to travel out of the country. They had five long ships all well equipped. His sons, Ogmund, Finn, and Thord, accompanied him on this journey. It was very late before they were ready, and in autumn they went over to Flanders, and wintered there. Early in spring they sailed westward to Valland, and stayed there all summer. Then they sailed further, and through Norvasund. And came in autumn to Rome, where Skopt died. All, both father and sons, died on this journey. Thord, who died in Sicily, lived the longest. It is a common saying among the people that Skopt was the first Northman who sailed through Norvasund. And this voyage was much celebrated. 23. Miracle of King Olaf the Saint at a Fire It happened once in the merchant town, Nidaros, where King Olaf reposes, that there broke out a fire in the town which spread around. Then Olaf's shrine was taken out of the church, and set up opposite the fire. Thereupon came a crazy foolish man, struck the shrine, threatened the holy saint, and said all must be consumed by the flames, both churches and other houses, if he did not save them by his prayers. Now the burning of the church did cease, by the help of Almighty God, but the insane man got sore eyes on the following night, and he lay there until King Olaf entreated God Almighty to be merciful to him. After which he recovered in the same church. 24. Miracle of King Olaf on a Lame Woman It happened once in the merchant town that a woman was brought to the place where the holy King Olaf reposes. She was so miserably shaped, that she was altogether crumpled up, so that both her feet lay in a circle against her loins. But as she was diligent in her prayers, often weeping and making vows to King Olaf, he cured her great infirmities. So that feet, legs, and other limbs straightened, and every limb and part came to the right use for which they were made. Before she could not creep there, and now she went away active and brisk to her family and home. 25. War in Ireland when King Magnus had been nine years king of Norway, A.D. 1094-1102, he equipped himself to go out of the country with a great force. He sailed out into the West Sea with the finest men who could be got in Norway. All the powerful men of the country followed him, such as Sigurd Franesson, Vidkin Johnson, Dag Eilifsson, Sirk of San, Ivan Dalboge, the king's marshal Ulf Franesson, brother of Sigurd, and many other great men. With all this armament the king sailed west to the Orkney Islands, from whence he took with him Earl Erlen's sons, Magnus and Erling, and then sailed to the southern Hibutes. But as he lay under the Scotch land, Magnus Erlenson ran away in the night from the king's ship, 
swam to the shore, escaped into the woods, and came at last to the Scotch king's court. King Magnus sailed to Ireland with his fleet, and plundered there. King Merkjartan came to his assistance, and they conquered a great part of the country, both Dublin and Dyflinerskyre, Dublin Shire. King Magnus was in winter, A.D. 1102, up in Connaught with King Merkjartan, but set men to defend the country he had taken. Toward spring both kings went westward with their army all the way to Ulster, where they had many battles, subdued the country, and had conquered the greatest part of Ulster when Merkjartan returned home to Connaught. 26. King Magnus' foray on the land. King Magnus rigged his ships, and intended returning to Norway, but set his men to defend the country of Dublin. He lay at Ulster ready for sea with his whole fleet. As they thought they needed cattle for ship provision, King Magnus sent a message to King Merkjartan, telling him to send some cattle for slaughter. And appointed the day before Bartholomew's day as the day they should arrive, if the messengers reached him in safety, but the cattle had not made their appearance the evening before Bartholomew's mass. On the mass day itself, when the sun rose in the sky, King Magnus went on shore himself with the greater part of his men, to look after his people, and to carry off cattle from the coast. The weather was calm, the sun shone, and the road lay through mires and mosses, and there were paths cut through, but there was brushwood on each side of the road. When they came somewhat farther, they reached a height from which they had a wide view. They saw from it a great dust rising up the country, as of horsemen, and they said to each other, that must be the Irish army. But others said, it was their own men returning with the cattle. They halted there, and Ivan Alboj said, how, sire, do you intend to direct the march? The men think we are advancing imprudently. You know the Irish are treacherous. Think, therefore, of a good counsel for your men. Then the king said, Let us draw up our men, and be ready, if there be treachery. This was done, and the king and Ivan went before the line. King Magnus had a helmet on his head. A red shield, in which was inlaid a gilded lion, and was girt with the sword of leg bit, of which the hilt was of tooth, ivory, and hand grip wound about with gold thread, and the sword was extremely sharp. In his hand he had a short spear, and a red silk short cloak, over his coat, on which, both before and behind, was embroidered a lion in yellow silk, and all men acknowledged that they never had seen a brisker, statelier man. Ivan had also a red silk cloak like the king's, and he also was a stout, handsome, warlike man. 27. Fall of King Magnus. When the dust cloud approached nearer they knew their own men, who were driving the cattle. The Irish king had been faithful to the promises he had given the king, and had sent them. Thereupon they all turned towards the ships, and it was midday. When they came to the mires they went but slowly over the boggy places. And then the Irish started up on every side against them from every bushy point of land, and the battle began instantly. The northmen were going divided in various heaps, so that many of them fell. Then said Ivan to the king, Unfortunate is this march to our people, and we must instantly hit upon some good plan. The king answered, Call all the men together with the war horns under the banner, and the men who are here shall make a rampart with their shields, and thus we will retreat backwards out of the mires. And we will clear ourselves fast enough when we get upon firm ground. The Irish shot boldly, and although they fell in crowds, there came always two in the place of one. Now when the king had come to the nearest ditch there was a very difficult crossing, and few places were passable, so that many northmen fell there. Then the king called to his lenderman Thorgrim Skinhifa, who was an upland man, and ordered him to go over the ditch with his division. We shall defend you, said he, in the meantime, so that no harm shall come to you. Go out then to those homes, and shoot at them from thence, for ye are good bowmen. When Thorgrim and his men came over the ditch they cast their shields behind their backs, and set off to the ships. When the king saw this, he said, Thou art deserting thy king in an unmanly way. I was foolish in making thee a lenderman, and driving Sigurd Hund out of the country, for never would he have behaved so. King Magnus received a wound, being pierced by a spear through both thighs above the knees. 
The king laid hold of the shaft between his legs, broke the spear in two, and said, Thus we break spear shafts, my lads, let us go briskly on. Nothing hurts me. A little after King Magnus was struck in the neck with an Irish axe, and this was his death wound. Then those who were behind fled. Vidkin Johnson instantly killed the man who had given the king his death wound, and fled, after having received three wounds, but brought the king's banner and the sword leg bit to the ships. Vidkin was the last man who fled. The other next to him was Sigurd Franesson, and the third before him, Dag Ilifsson. There fell with King Magnus, Ivan Dalboge, Ulf Franesson, and many other great people. Many of the Northmen fell, but many more of the Irish. The Northmen who escaped sailed away immediately in autumn. Erling, Earl Erlen's son, fell with King Magnus in Ireland, but the men who fled from Ireland came to the Orkney Islands. Now when King Sigurd heard that his father had fallen, he set off immediately, leaving the Irish king's daughter behind, and proceeded in autumn with the whole fleet directly to Norway. 28. Of King Magnus and Vidkin Johnson King Magnus was ten years king of Norway, A.D. 1094-1105, and in his days there was good peace kept within the country, but the people were sorely oppressed with levies. King Magnus was beloved by his men, but the bonds thought him harsh. The words have been transmitted from him that he said when his friends observed that he proceeded incautiously when he was on his expeditions abroad, the kings are made for honor, not for long life. King Magnus was nearly thirty years of age when he fell. Vidkin did not fly until he had killed the man who gave the king his mortal wound, and for this cause King Magnus' sons had him in the most affectionate regard. Saga of Sigurd the Crusader and his brothers Eistian and Olaf Preliminary Remarks Agrip, Fagerskina, and Morkinskina more or less complete the story of the sons of Magnus. They contain some things omitted by Snor, while, on the other hand, some facts related by Snor are not found in the above sources. Thjodrek the monk tells of Sigurd that he made a journey to Jerusalem, conquered many heathen cities, and among them Sidon. That he captured a cave defended by robbers, received presents from Baldwin, returned to Norway in Eistian's lifetime, and became insane, as a result, as some say, of a poisonous drink. The three brothers became kings in the year A.D. 1103. Olaf died 1115, Eistian 1122 or 1123, Sigurd 1130. Skalds quoted in this saga are, Thorin Stutfeld, Einar Skulason, Halder Skvaldra, and Arn Fjöreskif. 1. Beginning of the reign of King Magnus' sons. After King Magnus Barefoot's fall, his sons, Eistian, Sigurd, and Olaf, took the kingdom of Norway. Eistian got the northern, and Sigurd the southern part of the country. King Olaf was then four or five years old, and the third part of the country which he had was under the management of his two brothers. King Sigurd was chosen king when he was thirteen or fourteen years old, and Eistian was a year older. King Sigurd left west of the sea the Irish king's daughter. When King Magnus' sons were chosen kings, the men who had followed Skopt Ogmundsen returned home. Some had been to Jerusalem, some to Constantinople. And there they had made themselves renowned, and they had many kinds of novelties to talk about. By these extraordinary tidings many men in Norway were incited to the same expedition. And it was also told that the Northmen who liked to go into the military service at Constantinople found many opportunities of getting property. Then these Northmen desired much that one of the two kings, either Eistian or Sigurd, should go as commander of the troop which was preparing for this expedition. The kings agreed to this, and carried on the equipment at their common expense. Many great men, both of the lendermen and bonds, took part in this enterprise, and when all was ready for the journey it was determined that Sigurd should go, and Eistian in the meantime, should rule the kingdom upon their joint account. Two. Of the Earls of Orkney. A year or two after King Magnus Barefoot's fall, Hakon, a son of Earl Paul, came from Orkney. The kings gave him the earldom and government of the Orkney Islands, as the earls before him, his father Paul or his uncle Erland, had possessed it, and Earl Hakon then sailed back immediately to Orkney. 3. 
King Sigurd's Journey Out of the Country For years after the fall of King Magnus, A.D. 1107, King Sigurd sailed with his people from Norway. He had then sixty ships. So says Thorin Stutfeld. A young king just and kind. People of loyal mind. Such brave men soon agree. To distant lands they sail with glee. To the distant holy land. A brave and pious band. Magnificent and gay. In sixty long ships glide away. King Sigurd sailed in autumn to England, where Henry, son of William the Bastard, was then king, and Sigurd remained with him all winter. So says Einar Skulison. The king is on the waves. The storm he boldly braves. His ocean steed. With winged speed. O'er the white flashing surges. To England's coast he urges. And there he stays the winter o'er. More gallant king ne'er trod that shore. 4. Of King Sigurd's Journey In spring King Sigurd and his fleet sailed westward to Valland, A.D. 1108, and in autumn came to Galicia, where he stayed the second winter, A.D. 1109. So says Einar Skulison. Our king, whose land so wide. No kingdom stands beside. In Jacob's land next winter spent. On holy things intent. And I have heard the royal youth. Cut off an earl who swerved from truth. Our brave king will endure no ill. The hawks with him will get their fill. It went thus, the earl who ruled over the land made an agreement with King Sigurd, that he should provide King Sigurd and his men a market at which they could purchase victuals all the winter, but this he did not fulfill longer than to about Yule. It began then to be difficult to get food and necessaries, for it is a poor barren land. Then King Sigurd with a great body of men went against a castle which belonged to the earl, and the earl fled from it, having but few people. King Sigurd took there a great deal of victuals and of other booty, which he put on board of his ships, and then made ready and proceeded westward to Spain. It so fell out, as the king was sailing past Spain, that some Vikings who were cruising for plunder met him with a fleet of galleys, and King Sigurd attacked them. This was his first battle with heathen men. And he won it, and took eight galleys from them. So says Halder Squaldra. Bold Vikings, not slow. To the death fray to go. Meet our Norse king by chance. And their galleys advance. The bold Vikings lost. Many a man of their host. And eight galleys too. With cargo and crew. Thereafter King Sigurd sailed against a castle called Sintre and fought another battle. This castle is in Spain, and was occupied by many heathens, who from thence plundered Christian people. King Sigurd took the castle, and killed every man in it, because they refused to be baptized, and he got there an immense booty. So says Halder Squaldra. From Spain I have much news to tell. Of what our generous king befell. And first he routs the Viking crew. At Sintra next the heathen slew. The men he treated as God's foes. Who dared the true faith to oppose. No man he spared who would not take. The Christian faith for Jesus' sake. 5. Lisbon taken. After this King Sigurd sailed with his fleet to Lisbon, which is a great city in Spain, half Christian and half heathen. For there lies the division between Christian Spain and heathen Spain, and all the districts which lie west of the city are occupied by heathens. Their king Sigurd had his third battle with the heathens, and gained the victory, and with it a great booty. So says Halder Squaldra. The son of kings on Lisbon's plains. A third and bloody battle gains. He and his Norsemen boldly land. Running their stout ships on the strand. Then King Sigurd sailed westwards along heathen Spain, and brought up at a town called Alcas. And here he had his fourth battle with the heathens, and took the town, and killed so many people that the town was left empty. They got there also immense booty. So says Halder Squaldra. A fourth great battle, I am told. Our Norse king and his people hold. At Alcas, and here again. 
the victory fell to our Norsemen. And also this verse. I heard that through the town he went. And heathen widows wild lament. Resounded in the empty halls. For every townsman flies or falls. 6. Battle in the island Formentera. King Sigurd then proceeded on his voyage, and came to Norfasund, and in the sound he was met by a large Viking force, and the king gave them battle, and this was his fifth engagement with heathens since the time he left Norway. He gained the victory here also. So says Halder Squaldra. Ye moistened your dry swords with blood. As through Norfasund ye stood. The screaming raven got a feast. As ye sailed onward to the east. King Sigurd then sailed eastward along the coast of Circland, and came to an island there called Formentera. There a great many heathen moors had taken up their dwelling in a cave, and had built a strong stone wall before its mouth. They harried the country all round, and carried all their booty to their cave. King Sigurd landed on this island, and went to the cave. But it lay in a precipice, and there was a high winding path to the stone wall, and the precipice above projected over it. The heathens defended the stone wall, and were not afraid of the Northmen's arms. For they could throw stones, or shoot down upon the Northmen under their feet, neither did the Northmen, under such circumstances, dare to mount up. The heathens took their clothes and other valuable things, carried them out upon the wall, spread them out before the Northmen, shouted, and defied them, and upbraided them as cowards. Then Sigurd fell upon this plan. He had two ship's boats, such as we call barks, drawn up the precipice right above the mouth of the cave, and had thick ropes fastened around the stem, stern, and hull of each. In these boats as many men went as could find room, and then the boats were lowered by the ropes down in front of the mouth of the cave. And the men in the boats shot with stones and missiles into the cave, and the heathens were thus driven from the stone wall. Then Sigurd with his troops climbed up the precipice to the foot of the stone wall, which they succeeded in breaking down, so that they came into the cave. Now the heathens fled within the stone wall that was built across the cave. On which the king ordered large trees to be brought to the cave, made a great pile in the mouth of it, and set fire to the wood. When the fire and smoke got the upper hand, some of the heathens lost their lives in it, some fled. Some fell by the hands of the northmen, and part were killed, part burned, and the northmen made the greatest booty they had got on all their expeditions. So says Halder Squaldra. Formentera lay. In the victor's way. His ship stems fly. To victory. The blue men there. Must fire bear. And Norsemen steal. At their hearts feel. And also thus. Twas a feat of renown. The boat lowered down. With a boat's crew brave. In front of the cave. While up the rock scaling. And comrades up trailing. The Norsemen gain. And the blue men are slain. And also Thorin Stutfeld says. The king's men up the mountain side. Drag two boats from the ocean's tide. The two boats lay. Like hill wolves gray. Now o'er the rock in ropes they're swinging. Well manned, and death to blue men bringing. They hang before. The robber's door. 7. Of the battles of Evisa and Menorca. Thereafter King Sigurd proceeded on his expedition, and came to an island called Evisa, Evitsa, and had there his seventh battle, and gained a victory. So says Halder Squaldra. His ships at Evitsa now ride. The kings, whose fame spreads far and wide. And here the bearers of the shield. Their arms again in battle wield. Thereafter King Sigurd came to an island called Manork, Menorca, and held there his eighth battle with heathen men, and gained the victory. So says Halder Squaldra. On green Menorca's plains. The eighth battle now he gains. Again the heathen foe. Falls at the Norse king's blow. 8. Duke Roger made a king. In spring King Sigurd came to Sicily, A.D. 1109, and remained a long time there. There was then a Duke Roger in Sicily, who received the king kindly, and invited him to a feast. 
King Sigurd came to it with a great retinue, and was splendidly entertained. Every day Duke Roger stood at the company's table, doing service to the king. But the seventh day of the feast, when the people had come to table, and had wiped their hands, King Sigurd took the duke by the hand, led him up to the high seat, and saluted him with the title of king. And gave the right that there should be always a king over the dominion of Sicily, although before there had only been earls or dukes over that country. 9. Of King Roger King Roger of Sicily was a very great king. He won and subdued all Apulia, and many large islands besides in the Greek sea, and therefore he was called Roger the Great. His son was William, king of Sicily, who for a long time had great hostility with the emperor of Constantinople. King William had three daughters, but no son. One of his daughters he married to the Emperor Henry, a son of the Emperor Frederick, and their son was Frederick, who for a short time after was Emperor of Rome. His second daughter was married to the Duke of Kipper. The third daughter, Margaret, was married to the chief of the Corsairs, but the Emperor Henry killed both these brothers-in-law. The daughter of Roger the Great, King of Sicily, was married to the Emperor Manuel of Constantinople, and their son was the Emperor Kurgilax. 10. King Sigurd's Expedition to Palestine In the summer, A.D. 1110, King Sigurd sailed across the Greek Sea to Palestine, and thereupon went up to Jerusalem, where he met Baldwin, King of Palestine. King Baldwin received him particularly well, and rode with him all the way to the river Jordan, and then back to the city of Jerusalem. Einar Skulison speaks thus of it. Good reason has the skald to sing. The generous temper of the king. Whose sea-cold keel from northern waves. Plows the blue sea that green isles laves. At acre scarce were we made fast. In holy ground our anchors cast. When the king made a joyful morn. To all who toil with him had borne. And again he made these lines. To Jerusalem he came. He who loves war's noble game. The scald no greater monarch finds. Beneath the heaven's wide hall of winds. All sin and evil from him flings. In Jordan's wave, for all his sins. Which all must praise, he pardon wins. King Sigurd stayed a long time in the land of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, in autumn, and in the beginning of winter. 11. Sidon Taken King Baldwin made a magnificent feast for King Sigurd and many of his people, and gave him many holy relics. By the orders of King Baldwin and the Patriarch, there was taken a splinter off the holy cross, and on this holy relic both made oath, that this wood was of the holy cross upon which God himself had been tortured. Then this holy relic was given to King Sigurd, with the condition that he, and twelve other men with him, should swear to promote Christianity with all his power, and erect an archbishop's seat in Norway if he could. And also that the cross should be kept where the holy King Olaf reposed, and that he should introduce tithes, and also pay them himself. After this King Sigurd returned to his ships at Acre. And then King Baldwin prepared to go to Syria, to a heathen town called Sait. On this expedition King Sigurd accompanied him, and after the kings had besieged the town some time it surrendered, and they took possession of it, and of a great treasure of money, and their men found other booty. King Sigurd made a present of his share to King Baldwin. So say Halder Skvaldra. He who for wolves provides the feast. Seized on the city in the east. The heathen nest, and honor drew. And gold to give, from those he slew. Einar Skulison also tells of it. The Norseman's king, the skalds relate. Has ta'en the heathen town of Sait. The slinging engine with dread noise. Gables and roofs with stones destroys. The town wall totters too, it falls. The Norsemen mount the blackened walls. He who stains read the raven's bill. Has won, the town lies at his will. Thereafter King Sigurd went to his ships and made ready to leave Palestine. They sailed north to the island Cyprus. And King Sigurd stayed there a while, and then went to the Greek country, and came to the land with all his fleet at Angelsons. Here he lay still for a fortnight, 
although every day it blew a breeze for going before the wind to the north. But Sigurd would wait a side wind, so that the sails might stretch fore and aft in the ship. For in all his sails there was silk joined in, before and behind in the sail, and neither those before nor those behind the ships could see the slightest appearance of this, if the vessel was before the wind, so they would rather wait a side wind. 12. Sigurd's Expedition to Constantinople When King Sigurd sailed into Constantinople, he steered near the land. Over all the land there are bergs, castles, country towns, the one upon the other without interval. There from the land one could see into the bites of the sails, and the sails stood so close beside each other, that they seemed to form one enclosure. All the people turned out to see King Sigurd sailing past. The Emperor Kurjalax had also heard of King Sigurd's expedition, and ordered the city port of Constantinople to be opened, which is called the Gold Tower, through which the Emperor rides when he has been long absent from Constantinople. Or has made a campaign in which he has been victorious. The Emperor had precious cloth spread out from the Gold Tower to Lakjarna, which is the name of the Emperor's most splendid hall. King Sigurd ordered his men to ride in great state into the city, and not to regard all the new things they might see, and this they did. King Sigurd and his followers rode with this great splendor into Constantinople, and then came to the magnificent hall, where everything was in the grandest style. King Sigurd remained here some time. The Emperor Kurjalax sent his men to him to ask if he would rather accept from the Emperor six lisbund of gold, or would have the Emperor give the games in his honor which the Emperor was used to have played at the Padrim. King Sigurd preferred the games, and the messengers said the spectacle would not cost the Emperor less than the money offered. Then the Emperor prepared for the games, which were held in the usual way. But this day everything went on better for the king than for the queen, for the queen has always the half part in the games, and their men, therefore, always strive against each other in all games. The Greeks accordingly think that when the king's men win more games at the Padrim than the queen's, the king will gain the victory when he goes into battle. People who have been in Constantinople tell that the Padrim is thus constructed, a high wall surrounds a flat plain, which may be compared to a round bare thing place, with earthen banks all around at the stone wall. On which banks the spectators sit. But the games themselves are in the flat plain. There are many sorts of old events represented concerning the Azas, Volsungs, and Jukungs, in these games. And all the figures are cast in copper, or metal, with so great art that they appear to be living things, and to the people it appears as if they were really present in the games. The games themselves are so artfully and cleverly managed, that people appear to be riding in the air, and at them also are used shot fire, one, and all kinds of harp playing, singing, and music instruments. End notes, 1, fireworks, or the Greek fire, probably were used. L. 13, Sigurd and the Emperor of Constantinople. It is related that King Sigurd one day was to give the emperor a feast, and he ordered his men to provide sumptuously all that was necessary for the entertainment. And when all things were provided which are suitable for an entertainment given by a great personage to persons of high dignity, King Sigurd ordered his men to go to the street in the city where firewood was sold. As they would require a great quantity to prepare the feast. They said the king need not be afraid of wanting firewood, for every day many loads were brought into the town. When it was necessary, however, to have firewood, it was found that it was all sold, which they told the king. He replied, Go and try if you can get walnuts. They will answer as well as wood for fuel. They went and got as many as they needed. Now came the emperor, and his grandees and court, and sat down to table. All was very splendid. And King Sigurd received the emperor with great state, and entertained him magnificently. When the queen and the emperor found that nothing was wanting, she sent some persons to inquire what they had used for firewood. And they came to a house filled with walnuts, and they came back and told the queen. Truly, said she, this is a magnificent king, who spares no expense where his honor is concerned. She had contrived this to try what they would do when they could get no firewood to dress their feast with. 14. King Sigurd the Crusaders Return Home King Sigurd soon after prepared for his return home. 
he gave the emperor all his ships. And the valuable figureheads which were on the king's ships were set up in Peter's church, where they have since been to be seen. The emperor gave the king many horses and guides to conduct him through all his dominions. Then King Sigurd left Constantinople, but a great many northmen remained, and went into the emperor's pay. Then King Sigurd travelled from Bulgaria, and through Hungary, Pannonia, Swabia, and Bavaria, where he met the Roman emperor, Lotharius, who received him in the most friendly way, gave him guides through his dominions, and had markets established for him at which he could purchase all he required. When King Sigurd came to Slesvig in Denmark, Earl Eilif made a sumptuous feast for him, and it was then midsummer. In Hydeby he met the Danish king, Nicholas, who received him in the most friendly way, made a great entertainment for him, accompanied him north to Jutland, and gave him a ship provided with everything needful. From thence the king returned to Norway, and was joyfully welcomed on his return to his kingdom, A.D. 1110. It was the common talk among the people, that none had ever made so honourable a journey from Norway as this of King Sigurd. He was twenty years of age, and had been three years on these travels. His brother Olaf was then twelve years old. 15. Eystein's doings in the meantime. King Eystein had also effected much in the country that was useful while King Sigurd was on his journey. He established a monastery at Nordens in Bergen, and endowed it with much property. He also built Michael's church, which is a very splendid stone temple. In the king's house there he also built the church of the apostles, and the great hall, which is the most magnificent wooden structure that was ever built in Norway. He also built a church at Agdanes with a parapet, and a harbour, where formerly there had been a barren spot only. In Nidaros he built in the king's street the church of St. Nicholas, which was particularly ornamented with carved work, and all in wood. He also built a church north in Vagar in Halagaland, and endowed it with property and revenues. 16. Of King Eystein. King Eystein sent a verbal message to the most intelligent and powerful of the men of Jamtaland, and invited them to him, received them all as they came with great kindness. Accompanied them part of the way home, and gave them presents, and thus enticed them into a friendship with him. Now as many of them became accustomed to visit him and receive gifts from him, and he also sent gifts to some who did not come themselves, he soon gained the favor of all the people who had most influence in the country. Then he spoke to the Jantaland people, and told them they had done ill in turning away from the kings of Norway, and withdrawing from them their taxes and allegiance. He began by saying how the Jantaland people had submitted to the reign of Hakon, the foster son of Athelstain, and had long afterwards been subjected to the kings of Norway. And he represented to them how many useful things they could get from Norway, and how inconvenient it was for them to apply to the Swedish king for what they needed. By these speeches he brought matters so far that the Jantaland people of their own accord offered to be subject to him, which they said was useful and necessary for them. And thus, on both sides, it was agreed that the Jantalanders should put their whole country under King Eystein. The first beginning was with the men of consequence, who persuaded the people to take an oath of fidelity to King Eystein. And then they went to King Eystein and confirmed the country to him by oath, and this arrangement has since continued for a long time. King Eystein thus conquered Jantaland by his wisdom, and not by hostile inroads, as some of his forefathers had done. 17. Of King Eystein's Perfections King Eystein was the handsomest man that could be seen. He had blue open eyes. His hair yellow and curling, his stature not tall, but of the middle size. He was wise, intelligent, and acquainted with the laws and history. He had much knowledge of mankind, was quick in counsel, prudent in words, and very eloquent and very generous. He was very merry, yet modest, and was liked and beloved, indeed, by all the people. He was married to Ingebjorg, a daughter of Guthorm, son of Thor of Stieg, and their daughter was Maria, who afterwards married Gudbrand Skafhoxen. 18. Of Ivar Ingemunsen. King Eystein had in many ways improved the laws and privileges of the country people, and kept strictly to the laws, and he made himself acquainted with all the laws of Norway, and showed in everything great prudence and understanding. What a valuable man King Eystein was, how full of friendship, 
and how much he turned his mind to examining and avoiding everything that could be of disadvantage to his friends. May be seen from his friendship to an Iceland man called Ivar Ingemundsen. The man was witty, of great family, and also a poet. The king saw that Ivar was out of spirits, and asked him why he was so melancholy. Before, when thou wast with us, we had much amusement with thy conversation. I know thou art a man of too good an understanding to believe that I would do anything against thee. Tell me then what it is. He replied, I cannot tell thee what it is. Then said the king, I will try to guess what it is. Are there any men who displease thee? To this he replied, No. Dost thou think thou art held in less esteem by me than thou wouldst like to be? To this he also replied, No. Hast thou observed anything whatever that has made an impression on thee at which thou art ill pleased? He replied, It was not this either. The king, would you like to go to other chiefs or to other men? To this he answered, No. The king, it is difficult now to guess. Is there any girl here, or in any other country, to whom thy affections are engaged? He said it was so. The king said, Do not be melancholy on that account. Go to Iceland when spring sets in, and I shall give thee money, and presents, and with these my letters and seal to the men who have the principal sway there, and I know no man there who will not obey my persuasions or threats. Ivar replied, My fate is heavier, sire, for my own brother has the girl. Then said the king, Throw it out of thy mind, and I know a counsel against this. After you'll I will travel in guest quarters. Thou shalt come along with me, and thou wilt have an opportunity of seeing many beautiful girls, and, provided they are not of the royal stock, I will get thee one of them in marriage. Ivar replies, Sire, my fate is still the heavier. For as oft as I see beautiful and excellent girls I only remember the more that girl, and they increase my misery. The king, then I will give thee property to manage, and estates for thy amusement. He replied, For that I have no desire. The king, then I will give thee money, that thou mayest travel in other countries. He said he did not wish this. Then said the king, It is difficult for me to seek farther, for I have proposed everything that occurs to me. There is but one thing else, and that is but little compared to what I have offered thee. Come to me every day after the tables are removed, and, if I am not sitting upon important business, I shall talk with thee about the girl in every way that I can think of, and I shall do so at leisure. It sometimes happens that sorrow is lightened by being brought out openly, and thou shalt never go away without some gift. He replied, This I will do, sire, and return thanks for this inquiry. And now they did so constantly. And when the king was not occupied with weightier affairs he talked with him, and his sorrow by degrees wore away, and he was again in good spirits. 19. Of King Sigurd King Sigurd was a stout and strong man, with brown hair. Of a manly appearance, but not handsome, well grown, of little speech, and often not friendly, but good to his friends, and faithful, not very eloquent, but moral and polite. King Sigurd was self-willed, and severe in his revenge. Strict in observing the law, was generous, and withal an able, powerful king. His brother Olaf was a tall, thin man, handsome in countenance, lively, modest, and popular. When all these brothers, Eistian, Sigurd and Olaf were kings of Norway, they did away with many burthens which the Danes had laid upon the people in the time that Sven Alfifason ruled Norway. And on this account they were much beloved, both by the people and the great men of the country. 20. Of King Sigurd's Dream once King Sigurd fell into low spirits, so that few could get him to converse, and he sat but a short time at the drinking table. This was heavy on his counsellors, friends, and court. And they begged King Eistian to consider how they could discover the cause why the people who came to the king could get no reply to what they laid before him. King Eistian answered them, that it was difficult to speak with the king about this. But at last, on the entreaty of many, he promised to do it. Once, when they were both together, King Eistian brought the matter before his brother, and asked the cause of his melancholy. It is a great grief, sire, to many to see thee so melancholy. 
and we would like to know what has occasioned it, or if perchance thou hast heard any news of great weight. King Sigurd replies, that it was not so. Is it then, brother, says King Eistian, that you would like to travel out of the country, and augment your dominions as our father did? He answered, that it was not that either. Is it, then, that any man here in the country has offended? To this also the king said, No. Then I would like to know if you have dreamt anything that has occasioned this depression of mind. The king answered that it was so. Tell me, then, brother, thy dream. King Sigurd said, I will not tell it, unless thou interpret it as it may turn out, and I shall be quick at perceiving if thy interpretation be right or not. King Eistian replies, This is a very difficult matter, sire, on both sides. As I am exposed to thy anger if I cannot interpret it, and to the blame of the public if I can do nothing in the matter, but I will rather fall under your displeasure, even if my interpretation should not be agreeable. King Sigurd replies, It appeared to me, in a dream, as if we brothers were all sitting on a bench in front of Christ Church in Thrandjum. And it appeared to me as if our relative, King Olaf the Saint, came out of the church adorned with the royal raiment glancing and splendid, and with the most delightful and joyful countenance. He went to our brother King Olaf, took him by the hand, and said cheerfully, to him, Come with me, friend. On which he appeared to stand up and go into the church. Soon after King Olaf the saint came out of the church, but not so gay and brilliant as before. Now he went to thee, brother, and said to thee that thou shouldst go with him, on which he led thee with him, and ye went into the church. Then I thought, and waited for it, that he would come to me, and meet me, but it was not so. Then I was seized with great sorrow, and great dread and anxiety fell upon me, so that I was altogether without strength, and then I awoke. King Eistian replies, Thus I interpret your dream, sire, that the bench betokens the kingdom we brothers have. And as you thought King Olaf came with so glad a countenance to our brother, King Olaf, he will likely live the shortest time of us brothers, and have all good to expect hereafter. For he is amiable, young in years, and has gone but little into excess, and King Olaf the saint must help him. But as you thought he came towards me, but not with so much joy, I may possibly live a few years longer, but not become old, and I trust his providence will stand over me. But that he did not come to me with the same splendor and glory as to our brother Olaf, that will be because, in many ways, I have sinned and transgressed his command. If he delayed coming to thee, I think that in no way betokens thy death, but rather a long life, but it may be that some heavy accident may occur to thee, as there was an unaccountable dread overpowering thee. But I foretell that thou will be the oldest of us, and wilt rule the kingdom longest. Then said Sigurd, This is well and intelligently interpreted, and it is likely it will be so. And now the king began to be cheerful again. 21. Of King Sigurd's Marriage King Sigurd married Malmfred, a daughter of King Harald Valdemarsson, eastward in Novgorod. King Harald Valdemarsson's mother was Queen Gaida the Old, a daughter of the Swedish king, Inga Steinkelsen. Harald Valdemarsson's other daughter, sister to Malmfred, was Ingebjorg, who was married to Knut Lavard, a son of the Danish king, Eirik the Good, and grandson of King Sven Ulfsson. Knuts and Ingebjorg's children were, the Danish king, Valdemar, who came to the Danish kingdom after Sven Eriksson, and daughters Margaret, Christina, and Catherine. Margaret was married to Stig Vidald. And their daughter was Christina, married to the Swedish king, Karl Sorkvisen, and their son was King Sorkver. 22. Of the Cases Before the Thing The king's relative, Sigurd Franesson, came into strife with King Sigurd. He had had the Lapland collectorship on the king's account, because of their relationship and long friendship, and also of the many services Sigurd Franesson had done to the kings, for he was a very distinguished, popular man. But it happened to him, as it often does to others, that persons more wicked and jealous than upright slandered him to King Sigurd, and whispered in the king's ear that he took more of the Laplanders' tribute to himself than was proper. They spoke so long about this, that King Sigurd conceived a dislike and anger to him, and sent a message to him. When he appeared before the king, the king carried these feelings with him, and said, 
I did not expect that thou shouldst have repaid me for thy great fiefs and other dignities by taking the king's property. And abstracting a greater portion of it than is allowable. Sigurd Franesson replies, It is not true that has been told you, for I have only taken such portion as I had your permission to take. King Sigurd replies, Thou shalt not slip away with this. But the matter shall be seriously treated before it comes to an end. With that they parted. Soon after, by the advice of his friends, the king laid an action against Sigurd Franesson at the thing meeting in Bergen, and would have him made an outlaw. Now when the business took this turn, and appeared so dangerous, Sigurd Franesson went to King Eystein, and told him what mischief King Sigurd intended to do him, and entreated his assistance. King Eystein replied, This is a difficult matter that you propose to me, to speak against my brother, and there is a great difference between defending a cause and pursuing it in law. And added, that this was a matter which concerned him and Sigurd equally. But for thy distress, and our relationship, I shall bring in a word for thee. Soon after Eystein visited King Sigurd, and entreated him to spare the man, reminding him of the relationship between them and Sigurd Franesson, who was married to their aunt, Skjaldver. And said he would pay the penalty for the crime committed against the king, although he could not with truth impute any blame to him in the matter. Besides, he reminded the king of the long friendship with Sigurd Franesson. King Sigurd replied, that it was better government to punish such acts. Then King Eystein replied, If thou, brother, wilt follow the law, and punish such acts according to the country's privileges, then it would be most correct that Sigurd Franesson produce his witnesses, and that the case be judged at the thing. But not at a meeting. For the case comes under the law of the land, not under Bjarki law. Then said Sigurd, It may possibly be so that the case belongs to it, as thou sayest, King Eystein. And if it be against law what has hitherto been done in this case, then we shall bring it before the thing. Then the kings parted, and each seemed determined to take his own way. King Sigurd summoned the parties in the case before the Arnarns thing, and intended to pursue it there. King Eystein came also to the thing place. And when the case was brought forward for judgment, King Eystein went to the thing before judgment was given upon Sigurd Franesson. Now King Sigurd told the lagmen to pronounce the judgment. But King Eystein replied thus, I trust there are here men acquainted sufficiently with the laws of Norway, to know that they cannot condemn a lenderman to be outlawed at this thing. And he then explained how the law was, so that every man clearly understood it. Then said King Sigurd, Thou art taking up this matter very warmly, King Eystein, and it is likely the case will cost more trouble before it comes to an end than we intended, but nevertheless we shall follow it out. I will have him condemned to be outlawed in his native place. Then said King Eystein, There are certainly not many things which do not succeed with thee, and especially when there are but few and small folks to oppose one who has carried through such great things. And thus they parted, without anything being concluded in the case. Thereafter King Sigurd called together a Gula thing, went himself there, and summoned to him many high chiefs. King Eystein came there also with his suite. And many meetings and conferences were held among people of understanding concerning this case, and it was tried and examined before the lagmen. Now King Eystein objected that all the parties summoned in any cases tried here belonged to the thing district, but in this case the deed and the parties belonged to Halagaland. The thing accordingly ended in doing nothing, as King Eystein had thus made it incompetent. The kings parted in great wrath, and King Eystein went north to Thrandjum. King Sigurd, on the other hand, summoned to him all lendermen, and also the house servants of the lendermen, and named out of every district a number of the bonds from the south parts of the country, so that he had collected a large army about him. And proceeded with all this crowd northwards along the coast to Halagaland, and intended to use all his power to make Sigurd Franesson an outlaw among his own relations. For this purpose he summoned to him the Halagaland and Namudal people, and appointed a thing at Hrafnista. King Eystein prepared himself also, and proceeded with many people from the town of Nidaros to the thing, where he made Sigurd Franesson, by handshake before witnesses, deliver over to him the following in defending this case. At this thing both the kings spoke, each for his own side. 
Then King Eystein asks the lagmen where that law was made in Norway which gave the bonds the right to judge between the kings of the country, when they had pleased with each other. I shall bring witnesses to prove that Sigurd has given the case into my hands, and it is with me, not with Sigurd Franesson, that King Sigurd has to do in this case. The lagmen said that disputes between kings must be judged only at the era thing in Nidaros. King Eystein said, so I thought that it should be there, and the cases must be removed there. Then King Sigurd said, The more difficulties and inconvenience thou bringest upon me in this matter, the more I will persevere in it. And with that they parted. Both kings then went south to Nidaros town, where they summoned a thing from eight districts. King Eystein was in the town with a great many people, but Sigurd was on board his ships. When the thing was opened, peace and safe conduct was given to all. And when the people were all collected, and the case should be gone into, Bergthor, a son of Sven Brigjofat, stood up, and gave his evidence that Sigurd Franesson had concealed a part of the Laplanders' taxes. Then King Eystein stood up and said, If thy accusation were true, although we do not know what truth there may be in thy testimony, yet this case has already been dismissed from three things, and a fourth time from a town meeting. And therefore I require that the lagmen acquit Sigurd in this case according to law. And they did so. Then said King Sigurd, I see sufficiently, King Eystein, that thou hast carried this case by lock works, one, which I do not understand. But now there remains, King Eystein, a way of determining the case which I am more used to, and which I shall now apply. He then retired to his ships, had the tents taken down, laid his whole fleet out at the home, and held a thing of his people. And told them that early in the morning they should land at Aluvalir, and give battle to King Eystein. But in the evening, as King Sigurd sat at his table in his ship taking his repast, before he was aware of it a man cast himself on the floor of the forehold, and at the king's feet. This was Sigurd Franesson, who begged the king to take what course with regard to him the king himself thought proper. Then came Bishop Magna and Queen Malmfred, and many other great personages, and entreated forgiveness for Sigurd Franesson. And at their entreaty the king raised him up, took him by the hand, and placed him among his men, and took him along with himself to the south part of the country. In autumn the king gave Sigurd Franesson leave to go north to his farm, gave him an employment, and was always afterward his friend. After this day, however, the brothers were never much together, and there was no cordiality or cheerfulness among them. End notes. 1. These lockworks show a singularly advanced state of law. And deference to the law things, amidst such social disorder. And misdeeds. L. 23. Of King Olaf's death. King Olaf Magnusson fell into a sickness which ended in his death. He was buried in Christ Church in Nidaros, and many were in great grief at his death. After Olaf's death, Eystein and Sigurd ruled the country, the three brothers together having been kings of Norway for twelve years, AD 1104-1115. Namely, five years after King Sigurd returned home, and seven years before. King Olaf was seventeen years old when he died, and it happened on the 24th of December. 24. Magnus the Blind, His Birth King Eystein had been about a year in the east part of the country at that time, and King Sigurd was then in the north. King Eystein remained a long time that winter in Sarpsborg. There was once a powerful and rich bond called Olaf of Dal, who dwelt in Great Dal in Aumord, and had two children, a son called Hakon Falk, and a daughter called Borghild, who was a very beautiful girl, and prudent. And well skilled in many things. Olaf and his children were a long time in winter in Sarpsborg, and Borghild conversed very often with King Eystein, so that many reports were spread about their friendship. The following summer King Eystein went north, and King Sigurd came eastward, where he remained all winter, and was long in Konungahela, which town he greatly enlarged and improved. He built there a great castle of turf and stone, dug a great ditch around it, and built a church and several houses within the castle. The Holy Cross he allowed to remain at Konungahela, and therein did not fulfill the oath he had taken in Palestine, but, on the other hand, he established tithe, and most of the other things to which he had bound himself by oath. 
The reason of his keeping the cross east at the frontier of the country was, that he thought it would be a protection to all the land. But it proved the greatest misfortune to place this relic within the power of the heathens, as it afterwards turned out. When Borghild, Olaf's daughter, heard it whispered that people talked ill of her conversations and intimacy with King Eystein, she went to Sarpsborg. And after suitable fasts she carried the iron as proof of her innocence, and cleared herself thereby fully from all offence. When King Sigurd heard this, he rode one day as far as usually was two days travelling, and came to Dal to Olaf, where he remained all night, made Borghild his concubine, and took her away with him. They had a son, who was called Magnus, and he was sent immediately to Halagaland, to be fostered at Jarki by Vidkin Johnson, and he was brought up there. Magnus grew up to be the handsomest man that could be seen, and was very soon stout and strong. 25. Comparison between the two kings. King Eystein and King Sigurd went both in spring to guest quarters in the uplands. And each was entertained in a separate house, and the houses were not very distant from each other. The bonds, however, thought it more convenient that both should be entertained together by turns in each house. And thus they were both at first in the house of King Eystein. But in the evening, when the people began to drink, the ale was not good, so that the guests were very quiet and still. Then said King Eystein, Why are the people so silent? It is more usual in drinking parties that people are merry, so let us fall upon some jest over our ale that will amuse people, for surely, brother Sigurd, all people are well pleased when we talk cheerfully. Sigurd replies, Bluntly, do you talk as much as you please, but give me leave to be silent. Eystein says, It is a common custom over the ale table to compare one person with another, and now let us do so. Then Sigurd was silent. I see, says King Eystein, that I must begin this amusement. Now I will take thee, brother, to compare myself with, and will make it appear so as if we had both equal reputation and property, and that there is no difference in our birth and education. Then King Sigurd replies, Do you remember that I was always able to throw you when we wrestled, although you are a year older? Then King Eystein replied, But I remember that you was not so good at the games which require agility. Sigurd, do you remember that I could drag you under water, when we swam together, as often as I pleased? Eystein, but I could swim as far as you, and could dive as well as you. And I could run upon snow skates so well that nobody could beat me, and you could no more do it than an ox. Sigurd, methinks it is a more useful and suitable accomplishment for a chief to be expert at his bow. And I think you could scarcely draw my bow, even if you took your foot to help. Eystein, I am not strong at the bow as you are, but there is less difference between our shooting near. And I can use the skis much better than you, and in former times that was held a great accomplishment. Sigurd, it appears to me much better for a chief who is to be the superior of other men, that he is conspicuous in a crowd, and strong and powerful in weapons above other men, easily seen, and easily known, where there are many together. Eystein, it is not less a distinction and an ornament that a man is of a handsome appearance, so as to be easily known from others on that account, and this appears to me to suit a chief best, because the best ornament is allied to beauty. I am moreover more knowing in the law than you, and on every subject my words flow more easily than yours. Sigurd, it may be that you know more lock works, for I have had something else to do, neither will any deny you a smooth tongue. But there are many who say that your words are not to be trusted, that what you promise is little to be regarded, and that you talk just according to what those who are about you say, which is not kingly. Eystein, this is because, when people bring their cases before me, I wish first to give every man that satisfaction in his affairs which he desires. But afterwards comes the opposite party, and then there is something to be given or taken away very often, in order to mediate between them, so that both may be satisfied. It often happens, too, that I promise whatever is desired of me, that all may be joyful about me. It would be an easy matter for me to do as you do, to promise evil to all, and I never hear any complain of your not keeping this promise to them. Sigurd, it is the conversation of all that the expedition that I made out of the country was a princely expedition, while you in the meantime sat at home like your father's daughter. Eystein, now you touched the tender spot. 
I would not have brought up this conversation if I had not known what to reply on this point. I can truly say that I equipped you from home like a sister, before you went upon this expedition. Sigurd, you must have heard that on this expedition I was in many a battle in the Saracen's land, and gained the victory in all. And you must have heard of the many valuable articles I acquired, the like of which were never seen before in this country, and I was the most respected wherever the most gallant men were. And, on the other hand, you cannot conceal that you have only a homebred reputation. Eistian, I have heard that you had several battles abroad, but it was more useful for the country what I was doing in the meantime here at home. I built five churches from the foundations, and a harbour out at Agdanes, where it before was impossible to land, and where vessels ply north and south along the coast. I set a warping post and iron ring in the sound of Sinholm, and in Bergen I built a royal hall, while you were killing blue men for the devil in Circland. This, I think, was of but little advantage to our kingdom. King Sigurd said, On this expedition I went all the way to Jordan and swam across the river. On the edge of the river there is a bush of willows, and there I twisted a knot of willows, and said this knot thou shouldst untie, brother, or take the curse thereto attached. King Eistian said, I shall not go and untie the knot which you tied for me. But if I had been inclined to tie a knot for thee, thou wouldst not have been king of Norway at thy return to this country, when with a single ship you came sailing into my fleet. Thereupon both were silent, and there was anger on both sides. More things passed between the brothers, from which it appeared that each of them would be greater than the other, however, peace was preserved between them as long as they lived. 26. Of King Sigurd's Sickness King Sigurd was at a feast in the upland, and a bath was made ready for him. When the king came to the bath and the tent was raised over the bathing tub, the king thought there was a fish in the tub beside him. And a great laughter came upon him, so that he was beside himself, and was out of his mind, and often afterwards these fits returned. Magnus Barefoot's daughter, Ragenhild, was married by her brothers to Harald Kessia, a son of the Danish king, Eirik the Good, and their sons were Magnus, Olaf, Canute and Harald. 27. Of King Eistian's Death King Eistian built a large ship at Nidaros, which, in size and shape, was like the long serpent which King Olaf Tryggvason had built. At the stem there was a dragon's head, and at the stern a crooked tail, and both were gilded over. The ship was high-sided, but the fore and aft parts appeared less than they should be. He also made in Nidaros many and large dry docks of the best material, and well timbered. Six years after King Olaf's death, it happened that King Eistian, at a feast at Hustadir in Stim, was seized with an illness which soon carried him off. He died the 29th of August, 1123, and his body was carried north to Nidaros, and buried in Christ Church. And it is generally said that so many mourners never stood over any man's grave in Norway as over King Eistian's, at least since the time Magnus the Good, St. Olaf's son, died. Eistian had been twenty years, A.D. 1104-1123, King of Norway. And after his decease his brother, King Sigurd, was the sole king of Norway as long as he lived. 28. Baptizing the people of Smaland. The Danish king, Nicholas, a son of Sven Ulf's son, married afterwards the Queen Margaret, a daughter of King Inga, who had before been married to King Magnus Barefoot, and their sons were Nicholas and Magnus the Strong. King Nicholas sent a message to King Sigurd the Crusader, and asked him if he would go with him with all his might and help him to the east of the Swedish dominion, Smaland, to baptize the inhabitants. For the people who dwelt there had no regard for Christianity, although some of them had allowed themselves to be baptized. At that time there were many people all around in the Swedish dominions who were heathens, and many were bad Christians. For there were some of the kings who renounced Christianity, and continued heathen sacrifices, as Blotsbane, and afterwards Eirik Arzale, had done. King Sigurd promised to undertake this journey, and the kings appointed their meeting at Erarsund. King Sigurd then summoned all people in Norway to a levy, both of men and ships, and when the fleet was assembled he had about three hundred ships. King Nicholas came very early to the meeting place, and stayed there a long time. And the bonds murmured much, and said the Northmen did not intend to come. 
Thereupon the Danish army dispersed, and the king went away with all his fleet. King Sigurd came there soon afterwards, and was ill-pleased. But sailed east to Svimraros, and held a house thing, at which Sigurd spoke about King Nicholas's breach of faith, and the Northmen, on this account, determined to go marauding in his country. They first plundered a village called Tumathorpe, which is not far from Lund, and then sailed east to the merchant town of Kalmar, where they plundered, as well as in Smaland, and imposed on the country a tribute of 1,500 cattle for ship provision. And the people of Smaland received Christianity. After this King Sigurd turned about with his fleet, and came back to his kingdom with many valuable articles and great booty, which he had gathered on this expedition. And this levy was called the Kalmar Levy. This was the summer before the eclipse. This was the only levy King Sigurd carried out as long as he was king. 29. Of Thorin Stutfeld. It happened once when King Sigurd was going from the drinking table to Vespers, that his men were very drunk and merry, and many of them sat outside the church singing the evening song, but their singing was very irregular. Then the king said, Who is that fellow I see standing at the church with a skin jacket on? They answered, that they did not know. Then the king said, This skin-clad man, in sorry plight, puts all our wisdom here to flight. Then the fellow came forward and said, I thought that here I might be known. Although my dress is scanty grown, tis poor, but I must be content. Unless, great king, it's thy intent to give me better. For I have seen when I in rags had strangers been. The king answered, Come to me tomorrow when I am at the drink table. The night passed away. And the morning after the Icelander, who was afterwards called Thor and Stutfet, went into the drinking room. A man stood outside of the door of the room with a horn in his hand, and said, Icelander. The king says that if thou wilt deserve any gift from him thou shalt compose a song before going in, and make it about a man whose name is Hakon Sirkson, and who is called Morstra, one, and speak about that surname in thy song. The man who spoke to him was called Arn Fyruskief. Then they went into the room. And when Thorin came before the king's seat he recited these verses. Thrandjum's warrior king has said. The scald should be by gifts repaid. If he before this meeting gave. The king's friend circa passing stave. The generous king has let me know. My stave, to please, must be framed so. That my poor verse extol the fame. Of one called Hacken Lump by name. Then said the king, I never said so, and somebody has been making a mock of thee. Hacken himself shall determine what punishment thou shalt have. Go into his suite. Hacken said, He shall be welcome among us, for I can see where the joke came from, and he placed the Icelander at his side next to himself, and they were very merry. The day was drawing to a close, and the liquor began to get into their heads, when Hacken said, Dost thou not think, Icelander, that thou owest me some penalty? And dost thou not see that some trick has been played upon thee? Thorin replies, It is true, indeed, that I owe thee some compensation. Hacken says, Then we shall be quits, if thou wilt make me another stave about Arn. He said he was ready to do so. And they crossed over to the side of the room where Arn was sitting, and Thorin gave these verses. Fyruskief has often spread. With evil heart and idle head. The eagle's voidings round the land. Lampoons and lies, with ready hand. Yet this landloper we all know. In Africa scarce fed a crow. Of all his arms used in the field. Those in most use were helm and shield. Arn sprang up instantly, drew his sword, and was going to fall upon him. But Hakon told him to let it alone and be quiet, and bade him remember that if it came to a quarrel he would come off the worst himself. Thorin afterwards went up to the king, and said he had composed a poem which he wished the king to hear. The king consented, and the song is known by the name of the Stutfeld poem. The king asked Thorin what he intended to do. He replied, it was his intention to go to Rome. Then the king gave him much money for his pilgrimage, and told him to visit him on his return, and promised to provide for him. End notes, 
1. Morstra is a short, fat, punchy fellow. L. 30. Of Sigurd and Otterberding. It is told that King Sigurd, one Whit Sunday, sat at table with many people, among whom were many of his friends. And when he came to his high seat, people saw that his countenance was very wild, and as if he had been weeping, so that people were afraid of what might follow. The king rolled his eyes, and looked at those who were seated on the benches. Then he seized the holy book which he had brought with him from abroad, and which was written all over with gilded letters, so that never had such a costly book come to Norway. His queen sat by his side. Then said King Sigurd, Many are the changes which may take place during a man's lifetime. I had two things which were dear to me above all when I came from abroad, and these were this book and the queen. And now I think the one is only worse and more loathsome than the other, and nothing I have belonging to me that I more detest. The queen does not know herself how hideous she is. For a goat's horn is standing out on her head, and the better I liked her before the worse I like her now. Thereupon he cast the book on the fire which was burning on the hall floor, and gave the queen a blow with his fist between the eyes. The queen wept, but more at the king's illness than at the blow, or the affront she had suffered. Then a man stood up before the king, his name was Otterberding. And he was one of the torch-bearers, although a bond's son, and was on service that day. He was of small stature, but of agreeable appearance, lively, bold, and full of fun, black-haired, and of a dark skin. He ran and snatched the book which the king had cast into the fire, held it out, and said, Different were the days, sire, when you came with great state and splendor to Norway, and with great fame and honor. For then all your friends came to meet you with joy, and were glad at your coming. All as one man would have you for king, and have you in the highest regard and honor. But now days of sorrow are come over us. For on this holy festival many of your friends have come to you, and cannot be cheerful on account of your melancholy and ill health. It is much to be desired that you would be merry with them. And do, good king, take this saving advice, make peace first with the queen, and make her joyful whom you have so highly affronted, with a friendly word, and then all your chiefs, friends, and servants, that is my advice. Then said King Sigurd, Dost thou dare to give me advice, thou great lump of a houseman's lad? And he sprang up, drew his sword, and swung it with both hands as if going to cut him down. But Otter stood quiet and upright. Did not stir from the spot, nor show the slightest sign of fear, and the king turned round the sword blade which he had waved over Otter's head, and gently touched him on the shoulder with it. Then he sat down in silence on his high seat. All were silent who were in the hall, for nobody dared to say a word. Now the king looked around him, milder than before, and said, It is difficult to know what there is in people. Here sat my friends, and lender men, marshals and shield-bearers, and all the best men in the land, but none did so well against me as this man, who appears to you of little worth compared to any of you, although now he loves me most. I came here like a madman, and would have destroyed my precious property, but he turned aside my deed, and was not afraid of death for it. Then he made an able speech, ordering his words so that they were honourable to me, and not saying a single word about things which could increase my vexation, but even avoiding what might, with truth, have been said. So excellent was his speech, that no man here, however great his understanding, could have spoken better. Then I sprang up in a pretended rage, and made as if I would have cut him down, but he was courageous as if he had nothing to fear. And seeing that, I let go my purpose, for he was altogether innocent. Now ye shall know, my friends, how I intend to reward him, he was before my torchbearer, and shall now be my lenderman. And there shall follow what is still more, that he shall be the most distinguished of my lendermen. Go thou and sit among the lendermen, and be a servant no longer. Otter became one of the most celebrated men in Norway for various good and praiseworthy deeds. 31. Of King Sigurd's Dream In King Sigurd's latter days he was once at an entertainment at one of his farms. And in the morning when he was dressed he was silent and still, so that his friends were afraid he was not able to govern himself. Now the farm bailiff, who was a man of good sense and courage, brought him into conversation, 
and asked if he had heard any news of such importance that it disturbed his mirth, or if the entertainment had not satisfied him. Or if there was anything else that people could remedy. King Sigurd said, that none of the things he had mentioned was the cause. But it is that I think upon the dream I had in the night. Sire, replied he, may it prove a lucky dream. I would gladly hear it. The king, I thought that I was in Juddar, and looked out towards the sea, and that I saw something very black moving itself. And when it came near it appeared to be a large tree, of which the branches stretched far above the water, and the roots were down in the sea. Now when the tree came to the shore it broke into pieces, and drove all about the land, both the mainland and the out islands, rocks and strands. And it appeared to me as if I saw over all Norway along the sea coast, and saw pieces of that tree, some small and some large, driven into every bite. Then said the bailiff, It is likely that you and best interpret this dream yourself. And I would willingly hear your interpretation of it. Then said the king, This dream appears to me to denote the arrival in this country of some man who will fix his seat here, and whose posterity will spread itself over the land. But with unequal power, as the dream shows. 32. Of a slack hain. It so happened once, that King Sigurd sat in a gloomy mood among many worthy men. It was Friday evening, and the kitchen master asked what meat should be made ready. The king replies, What else but flesh meat? And so harsh were his words that nobody dared to contradict him, and all were ill at ease. Now, when people prepared to go to table, dishes of warm flesh meat were carried in. But all were silent, and grieved at the king's illness. Before the blessing was pronounced over the meat, a man called Aslak Hain spoke. He had been a long time with King Sigurd on his journey abroad, and was not a man of any great family. And was small of stature, but fiery. When he perceived how it was, and that none dared to accost the king, he asked, What is it, sire, that is smoking on the dish before you? The king replies, What do you mean, Aslak? What do you think it is? A slack, I think it is flesh meat, and I would it were not so. The king, but if it be so, a slack. He replied, It would be vexatious to know that a gallant king, who has gained so much honor in the world, should so forget himself. When you rose up out of Jordan, after bathing in the same waters as God himself, with palm leaves in your hands, and the cross upon your breast, it was something else you promised, sire, than to eat flesh meat on a Friday. If a meaner man were to do so, he would merit a heavy punishment. This royal hall is not so beset as it should be, when it falls upon me, a mean man, to challenge such an act. The king sat silent, and did not partake of the meat. And when the time for eating was drawing to an end, the king ordered the flesh dishes to be removed and other food was brought in, such as it is permitted to use. When the meal time was almost past, the king began to be cheerful, and to drink. People advised a slack to fly, but he said he would not do so. I do not see how it could help me, and to tell the truth, it is as good to die now that I have got my will, and have prevented the king from committing a sin. It is for him to kill me if he likes. Towards evening the king called him, and said, Who set thee on, a slack hain, to speak such free words to me in the hearing of so many people? No one, sire, but myself. The king, thou wouldst like, no doubt, to know what thou art to have for such boldness, what thinkest thou it deserves? He replies, If it be well rewarded, sire, I shall be glad, but should it be otherwise, then it is your concern. Then the king said, Smaller is thy reward than thou hast deserved. I give thee three farms. It has turned out, what could not have been expected, that thou hast prevented me from a great crime, thou, and not the lender men, who are indebted to me for so much good. And so it ended. 33. Of a woman brought to the king. One you leave the king sat in the hall, and the tables were laid out, and the king said, Get me flesh meat. They answered, Sire, it is not the custom to eat flesh meat on you leave. The king said, If it be not the custom I will make it the custom. They went out, and brought him a dolphin. The king stuck his knife into it, but did not eat of it. Then the king said, 
bring me a girl here into the hall. They brought him a woman whose headdress went far down her brows. The king took her hand in his hands, looked at her, and said, an ill-looking girl. Lacuna, the rest of this story is missing. 34. Harold Gill comes to Norway. Hawkel Hook, a son of John Smyrbolt, who was Lenderman in Moor, made a voyage in the West Sea, all the way to the South Hibutes. A man came to him out of Ireland called Gillichrist, and gave himself out for a son of King Magnus Barefoot. His mother came with him, and said his other name was Harold. Hawkel received the man, brought him to Norway with him, and went immediately to King Sigurd with Harold and his mother. When they had told their story to the king, he talked over the matter with his principal men, and bade them give their opinions upon it. They were of different opinions, and all left it to the king himself, although there were several who opposed this, and the king followed his own counsel. King Sigurd ordered Harold to be called before him, and told him that he would not deny him the proof, by ordeal, of who his father was. But on condition that if he should prove his descent according to his claim, he should not desire the kingdom in the lifetime of King Sigurd, or of King Magnus, and to this he bound himself by oath. King Sigurd said he must tread over hot iron to prove his birth, but this ordeal was thought by many too severe, as he was to undergo it merely to prove his father, and without getting the kingdom. But Harold agreed to it, and fixed on the trial by iron, and this ordeal was the greatest ever made in Norway, for nine glowing plowshares were laid down, and Harold went over them with bare feet, attended by two bishops. Three days after the iron trial the ordeal was taken to proof, and the feet were found unburnt. Thereafter King Sigurd acknowledged Harold's relationship, but his son Magnus conceived a great hatred of him, and in this many chiefs followed Magnus. King Sigurd trusted so much to his favor with the whole people of the country, that he desired all men, under oath, to promise to accept Magnus after him as their king, and all the people took this oath. 35. Race between Magnus and Harold Gill. Harold Gill was a tall, slender grown man, of a long neck and face, black eyes, and dark hair, brisk and quick, and wore generally the Irish dress of short light clothes. The Norse language was difficult for Harold, and he brought out words which many laughed at. Harold sat late drinking one evening. He spoke with another man about different things in the West in Ireland. And among other things, said that there were men in Ireland so swift of foot that no horse could overtake them in running. Magnus, the king's son, heard this, and said, Now he is lying, as he usually does. Harold replies, It is true that there are men in Ireland whom no horse in Norway could overtake. They exchanged some words about this, and both were drunk. Then said Magnus, Thou shalt make a wager with me, and stake thy head if thou canst not run so fast as I ride upon my horse, and I shall stake my gold ring. Harold replies, I did not say that I could run so swiftly. But I said that men are to be found in Ireland who will run as fast, and on that I would wager. The king's son Magnus replies, I will not go to Ireland about it, we are wagering here, and not there. Harold on this went to bed, and would not speak to him more about it. This was in Oslo. The following morning, when the early mass was over, Magnus rode up the street, and sent a message to Harold to come to him. When Harold came he was dressed thus. He had on a shirt and trousers which were bound with ribbons under his foot a short cloak, an Irish hat on his head, and a spear shaft in his hand. Magnus set up a mark for the race. Harold said, Thou hast made the course too long, but Magnus made it at once even much longer, and said it was still too short. There were many spectators. They began the race, and Harold followed always the horse's pace. And when they came to the end of the race course, Magnus said, Thou hadst hold of the saddle girth, and the horse dragged thee along. Magnus had his swift runner, the Gotland horse. They began the race again, and Harold ran the whole racecourse before the horse. When came to the end Harold asked, Had I hold of the saddle girths now? Magnus replied, Thou hadst the start at first. Then Magnus let his horse breathe a while, and when he was ready he put the spurs to him, and set off in full gallop. Harold stood still, and Magnus looked back, 
and called, set off now. Then Harold ran quickly past the horse, and came to the end of the course so long before him that he lay down, and got up and saluted Magnus as he came in. Then they went home to the town. In the meantime King Sigurd had been at high mass, and knew nothing of this until after he had dined that day. Then he said to Magnus angrily, Thou Caeest Harold useless. But I think thou art a great fool, and knowest nothing of the customs of foreign people. Dost thou not know that men in other countries exercise themselves in other feats than in filling themselves with ale, and making themselves mad, and so unfit for everything that they scarcely know each other? Give Harold his ring, and do not try to make a fool of him again, as long as I am above ground. 36. Of Sigurd's Swimming it happened once that Sigurd was out in his ship, which lay in the harbour. And there lay a merchant ship, which was an Iceland trader, at the side of it. Harald Giel was in the forecastle of the king's ship, and Sven Rimhildsen, a son of Knut Sveinsen of Juddar, had his berth the next before him. There was also Sigurd Sigurdsson, a gallant lenderman, who himself commanded a ship. It was a day of beautiful weather and warm sunshine, and many went out to swim, both from the longship and the merchant vessel. An Iceland man, who was among the swimmers, amused himself by drawing those under water who could not swim so well as himself, and at that the spectators laughed. When King Sigurd saw and heard this, he cast off his clothes, sprang into the water, and swam to the Icelander, seized him, and pressed him under the water, and held him there. And as soon as the Icelander came up the king pressed him down again, and thus the one time after the other. Then said Sigurd Sigurdsson, Shall we let the king kill this man? Somebody said, No one has any wish to interfere. Sigurd replies, That, if Dag Eilifsson were here, we should not be without one who dared. Then Sigurd sprang overboard, swam to the king, took hold of him, and said, Sire, do not kill the man. Everybody sees that you are a much better swimmer. The king replies, Let me loose, Sigurd, I shall be his death for he will destroy our people under water. Sigurd says, Let us first amuse ourselves, and, Icelander, do thou set off to the land, which he did. The king now got loose from Sigurd, and swam to his ship, and Sigurd went his way, but the king ordered that Sigurd should not presume to come into his presence, this was reported to Sigurd, and so he went up into the country. 37. Of Harald and Sven Rimhildsen. In the evening, when people were going to bed, some of the ship's men were still at their games up in the country. Harold was with those who played on the land, and told his footboy to go out to the ship, make his bed, and wait for him there. The lad did as he was ordered. The king had gone to sleep. And as the boy thought Harold late, he laid himself in Harold's berth. Sven Rimhildsen said, It is a shame for brave men to be brought from their farms at home, and to have here serving boys to sleep beside them. The lad said that Harold had ordered him to come there. Sven Rimhildsen said, We do not so much care for Harold himself lying here, if he do not bring here his slaves and beggars. And seized a riding whip, and struck the boy on the head until the blood flowed from him. The boy ran immediately up the country, and told Harold what had happened, who went immediately out to the ship, to the aft part of the forecastle and with a pole-axe struck Sven so that he received a severe wound on his hands. And then Harold went on shore. Sven ran to the land after him, and, gathering his friends, took Harold prisoner, and they were about hanging him. But while they were busy about this, Sigurd Sigurdsson went out to the king's ship and awoke him. When the king opened his eyes and recognized Sigurd, he said, For this reason thou shalt die, that thou hast intruded into my presence, for thou knowest that I forbade thee, and with these words the king sprang up. Sigurd replied, That is in your power as soon as you please, but other business is more urgent. Go to the land as quickly as possible to help thy brother, for the Rogaland people are going to hang him. Then said the king, God give us luck, Sigurd. Call my trumpeter, and let him call the people all to land, and to meet me. The king sprang on the land, and all who knew him followed him to where the gallows was being erected. The king instantly took Harold to him, and all the people gathered to the king in full armor, as they heard the trumpet. 
Then the king ordered that Sven and all his comrades should depart from the country as outlaws. But by the intercession of good men the king was prevailed on to let them remain and hold their properties, but no mulct should be paid for Sven's wound. Then Sigurd Sigurdsson asked if the king wished that he should go forth out of the country. That will I not, said the king, for I can never be without thee. 38. Of King Olaf's Miracle there was a young and poor man called Kolbian. And Thora, King Sigurd the Crusader's mother, had ordered his tongue to be cut out of his mouth, and for no other cause than that this young man had taken a piece of meat out of the king mother's tub which he said the cook had given him. And which the cook had not ventured to serve up to her. The man had long gone about speechless. So says Einar Skulason in Olaf's ballad. The proud rich dame, for little cause had the lad's tongue cut from his jaws. The helpless man, of speech deprived. His dreadful sore wound scarce survived. A few weeks since at Hild was seen. As well as ever he had been. The same poor lad, to speech restored. By Olaf's power, whom he adored. Afterwards the young man came to Nidaros, and watched in the Christ Church. But at the second mass for Olaf before Madden's he fell asleep, and thought he saw King Olaf the saint coming to him, and that Olaf talked to him, and took hold with his hands of the stump of his tongue and pulled it. Now when he awoke he found himself restored, and joyfully did he thank our Lord and the holy Saint Olaf, who had pitied and helped him. For he had come there speechless, and had gone to the holy shrine, and went away cured, and with his speech clear and distinct. 39. King Olaf's Miracle with a Prisoner The heathens took prisoner a young man of Danish family and carried him to Vindland, where he was in fetters along with other prisoners. In the daytime he was alone in irons, without a guard. But at night a peasant's son was beside him in the chain, that he might not escape from them. This poor man never got sleep or rest from vexation and sorrow, and considered in many ways what could help him. For he had a great dread of slavery, and was pining with hunger and torture. He could not again expect to be ransomed by his friends, as they had already restored him twice from heathen lands with their own money. And he well knew that it would be difficult and expensive for them to submit a third time to this burden. It is well with the man who does not undergo so much in the world as this man knew he had suffered. He saw but one way. And that was to get off and escape if he could. He resolved upon this in the night time, killed the peasant, and cut his foot off after killing him, and set off to the forest with the chain upon his leg. Now when the people knew this, soon after daylight in the morning, they pursued him with two dogs accustomed to trace any one who escaped, and to find him in the forest however carefully he might be concealed. They got him into their hands and beat him, and did him all kinds of mischief, and dragging him home, left barely alive, and showed him no mercy. They tortured him severely, put him in a dark room, in which there lay already sixteen Christian men. And bound him both with iron and other tyings, as fast as they could. Then he began to think that the misery and pain he had endured before were but shadows to his present sufferings. He saw no man before his eyes in this prison who would beg for mercy for him. No one had compassion on his wretchedness, except the Christian men who lay bound with him, who sorrowed with him, and bemoaned his fate together with their own misfortunes and helplessness. One day they advised him to make a vow to the holy King Olaf, to devote himself to some office in his sacred house, if he, by God's compassion and St. Olaf's prayers could get away from this prison. He gladly agreed to this, and made a vow and prepared himself for the situation they mentioned to him. The night after he thought in his sleep that he saw a man, not tall, standing at his side, who spoke to him thus, here, thou wretched man, why dost thou not get up? He replied, Sir, who are you? I am King Olaf, on whom thou hast called. Oh, my good Lord! Gladly would I raise myself, but I lie bound with iron and with chains on my legs, and also the other men who lie here. Thereupon the king accosts him with the words, Stand up at once and be not afraid, for thou art loose. He awoke immediately, and told his comrades what, had appeared to him in his dream. They told him to stand up, and try if it was true. 
he stood up, and observed that he was loose. Now said his fellow prisoners, this would help him but little, for the door was locked both on the inside and on the outside. Then an old man who sat there in a deplorable condition put in his word, and told him not to doubt the mercy of the man who had loosened his chains. For he has wrought this miracle on thee that thou shouldst enjoy his mercy, and hereafter be free, without suffering more misery in torture. Make haste, then, and seek the door, and if thou art able to slip out, thou art saved. He did so, found the door open, slipped out, and away to the forest. As soon as the Vinland people were aware of this they set loose the dogs, and pursued him in great haste, and the poor man lay hid, and saw well where they were following him. But now the hounds lost the trace when they came nearer, and all the eyes that sought him were struck with a blindness, so that nobody could find him, although he lay before their feet, and they all returned home, vexed that they could not find him. King Olaf did not permit this man's destruction after he had reached the forest, and restored him also to his health and hearing, for they had so long tortured and beaten him that he had become deaf. At last he came on board of a ship, with two other Christian men who had been long afflicted in that country. All of them worked zealously in this vessel, and so had a successful flight. Then he repaired to the holy man's house, strong and fit to bear arms. Now he was vexed at his vow, went from his promise to the holy king, ran away one day, and came in the evening to a bond who gave him lodging for God's sake. Then in the night he saw three girls coming to him, and handsome and nobly dressed were they. They spoke to him directly, and sharply reprimanded him for having been so bold as to run from the good king who had shown so much compassion to him, first in freeing him from his irons, and then from the prison. And yet he had deserted the mild master into whose service he had entered. Then he awoke full of terror, got up early, and told the housefather his dream. The good man had nothing so earnest in life as to send him back to the holy place. This miracle was first written down by a man who himself saw the man, and the marks of the chains upon his body. 40. King Sigurd marries Cecilia. In the last period of King Sigurd's life, his new and extraordinary resolution was whispered about, that he would be divorced from his queen, and would take Cecilia, who was a great man's daughter, to wife. He ordered accordingly a great feast to be prepared, and intended to hold his wedding with her in Bergen. Now when Bishop Magna heard this, he was very sorry. And one day the bishop goes to the king's hall, and with him a priest called Sigurd, who was afterwards bishop of Bergen. When they came to the king's hall, the bishop sent the king a message that he would like to meet him. And asked the king to come out to him. He did so, and came out with a drawn sword in his hand. He received the bishop kindly and asked him to go in and sit down to table with him. The bishop replies, I have other business now. Is it true, sire, what is told me, that thou hast the intention of marrying, and of driving away thy queen, and taking another wife? The king said it was true. Then the bishop changed countenance, and angrily replied, How can it come into your mind, sire, to do such an act in our bishopric as to betray God's word and law, and the holy church? It surprises me that you treat with such contempt our episcopal office, and your own royal office. I will now do what is my duty. And in the name of God, of the holy King Olaf, of Peter the Apostle, and of the other saints, forbid thee this wickedness. While he thus spoke he stood straight up, as if stretching out his neck to the blow, as if ready if the king chose to let the sword fall. And the priest Sigurd, who afterwards was bishop, has declared that the sky appeared to him no bigger than a calf's skin, so frightful did the appearance of the king present itself to him. The king returned to the hall, however, without saying a word, and the bishop went to his house and home so cheerful and gay that he laughed, and saluted every child on his way, and was playing with his fingers. Then the priest Sigurd asked him the reason, saying, Why are you so cheerful, sir? Do you not consider that the king may be exasperated against you? And would it not be better to get out of the way? Then said the bishop, It appears to me more likely that he will not act so, and besides, what death could be better, or more desirable, than to leave life for the honor of God? Or to die for the holy cause of Christianity in our own office, by preventing that which is not right? 
I am so cheerful because I have done what I ought to do. There was much noise in the town about this. The king got ready for a journey, and took with him corn, malt and honey. He went south to Stavanger, and prepared a feast there for his marriage with Cecilia. When a bishop who ruled there heard of this he went to the king, and asked if it were true that he intended to marry in the lifetime of the queen. The king said it was so. The bishop answers, If it be so, sire, you must know how much such a thing is forbidden to inferior persons. Now it appears as if you thought it was allowable for you, because you have great power, and that it is proper for you, although it is against right and propriety. But I do not know how you will do it in our bishopric, dishonoring thereby God's command, the Holy Church, and our episcopal authority. But you must bestow a great amount of gifts and estates on this foundation, and thereby pay the mulct due to God and to us for such transgression. Then said the king, Take what thou wilt of our possessions. Thou art far more reasonable than Bishop Magna. Then the king went away, as well pleased with this bishop as ill pleased with him who had laid a prohibition on him. Thereafter the king married the girl, and loved her tenderly. 41. Improvement of Conungahela. King Sigurd improved the town of Conungahela so much, that there was not a greater town in Norway at the time, and he remained there long for the defense of the frontiers. He built a king's house in the castle, and imposed a duty on all the districts in the neighborhood of the town, as well as on the townspeople. That every person of nine years of age and upwards should bring to the castle five missile stones for weapons, or as many large stakes sharp at one end and five ells long. In the castle the king built a cross church of timber, and carefully put together, as far as regards the wood and other materials. The cross church was consecrated in the twenty-fourth year of King Sigurd's reign, A.D. 1127. Here the king deposited the piece of the holy cross, and many other holy relics. It was called the castle church. And before the high altar he placed the tables he had got made in the Greek country, which were of copper and silver, all gilt, and beautifully adorned with jewels. Here was also the shrine which the Danish king Eirik Imion had sent to King Sigurd. And the altar book, written with gold letters, which the patriarch had presented to King Sigurd. 42. King Sigurd's Death Three years after the consecration of the cross church, when King Sigurd was stopping at Viken, he fell sick, A.D. 1130, he died the night before Mary's Mass, August 15, and was buried in Halvard's church, where he was laid in the stone wall without the choir on the south side. His son Magnus was in the town at the time and took possession of the whole of the king's treasury when King Sigurd died. Sigurd had been king of Norway twenty-seven years, A.D. 1104-1130, and was forty years of age when he died. The time of his reign was good for the country, for there was peace, and crops were good. Saga of Magnus the Blind and of Harold Gill Preliminary Remarks An age of conflict now begins in Norway. On his death, in 1130, Sigurd left his son Magnus and his brother Harold. They soon divided the government, and then entered upon a five years' conflict, until Magnus, in 1135, with eyes picked out, went into a convent. The next year, 1136, a new pretender appeared in the person of Sigurd Slemb, who took King Harold's life in 1137. Magnus died in 1139. Other literature in regard to this epoch is Fagerskinna and Morkenskinna. The corresponding part of Agrip is lost. Skalds quoted are Halder Skvaldra, Einar Skjulason, and Ivar Ingemunson. 1. Magnus and Harold proclaimed kings. King Sigurd's son Magnus was proclaimed an Oslo king of all the country immediately after his father's death, according to the oath which the whole nation had sworn to King Sigurd, and many went into his service, and many became his lendermen. Magnus was the handsomest man then in Norway, of a passionate temper, and cruel, but distinguished in bodily exercises. The favor of the people he owed most to the respect for his father. He was a great drinker, greedy of money, hard, and obstinate. Harold Giel, on the other hand, was very pleasing in intercourse, gay, and full of mirth, 
and so generous that he spared in nothing for the sake of his friends. He willingly listened to good advice, so that he allowed others to consult with him and give counsel. With all this he obtained favor and a good repute, and many men attached themselves as much to him as to King Magnus. Harold was in Tunsberg when he heard of his brother King Sigurd's death. He called together his friends to a meeting, and it was resolved to hold the Haga thing, one, there in the town. At this thing, Harold was chosen king of half the country, and it was called a forced oath which had been taken from him to renounce his paternal heritage. Then Harold formed a court, and appointed lendermen. And very soon he had as many people about him as King Magnus. Then men went between them, and matters stood in this way for seven days. But King Magnus, finding he had fewer people, was obliged to give way, and to divide the kingdom with Harold into two parts. The kingdom accordingly was so divided, October 3, 1130, that each of them should have the half part of the kingdom which King Sigurd had possessed. But that King Magnus alone should inherit the fleet of ships, the table service, the valuable articles and the movable effects which had belonged to his father, King Sigurd. He was notwithstanding the least satisfied with his share. Although they were of such different dispositions, they ruled the country for some time in peace. King Harold had a son called Sigurd, by Thora, a daughter of Guthorm Grabard. King Harold afterwards married Ingerid, a daughter of Ragnvald, who was a son of the Swedish king Inga Steinkelsen. King Magnus was married to a daughter of Knut Lavard, and she was a sister of the Danish king Valdenar. But King Magnus having no affection for her, sent her back to Denmark, and from that day everything went ill with him, and he brought upon himself the enmity of her family. End notes. 1. Hogathing means a thing held at the tumuli or burial. Mounds. L. 2. Of the forces of Harold and Magnus. When the two relations, Harold and Magnus, had been about three years kings of Norway, A.D. 1131-1133, they both passed the fourth winter, A.D. 1134, in the town of Nidaros, and invited each other as guests, but their people were always ready for a fight. In spring King Magnus sailed southwards along the land with his fleet, and drew all the men he could obtain out of each district, and sounded his friends if they would strengthen him with their power to take the kingly dignity from Harold. And give him such a portion of the kingdom, as might be suitable. Representing to them that King Harold had already renounced the kingdom by oath. King Magnus obtained the consent of many powerful men. The same spring Harold went to the uplands, and by the upper roads eastwards to Viken. And when he heard what King Magnus was doing, he also drew together men on his side. Wheresoever the two parties went they killed the cattle, or even the people, upon the farms of the adverse party. King Magnus had by far the most people, for the main strength of the country lay open to him for collecting men from it. King Harold was in Viken on the east side of the fjord, and collected men, while they were doing each other damage in property and life. King Harold had with him Christrad, his brother by his mother's side, and many other lendermen. But King Magnus had many more. King Harold was with his forces at a place called Furs in Ranreich, and went from thence towards the sea. The evening before St. Lawrence Day, August 10, they had their supper at a place called Firalief, while the guard kept a watch on horseback all around the house. The watchman observed King Magnus' army hastening towards the house, and consisting of full six thousand men, while King Harold had but fifteen hundred. Now come the watchman who had to bring the news to King Harold of what was going on and say that King Magnus' army was now very near the town. The king says, What will my relation King Magnus Sigurdsson have? He wants not surely to fight us. Thjostolf Alasun replies, You must certainly, sire, make preparation for that, both for yourself and your men. King Magnus has been drawing together an army all the summer for the purpose of giving you battle when he meets you. Then King Harold stood up, and ordered his men to take their arms. We shall fight, if our relative King Magnus wants to fight us. Then the war horn sounded, and all Harold's men went out from the house to an enclosed field, and set up their banners. King Harold had on two shirts of ring mail, but his brother Christrod had no armor on, and a gallant man he was. 
When King Magnus and his men saw King Harold's troop they drew up and made their array, and made their line so long that they could surround the whole of King Harold's troop. So says Halder Squaldra. King Magnus on the battle plain. From his long troop line had great gain. The plain was drenched with warm blood. Which lay a red and reeking flood. 3. Battle at Firalief. King Magnus had the Holy Cross carried before him in this battle, and the battle was great and severe. The king's brother, Christrod, had penetrated with his troop into the middle of King Magnus' array, and cut down on each side of him, so that people gave way before him everywhere. But a powerful bond who was in King Harold's array raised his spear with both hands, and drove it through between Christrod's shoulders, so that it came out at his breast, and thus fell Christrod. Many who were near asked the bond why he had done so foul a deed. The bond replies, he knows the consequences now of slaughtering my cattle in summer, and taking all that was in my house, and forcing me to follow him here. I determined to give him some return when the opportunity came. After this King Harold's army took to flight, and he fled himself, with all his men. Many fell. And Ingemar Sveinsen of Ask, a great chief and lenderman, got there his death wound, and nearly sixty of King Harold's court men also fell. Harold himself fled eastward to Viken to his ships, and went out of the country to King Eirik Imun in Denmark, and found him in Sealand and sought aid from him. King Eirik received him well, and principally because they had sworn to each other to be his brothers, one, and gave him Halland as a fief to rule over, and gave him seven longships, but without equipment. Thereafter King Harold went northwards through Halland, and many Northmen came to meet him. After this battle King Magnus subdued the whole country, giving life and safety to all who were wounded, and had them taken care of equally with his own men. He then called the whole country his own, and had a choice of the best men who were in the country. When they held a council among themselves afterwards, Sigurd Sigurdsson, Thor Ingeritsson, and all the men of most understanding, advised that they should keep their forces together in Viking, and remain there. In case Harold should return from the south. But King Magnus would take his own way, and went north to Bergen. There he sat all winter, A.D. 1135, and allowed his men to leave him, on which the Lendermen returned home to their own houses. End notes. 1. These brotherhoods, by which one man was bound by oath to aid or avenge another, were common in the Middle Ages among all ranks. Sworn brothers is still a common expression. With us. L. 4. Death of Aspjorn and of Nereid. King Harold came to Conungahela with the men who had followed him from Denmark. The Lendermen and town's burgesses collected a force against him, which they drew up in a thick array above the town. King Harold landed from his ships and sent a message to the bonds, desiring that they would not deny him his land, as he wanted no more than what of right belonged to him. Then mediators went between them. And it came to this, that the bonds dismissed their troops, and submitted to him. Thereupon he bestowed fiefs and property on the lender men, that they might stand by him, and paid the bonds who joined him the lawful mulks for what they had lost. A great body of men attached themselves, therefore, to King Harold, and he proceeded westwards to Viking, where he gave peace to all men, except to King Magnus' people, whom he plundered and killed wherever he found them. And when he came west to Sarpsborg he took prisoners two of King Magnus' s lender men, Aspjorn and his brother Nereid. And gave them the choice that one should be hanged, and the other thrown into the Sarpsborg waterfall, and they might choose as they pleased. Aspjorn chose to be thrown into the cataract, for he was the elder of the two, and this death appeared the most dreadful, and so it was done. Halder Squaldra tells of this. Aspjorn, who opposed the king. O'er the wild cataract they fling. Nereid, who opposed the king. Must on Hagbard's high tree swing. The king given food in many a way. To foul-mouthed beasts and birds of prey. The generous men who dare oppose. Are treated as the worst of foes. Thereafter King Harold proceeded north to Tunsberg, where he was well received, and a large force gathered to him. 5. Of the councils proposed. When King Magnus, who was in Bergen, 
heard these tidings, he called together all the chiefs who were in the town, and asked them their counsel, and what they should now do. Then Sigurd Sigurdsson said, Here I can give a good advice. Let a ship be manned with good men, and put me, or any other lenderman, to command it, send it to thy relation, King Harold, and offer him peace according to the conditions upright men may determine upon, and offer him the half of the kingdom. It appears to me probable that King Harold, by the words and counsel of good men, may accept this offer, and thus there may be a peace established between you. Then King Magnus replied, This proposal I will not accept of. For of what advantage would it be, after we have gained the whole kingdom in summer to give away the half of it now? Give us some other counsel. Then Sigurd Sigurdsson answered, It appears to me, sire, that your lendermen who in autumn asked your leave to return home will now sit at home and will not come to you. At that time it was much against my advice that you dispersed so entirely the people we had collected, for I could well suppose that Harold would come back to Viken as soon as he heard that it was without a chief. Now there is still another council, and it is but a poor one, but it may turn out useful to us. Send out your perseverance, and send other people with them, and let them go against the lender men who will not join you in your necessity, and kill them. And bestow their property on others who will give you help although they may have been of small importance before. Let them drive together the people, the bad as well as the good. And go with the men you can thus assemble against King Harold, and give him battle. The king replies, it would be unpopular to put to death people of distinction, and raise up inferior people who often break faith and law, and the country would be still worse off. I would like to hear some other counsel still. Sigurd replies, it is difficult for me now to give advice, as you will neither make peace nor give battle. Let us go north to Thrandjum, where the main strength of the country is most inclined to our side. And on the way let us gather all the men we can. It may be that these Elfgrims will be tired of such a long stride after us. The king replies, we must not fly from those whom we beat in summer. Give some better counsel still. Then Sigurd stood up and said, while he was preparing to go out, I will now give you the counsel which I see you will take, and which must have its course. Sit here in Bergen until Harold comes with his troops, and then you will either suffer death or disgrace. And Sigurd remained no longer at that meeting. 6. Of Harold's Force King Harold came from the east along the coast with a great army, and this winter, A.D. 1135, is called on that account the crowd winter. King Harold came to Bergen on Christmas Eve, and landed with his fleet at Floravager. But would not fight on account of the sacred time. But King Magnus prepared for defense in the town. He erected a stone-slinging machine out on the home, and had iron chains and wooden booms laid across over the passage from the king's house to Norden's, and to the monk's bridge. He had foot traps made, and thrown into St. John's Field, and did not suspend these works except during the three sacred days of Christmas. The last holy day of Yule, King Harold ordered his warhorns to sound the gathering of his men for going to the town, and, during the Yule holy days, his army had been increased by about 900 men. 7. King Magnus taken prisoner. King Harold made a promise to King Olaf the Saint for victory, that he would build an Olaf's church in the town at his own expense. King Magnus drew up his men in the Christ churchyard, but King Harold laid his vessels first at Norden's. Now when King Magnus and his people saw that, they turned round towards the town, and to the end of the shore. But as they passed through the streets many of the Burgesses ran into their houses and homes, and those who went across the fields fell into the foot traps. Then King Magnus and his men perceived that King Harold had rode with all his men across to Higravik, and landed there, and had gone from thence the upper road up the hill opposite the town. Now Magnus returned back again through the streets, and then his men fled from him in all directions, some up to the mountains, some up to the neighborhood of the convent of nuns, some to churches, or hid themselves as they best could. King Magnus fled to his ship, but there was no possibility of getting away, for the iron chains outside prevented the passage of vessels. He had also but few men with him, and therefore could do nothing. Einar Skulason tells of this in the Song of Harold. For a whole week an iron chain. Cut off all sailing to the main. 
Bergen's blue stable was locked fast. Her floating wains could not get past. Soon after Harold's people came out to the ships, and then King Magnus was made prisoner. He was sitting behind in the forecastle upon the chests of the high seat, and at his side Hacken Falk, his mother's brother, who was very popular but was not considered very wise, and Ivar Assurson. They, and many others of King Magnus' friends, were taken, and some of them killed on the spot. 8. King Magnus Mutilated Thereafter King Harold had a meeting of his counselors, and desired their counsel. And in this meeting the judgment was given that Magnus should be deposed from his dominions, and should no longer be called king. Then he was delivered to the king's slaves, who mutilated him, picked out both his eyes, cut off one foot, and at last castrated him. Ivar Assurson was blinded, and Hacken Falk killed. The whole country then was reduced to obedience under King Harold. Afterwards it was diligently examined who were King Magnus' best friends, or who knew most of his concealments of treasure or valuables. The Holy Cross King Magnus had kept beside him since the Battle of Firalief, but would not tell where it was deposited for preservation. Bishop Reynald of Stavanger, who was an Englishman, was considered very greedy of money. He was a great friend of King Magnus, and it was thought likely that great treasure and valuables had been given into his keeping. Men were sent for him accordingly, and he came to Bergen, where it was insisted against him that he had some knowledge of such treasure, but he denied it altogether, would not admit it, and offered to clear himself by ordeal. King Harold would not have this, but laid on the bishop a money fine of fifteen marks of gold, which he should pay to the king. The bishop declared he would not thus impoverish his bishop's see, but would rather offer his life. On this they hanged the bishop out on the home, beside the sling machine. As he was going to the gallows he threw the sock from his foot, and said with an oath, I know no more about King Magnus' treasure than what is in this sock. And in it there was a gold ring. Bishop Reynald was buried at Norden's in Michael's church, and this deed was much blamed. After this Harold Giel was sole king of Norway as long as he lived. 9. Wonderful Omens in Conungahela Five years after King Sigurd's death remarkable occurrences took place in Conungahela, A.D. 1135. Guthorm, a son of Harold Fletter, and Seamund Husfrija, were at that time the king's officers there. Seamund was married to Ingebjorg, a daughter of the priest Andres Brunson. Their sons were Paul Flip and Gunn Fis. Seamund's natural son was called Asmund. Andres Brunson was a very remarkable man, who carried on divine service in the cross church. His wife, one, was called Solveig. John Lopson, who was then eleven years old, was in their house to be fostered and educated. The priest Lopt Samunson, John's father, was also in the town at that time. The priest Andres and Solveig had a daughter by name Helga, who was Einar's wife. It happened now in Conungahela, the next Sunday night after Easter week, that there was a great noise in the streets through the whole town as if the king was going through with all his court men. The dogs were so affected that nobody could hold them, but they slipped loose, and when they came out they ran mad, biting all that came in their way, people and cattle. All who were bitten by them till the blood came turned raging mad. And pregnant women were taken in labor prematurely, and became mad. From Easter to Ascension Day, these portentous circumstances took place almost every night. People were dreadfully alarmed at these wonders. And many made themselves ready to remove, sold their houses, and went out to the country districts, or to other towns. The most intelligent men looked upon it as something extremely remarkable, were in dread of it. And said, as it proved to be, that it was an omen of important events which had not yet taken place. And the priest Andres, on Whit Sunday, made a long and excellent speech, and turned the conclusion of it to the distressing situation of the townspeople telling them to muster courage, and not lay waste their excellent town by deserting it, but rather to take the utmost care in all things, and use the greatest foresight against all dangers, as of fire or the enemy. And to pray to God to have mercy on them. End notes. 1. The Catholic priests appear to have had wives at that time. In Norway, and celibacy to have been confined to the monks. L. 10. 
The Rise of War in Kanungahela. Thirteen loaded merchant ships made ready to leave the town, intending to proceed to Bergen, but eleven of them were lost, men and goods, and all that was in them. The twelfth was lost also, but the people were saved, although the cargo went to the bottom. At that time the priest Lopt went north to Bergen, with all that belonged to him, and arrived safely. The merchant vessels were lost on St. Lawrence Eve, August 10. The Danish king Eirik and the archbishop Assur, both sent notice to Kanungahela to keep watch on their town. And said the Vinland people had a great force on foot with which they made war far around on Christian people, and usually gained the victory. But the townspeople attended very little to this warning, were indifferent, and forgot more and more the dreadful omens the longer it was since they happened. On the holy St. Lawrence day, while the words of high mass were spoken, came to the Vinland king Redeber to Kanungahela with five hundred and fifty Vinland cutters, and in each cutter were forty-four men and two horses. The king's sister's son Dunamis, and Uniber, a chief who ruled over many people, were with him. These two chiefs rode at once, with a part of their troops, up the east arm of the Ghat River past Heising Isle, and thus came down to the town. But a part of the fleet lay in the western arm, and came so to the town. They made fast their ships at the piles, and landed their horses, and rode over the height of Bratzes, and from thence up around the town. Einar, a relation of priest Andres, brought these tidings up to the castle church, for there the whole inhabitants of the town were gathered to hear high mass. Einar came just as the priest Andres was holding his discourse. And he told the people that an army was sailing up against the town with a great number of ships of war, and that some people were riding over Bratzes. Many said it must be the Danish king Eirik, and from him they might expect peace. The people ran down into the town to their properties, armed themselves, and went down upon the piers, whence they immediately saw there was an enemy and an immense army. Nine East Country trading vessels belonging to the merchants were afloat in the river at the piers. The Vinland people first directed their course toward these and fought with the merchants, who armed themselves, and defended themselves long, well, and manfully. There was a hard battle, and resistance, before the merchant vessels were cleared of their men, and in this conflict the Vinland people lost 150 of their ships, with all the men on board. When the battle was sharpest the townsmen stood upon the piers, and shot at the heathens. But when the fight slackened the Burgesses fled up to the town, and from thence into the castle. And the men took with them all their valuable articles, and such goods as they could carry. Solveig and her daughters, with two other women, went on shore when the Vinlanders took possession of the merchant vessels. Now the Vinlanders landed, and mustered their men, and discovered their loss. Some of them went up into the town, some on board the merchant ships, and took all the goods they pleased, and then they set fire to the town, and burnt it and the ships. They hastened then with all their army to assault the castle. 11. The Second Battle King Redeber made an offer to those who were in the castle that they should go out, and he would give them their lives, weapons, clothes, silver, and gold. But all exclaimed against it, and went out on the fortification, some shot, some threw stones, some sharp stakes. It was a great battle, in which many fell on both sides, but by far the most of the Vindlanders. Solveig came up to a large farm called Saldjord, and brought the news. A message war token was there split, and sent out to Skirbegar, where there happened to be a joint ale-drinking feast, and many men were assembled. A bond called Olver Miklamun, Miklemouth, was there, who immediately sprang up, took helmet and shield, and a great axe in his hand, and said, Stand up, brave lads, and take your weapons. Let us go help the townspeople. For it would appear shameful to every man who heard of it, if we sit here sipping our ale, while good men in the town are losing their lives by our neglect. Many made an objection, and said they would only be losing their own lives, without being of any assistance to the townspeople. Then said Olver, although all of you should hold back, I will go alone. And one or two heathens, at any rate, shall fall before I fall. He ran down to the town, and a few men after him to see what he would do, and also whether they could assist him in any way. When he came near the castle, and the heathens saw him, they sent out eight men fully armed against him, and when they met, 
the heathen men ran and surrounded him on all sides. Over lifted his axe, and struck behind him with the extreme point of it, hitting the neck of the man who was coming up behind him, so that his throat and jawbone were cut through, and he fell dead backwards. Then he heaved his axe forwards, and struck the next man in the head, and clove him down to the shoulders. He then fought with the others, and killed two of them, but was much wounded himself. The four who remained took to flight, but Ulver ran after them. There was a ditch before them, and two of the heathens jumped into it, and Ulver killed them both, but he stuck fast himself in the ditch, so that two of the eight heathens escaped. The men who had followed Ulver took him up, and brought him back to Skirbagar, where his wounds were bound and healed, and it was the talk of the people, that no single man had ever made such a bloody onset. Two lender men, Sigurd Jurdson, a brother of Philip, and Sigurd, came with six hundred men to Skirbagar, on which Sigurd turned back with four hundred men. He was but little respected afterwards, and soon died. Sigurd, on the other hand, proceeded with two hundred men towards the town, and they gave battle to the heathens, and were all slain. While the Vinlanders were storming the castle, their king and his chiefs were out of the battle. At one place there was a man among the Vinlanders shooting with a bow, and killing a man for every arrow, and two men stood before him, and covered him with their shields. Then Simund Husfrija said to his son Asmund, that they should both shoot together at this bowman. But I will shoot at the man who holds the shield before him. He did so, and he knocked the shield down a little before the man. And in the same instant Asmund shot between the shields, and the arrow hit the bowman in the forehead, so that it came out at his neck, and he fell down dead. When the Vindlanders saw it they howled like dogs, or like wolves. Then King Redeber called to them that he would give them safety and life, but they refused terms. The heathens again made a hard assault. One of the heathens in particular fought so bravely, and ventured so near, that he came quite up to the castle gate, and pierced the man who stood outside the gate with his sword. And although they used both arrows and stones against him, and he had neither shield nor helmet, nothing could touch him, for he was so skilled in witchcraft that weapon could not wound him. Then priest Andres took consecrated fire, blew upon it. Cut tinder in pieces, and laid it on the fire, and then laid the tinder on the arrow point, and gave it to Asmund. He shot this arrow at the warlock, and the shaft hit so well that it did its business, and the man of witchcraft fell dead. Then the heathens crowded together as before, howling and whining dreadfully, and all gathered about their king, on which the Christians believed that they were holding a council about retreating. The interpreters, who understood the Vinland tongue, heard the chief Uniberg make the following speech, These people are brave, and it is difficult to make anything of them. And even if we took all the goods in their town, we might willingly give as much more that we had never come here, so great has been our loss of men and chiefs. Early in the day, when we began to assault the castle, they defended themselves first with arrows and spears, then they fought against us with stones, and now with sticks and staves, as against dogs. I see from this that they are in want of weapons and means of defense, so we shall make one more hard assault, and try their strength. It was as he said, that they now fought with stakes. Because, in the first assault, they had imprudently used up all their missile weapons and stones, and now when the Christians saw the number of their stakes diminishing, they clave each stake in two. The heathens now made a very hot attack, and rested themselves between whiles, and on both sides they were exhausted. During a rest the Vinland king Redeber again offered terms, and that they should retain the weapons, clothes, and silver they could carry out of the castle. Simund Husfrija had fallen, and the men who remained gave the counsel to deliver up the castle and themselves into the power of the heathens, but it was a foolish counsel. For the heathens did not keep their promises, but took all people, men, women, and children, and killed all of them who were wounded or young, or could not easily be carried with them. They took all the goods that were in the castle, went into the cross church, and plundered it of all its ornaments. The priest Andres gave King Redeber a silver-mounted gilt scepter, and to his sister's son Dunamis he gave a gold ring. They supposed from this that he was a man of great importance in the town, and held him in higher respect than the others. They took away with them the holy cross, 
and also the tables which stood before the altar, which Sigurd had got made in the Greek country, and had brought home himself. These they took, and laid flat down on the steps before the altar. Then the heathens went out of the church. Redeber said, This house has been adorned with great zeal for the God to whom it is dedicated. But, methinks, he has shown little regard for the town or house, so I see their God has been angry at those who defended them. King Redeber gave the priest Andres the church, the shrine, the holy cross, the Bible, the altar book, and four clerks, prisoners, but the heathens burnt the castle church, and all the houses that were in the castle. As the fire they had set to the church went out twice, they hewed the church down, and then it burnt like other houses. Then the heathens went to their ships with the booty. But when they mustered their people and saw their loss, they made prisoners of all the people, and divided them among the vessels. Now priest Andres went on board the king's ship with the holy cross, and there came a great terror over the heathens on account of the portentous circumstance which took place in the king's ship. Namely, it became so hot that all thought they were to be burnt up. The king ordered the interpreter to ask the priest why this happened. He replied, that the Almighty God on whom the Christians believed, sent them a proof of his anger, that they who would not believe in their Creator presumed to lay hands on the emblem of his suffering. And that there lay so much power in the cross, that such, and even clearer miracles, happened to heathen men who had taken the cross in their hands. The king had the priest put into the ship's boat, and the priest Andres carried the holy cross in his grasp. They led the boat along past the ship's bow, and then along the side of the next ship, and then shoved it with a boat hook in beside the pier. Then Andres went with the cross by night to Saljorg, in rain and dreadful weather. But brought it in good preservation. King Redeber, and the men he had remaining, went home to Vinland, and many of the people who were taken at Conungahela were long afterwards in slavery in Vindland. And those who were ransomed and came back to Norway to their Udal lands and properties, throve worse than before their capture. The merchant town of Conungahela has never since risen to the importance it was of before this event. 12. Of Magnus the Blind King Magnus, after he was deprived of sight, went north to Nidaros, where he went into the cloister on the home, and assumed the monk's dress. The cloister received the farm of Great Herns in Frosta for his support. King Harold alone ruled the country the following winter, gave all men peace and pardon who desired it, and took many of the men into his court service who had been with King Magnus. Einar Skulison says that King Harold had two battles in Denmark. The one at Hved Nile, and the other at Hlesi Isle. Unwearied champion. Who wast bred? To stain thy blue edged weapons red. Beneath high Hveden's rocky shore. The faithless felt thy steel once more. And again, thus. On Hlesi's plain the foe must quail. For him who dies their shirts of mail. His storm stretched banner o'er his head. Flies straight, and fills the foe with dread. 13. Of King Harold Gill and Bishop Magnus. King Harold Giel was a very generous man. It is told that in his time Magnus Einarsson came from Iceland to be consecrated a bishop, and the king received him well, and showed him much respect. When the bishop was ready to sail for Iceland again, and the ship was rigged out for sea, he went to the hall where the king was drinking, saluted him politely and warmly, and the king received him joyfully. The queen was sitting beside the king. Then said the king, Are you ready, bishop? for your voyage. He replied that he was. The king said, You come to us just now at a bad time, for the tables are just removed, and there is nothing at hand suitable to present to you. What is there to give the bishop? The treasurer replies, Sire, as far as I know, all articles of any value are given away. The king, here is a drinking goblet remaining, take this, bishop, it is not without value. The bishop expressed his thanks for the honor shown him. Then said the queen, Farewell, bishop. And a happy voyage. The king said to her, When did you ever hear a noble lady say so to a bishop without giving him something? She replies, Sire, what have I to give him? The king, thou hast the cushion under thee. Thereupon this, which was covered with costly cloth, 
and was a valuable article, was given to the bishop. When the bishop was going away the king took the cushion from under himself and gave it him, saying, They have long been together. When the bishop arrived in Iceland to his bishop's see, it was talked over what should be done with the goblet that would be serviceable for the king. And when the bishop asked the opinion of other people, many thought it should be sold, and the value bestowed on the poor. Then said the bishop, I will take another plan. I will have a chalice made of it for this church, and consecrate it, so that all the saints of whom there are relics in this church shall let the king have some good for his gift every time a mass is sung over it. This chalice has since belonged to the bishopric of Skalholt, and of the costly cloth with which the cushions given him by the king were covered, were made the chorister's cloaks which are now in Skalholt. From this the generous spirit of King Harold may be seen, as well as from many other things, of which but a few are set down here. 14. Beginning of Sigurd Slembejakn. There was a man, by name Sigurd, who was brought up in Norway, and was called Priest Adalbrecht's son. Sigurd's mother was Thora, a daughter of Sax of Vik, a sister of Sigurd, who was mother of King Olaf Magnusson, and of Kerr, the king's brother who married Borghild, a daughter of Dag Ilifsson. Their sons were Sigurd of Ostrat and Dag. Sigurd of Ostrat's sons were John of Ostrat, Thorstein, and Andres the Deaf. John was married to Sigurd, a sister of King Inga and of Duke Skjol. This Sigurd, in his childhood, was kept at his book, became a clerk, and was consecrated a deacon. But as he ripened in years and strength he became a very clever man, stout, strong, distinguished for all perfections and exercises beyond any of his years, indeed, beyond any man in Norway. Sigurd showed early traces of a haughty ungovernable spirit, and was therefore called Slembejakn. He was as handsome a man as could be seen, with rather thin but beautiful hair. When it came to Sigurd's ears that his mother said King Magnus was his father, he laid aside all clerkship, and as soon as he was old enough to be his own master, he left the country. He was a long time on his travels, went to Palestine. Was at the Jordan River, and visited many holy places, as pilgrims usually do. When he came back, he applied himself to trading expeditions. One winter he was in Orkney with Earl Harold, and was with him when Thorkel Foster Summerladason was killed. Sigurd was also in Scotland with the Scottish King David, and was held in great esteem by him. Thereafter Sigurd went to Denmark. And according to the account of himself and his men, he there submitted to the iron ordeal to confirm his paternal descent, and proved by it, in the presence of five bishops, that he was a son of King Magnus Barefoot. So says Ivar Ingemunson, in Sigurd's song. The holiest five. Of men alive. Bishops were they. Solemnly say. The iron glowing. Red hot, yet showing. No scathe on skin. Proves cause and kin. King Harold Giel's friends, however, said this was only a lie, and deceit of the Danes. 15. Sigurd in Iceland. It is told before of Sigurd that he passed some years in merchant voyages, and he came thus to Iceland one winter, and took up his lodging with Thorgils Odson in Sorby, but very few knew where he was. In autumn, when the sheep were being driven into a fold to be slaughtered, a sheep that was to be caught ran to Sigurd. And as Sigurd thought the sheep ran to him for protection, he stretched out his hands to it and lifted it over the fold dike, and let it run to the hills, saying, There are not many who seek help from me, so I may well help this one. It happened the same winter that a woman had committed a theft, and Thorgils, who was angry at her for it, was going to punish her, but she ran to Sigurd to ask his help, and he set her upon the bench by his side. Thorgils told him to give her up, and told him what she had committed. But Sigurd begged forgiveness for her since she had come to him for protection, and that Thorgils would dismiss the complaint against her, but Thorgils insisted that she should receive her punishment. When Sigurd saw that Thorgils would not listen to his entreaty, he started up, drew his sword, and bade him take her if he dared. And Thorgils seeing that Sigurd would defend the woman by force of arms, and observing his commanding mien, guessed who he must be, desisted from pursuing the woman, and pardoned her. There were many foreign men there, and Sigurd made the least appearance among them. 
One day Sigurd came into the sitting room, and a Northman who was splendidly clothed was playing chess with one of Thorad's house servants. The Northman called Sigurd, and asked him his advice how to play, but when Sigurd looked at the board, he saw the game was lost. The man who was playing against the Northman had a sore foot, so that one toe was bruised, and matter was coming out of it. Sigurd, who was sitting on the bench, takes a straw, and draws it along the floor, so that some young kittens ran after it. He drew the straw always before them, until they came near the house servant's foot, who jumping up with a scream, threw the chessmen in disorder on the board, and thus it was a dispute how the game had stood. This is given as a proof of Sigurd's cunning. People did not know that he was a learned clerk until the Saturday before Easter, when he consecrated the holy water with chant, and the longer he stayed there the more he was esteemed. The summer after, Sigurd told Thorgils before they parted, that he might with all confidence address his friends to Sigurd Slembejakn. Thorgils asked how nearly he was related to him, on which he replies, I am Sigurd Slembejakn, a son of King Magnus Barefoot. He then left Iceland. 16. Of Sigurd Slem. When Harald Gilles had been six years, A.D. 1136, King of Norway, Sigurd came to the country and went to his brother King Harald, and found him in Bergen. He placed himself entirely in the king's hands, disclosed who his father was, and asked him to acknowledge their relationship. The king gave him no hasty or distinct reply, but laid the matter before his friends in a conference at a specially appointed meeting. After this conference it became known that the king laid an accusation against Sigurd, because he had been at the killing of Thorkel Foster in the west. Thorkel had accompanied Harald to Norway when he first came to the country, and had been one of Harald's best friends. This case was followed up so severely, that a capital accusation against Sigurd was made, and, by the advice of the lender men, was carried so far, that some of the king's pursuivants went one evening late to Sigurd, and called him to them. They then took a boat and rowed away with Sigurd from the town south to Nordens. Sigurd sat on a chest in the stern of the boat, and had his suspicions that foul play was intended. He was clothed in blue trousers, and over his shirt he had a hood tied with ribbons, which served him for a cloak. He sat looking down, and holding his hood strings, and sometimes moved them over his head, sometimes let them fall again before him. Now when they had passed the ness, they were drunk, and merry, were rowing so eagerly that they were not taking notice of anything. Sigurd stood up, and went on the boat's deck. But the two men who were placed to guard him stood up also, and followed him to the side of the vessel, holding by his cloak, as is the custom in guarding people of distinction. As he was afraid that they would catch hold of more of his clothes, he seized them both, and leaped overboard with them. The boat, in the meantime, had gone on a long way, and it was a long time before those on board could turn the vessel, and long before they could get their own men taken on board again. And Sigurd dived under water, and swam so far away that he reached the land before they could get the boat turned to pursue him. Sigurd, who was very swift of foot, hied up to the mountains, and the king's men travelled about the whole night seeking him without finding him. He lay down in a cleft of the rocks. And as he was very cold he took off his trousers, cut a hole in the seat of them, and stuck his head through it, and put his arms in the legs of them. He escaped with life this time. And the king's men returned, and could not conceal their unsuccessful adventure. 17. Treachery towards King Harold. Sigurd thought now that it would be of no use to seek any help from King Harold again. And he kept himself concealed all the autumn and the beginning of the winter. He lay hid in Bergen, in the house of a priest. King Harold was also in the town, and many great people with him. Now Sigurd considered how, with his friend's help, he might take the king by surprise, and make an end of him. Many men took part in this design. And among them some who were King Harold's courtmen and chamberlains, but who had formerly been King Magnus' courtmen. They stood in great favor with the king, and some of them sat constantly at the king's table. On St. Lucia's day, December 13, in the evening when they proposed to execute this treason, two men sat at the king's table talking together. And one of them said to the king, Sire, we two table companions submit our dispute to your judgment, 
having made a wager of a basket of honey to him who guesses right. I say that you will sleep this night with your queen Ingerid. And he says that you will sleep with Thora, Guthorm's daughter. The king answered laughing, and without suspecting in the least that there lay treachery under the question, that he who had asked had lost his bet. They knew thus where he was to be found that night, but the main guard was without the house in which most people thought the king would sleep, viz, that which the queen was in. 18. Murder of King Harold Sigurd Slemb, and some men who were in his design, came in the night to the lodging in which King Harold was sleeping, killed the watchman first, then broke open the door, and went in with drawn swords. Ivar Kolbeinson made the first attack on King Harold, and as the king had been drunk when he went to bed he slept sound, and awoke only when the men were striking at him. Then he said in his sleep, Thou art treating me hardly, Thora. She sprang up, saying, They are treating thee hardly who love thee less than I do. Harold was deprived of life. Then Sigurd went out with his helpers, and ordered the men to be called to him who had promised him their support if he should get King Harold taken out of the way. Sigurd and his men then went on, and took a boat, set themselves to the oars, and rowed out in front of the king's house, and then it was just beginning to be daylight. Then Sigurd stood up, spoke to those who were standing on the king's pier, made known to them the murder of King Harold by his hand, and desired that they would take him, and choose him as chief according to his birth. Now came many swarming down to the pier from the king's house, and all with one voice replied, that they would never give obedience or service to a man who had murdered his own brother. And if thou art not his brother, thou hast no claim from descent to be king. They clashed their weapons together, and adjudged all murderers to be banished and outlawed men. Now the king's horn sounded, and all lendermen and courtmen were called together. Sigurd and his companions saw it was best for them to get way. And he went northward to North Hordaland, where he held a thing with the bonds, who submitted to him, and gave him the title of king. From thence he went to San, and held a thing there with the bonds and was proclaimed king. Then he went north across the fjords, and most people supported his cause. So says Ivar Ingemunson. On Harold's fall. The bonds all. In Horde and Son. Took Magnus' son. The thing swore too. They would be true. To this new head. In Harold's stead. King Harold was buried in the old Christ church. Saga of Sigurd, Inga, and Eistian, the sons of Harold. Preliminary Remarks Sigurd died A.D. 1155, Eistian 1157, and Inga 1161. Other literature is Morkinskina and Fagerskina. Sigurd Slemb is the subject of a drama by Bjornstjern Bjornsson, translated into English by William Morton Payne, and published by Houghton, Mifflin and Company. Boston, 1888. Skalds quoted are, Kahl, Einar Skjulason, and Thorbjörn Skakaskald. 1. History of King Sigurd and Inga. Queen Ingerid, and with her the lendermen and the court which had been with King Harald, resolved to send a fast-sailing vessel to Thrandjum to make known King Harald's death. And also to desire the Thrandjum people to take King Harald's son Sigurd for king. He was then in the north, and was fostered by Satajurd Bardson. Queen Ingerid herself proceeded eastward immediately to Viking. Inga was the name of her son by King Harald, and he was then fostered by Amun Jurdson, a grandson of Logburs. When they came to Viking a Borga thing was immediately called together, at which Inga, who was in the second year of his age, was chosen king. This resolution was supported by Amun and Thjostolf Alasun, together with many other great chiefs. Now when the tidings came north to Thrandjum that King Harald was murdered, the Thrandjum people took Sigurd, King Harald's son, to be the king. And this resolution was supported by Otter Birding, Peter Sodolfsson, the brothers Guthorm of Rain, and Otter Bale, sons of Asolf and many other great chiefs. Afterwards the whole nation almost submitted to the brothers, and principally because their father was considered holy. And the country took the oath to them, that the kingly power should not go to any other man as long as any of King Harald's sons were alive. 2. Of Sigurd Slembejakn. 
Sigurd Slemb sailed north around Stad. And when he came to North Moor, he found that letters and full powers had arrived before him from the leaders who had given in their allegiance to Harold's sons, so that there he got no welcome or help. As Sigurd himself had but few people with him, he resolved to go with them to Thrandjum, and seek out Magnus the Blind, for he had already sent a message before him to Magnus' friends. Now when they came to the town, they rode up the river Nid to meet King Magnus, and fastened their land ropes on the shore at the king's house, but were obliged to set off immediately, for all the people rose against them. They then landed at Munkholm, and took Magnus the Blind out of the cloister against the will of the monks, for he had been consecrated a monk. It is said by some that Magnus willingly went with them. Although it was differently reported, in order to make his cause appear better. Sigurd, immediately after Yule, January, A.D. 1137, went forth with his suite, expecting aid from his relations and Magnus' friends, and which they also got. Sigurd sailed with his men out of the fjord, and was joined afterwards by Bjorn Egilson, Gunnar of Gimsar, Halder Sigurdsson, Aslak Hackinson, the brothers Bendict and Eirik, and also the court which had before been with King Magnus, and many others. With this troop they went south to Moor, and down to the mouth of Romsdal Fjord. Here Sigurd and Magnus divided their forces, and Sigurd went immediately westwards across the sea. King Magnus again proceeded to the uplands, where he expected much help and strength, and which he obtained. He remained there the winter and all the summer, A.D. 1137, and had many people with him. But King Inga proceeded against him with all his forces, and they met at a place called Min. There was a great battle, at which King Magnus had the most people. It is related that Thjostolf Olason carried King Inga in his belt as long as the battle lasted, and stood under the banner, but Thjostolf was hard pressed by fatigue and fighting. And it is commonly said that King Inga got his ill health there, and which he retained as long as he lived, so that his back was knotted into a hump, and the one foot was shorter than the other. And he was besides so infirm that he could scarcely walk as long as he lived. The defeat began to turn upon Magnus and his men. And in the front rank of his array fell Halder Sigurdsson, Bjorn Egilson, Gunnar of Gimsar, and a great number of his men, before he himself would take to his horse and fly. So says Kal. Thy arrow storm on men's banks. Fast thin the foeman's strongest ranks. Thy good sword hewed the raven's feast. On men's banks up in the east. Shield clashed on shield, and bucklers broke. Under thy battle axe stroke. While thou, uncovered, urged the fray. Thy shield and mail coat thrown away. And also this. The king to heaven belonging fled. When thou, in war's quick death game bred. Unpanzered, shieldless on the plain. His heavy steel clad guards hadst slain. The painted shield, and steel plate mail. Before thy fierce attack soon fail. To Magnus who belongs to heaven. Was no such fame in battle given. Magnus fled eastward to Gotland, and then to Denmark. At that time there was in Gotland an earl, Karl Sonneson, who was a great and ambitious man. Magnus the Blind and his men said, wherever they happened to meet with chiefs, that Norway lay quite open to any great chieftain who would attack it. For it might well be said there was no king in the country, and the kingdom was only ruled by lender men, and, among those who had most sway, there was, for mutual jealousy, most discord. Now Karl, being ambitious of power, listens willingly to such speeches, collects men, and rides west to Viking, where many people, out of fear, submit to him. When Thjostolf Olason and Amund heard of this, they went with the men they could get together, and took King Inga with them. They met Earl Karl and the Gotland army eastward in Krokoskog, where there was a great battle and a great defeat, King Inga gaining the victory. Munin Ogmundsen, Earl Karl's mother's brother, fell there. Ogmund, the father of Munin, was a son of Earl Orm Ilifsen, and Sigrid, a daughter of Earl Finn Arneson. Astrid, Ogunun's daughter, was the mother of Earl Karl. Many others of the Gotland people fell at Krokoskog. And the Earl fled eastward through the forest. King Inga pursued them all the way out of the kingdom, 
and this expedition turned out a great disgrace to them. So says Kal. I must proclaim how our great lord. Color deep red his ice-cold sword. And ravens played with Gotland bones. And wolves heard Gotlanders' last groans. Their silly jests were well repaid. In Crocuscog their laugh was laid. Thy battle power was then well tried. And they who won may now deride. 3. King Eirik's Expedition to Norway Magnus the Blind then went to Denmark to King Eirik Imun, where he was well received. He offered the king to follow him if he would invade Norway with a Danish army, and subdue the country. Saying, that if he came to Norway with his army, no man in Norway would venture to throw a spear against him. The king allowed himself to be moved by Magnus' persuasions, ordered a levy, and went north to Norway with two hundred ships. And Magnus and his men were with him on this expedition. When they came to Viken, they proceeded peacefully and gently on the east side of the fjord. But when the fleet came westward to Tunsberg, a great number of King Inga's lender men came against them. Their leader was Vatnorm Dagson, a brother of Gregorius. The Danes could not land to get water without many of them being killed. And therefore they went in through the fjord to Oslo, where Thjostolf Olesson opposed them. It is told that some people wanted to carry the Holy Halvard's coffin out of the town in the evening when the fleet was first observed, and as many as could took hold of it. But the coffin became so heavy that they could not carry it over the church floor. The morning after, however, when they saw the fleet sailing in past the Hofut Isle, for men carried the coffin out of the town, and Thjostolf and all the townspeople followed it. 4. The town of Oslo burnt. King Eirik and his army advanced against the town, and some of his men hastened after Thjostolf and his troop. Thjostolf threw a spear at a man named Askel, which hit him under the throat, so that the spear point went through his neck. And Thjostolf thought he had never made a better spear cast, for, except the place he hit, there was nothing bare to be seen. The shrine of St. Halvard was taken up to Romerike, where it remained for three months. Thjostolf went up to Romerik, and collected men during the night, with whom he returned towards the town in the morning. In the meantime King Eirik set fire to Halvard's church, and to the town, which was entirely burnt. Thjostolf came soon after to the town with the men he had assembled, and Eirik sailed off with his fleet, but could not land anywhere on that side of the fjord, on account of the troops of the lender men who came down against them. And wherever they attempted a landing, they left five or six men or more upon the strand. King Inga lay with a great number of people into Hornborussund, but when he learned this, he turned about southwards to Denmark again. King Inga pursued him, and took from him all the ships he could get hold of, and it was a common observation among people, that never was so poor an expedition made with so great an armament in another king's dominions. King Eirik was ill-pleased at it, and thought King Magnus and his men had been making a fool of him by encouraging him to undertake this expedition, and he declared he would never again be such friends with them as before. 5. Of Sigurd Slembejakn Sigurd Slembejakn came that summer from the West Sea to Norway, where he heard of his relation King Magnus' unlucky expedition. So he expected no welcome in Norway, but sailed south, outside the rocks, past the land, and set over to Denmark, and went into the sound. He fell in with some Vinland cutters south of the islands, gave them battle, and gained the victory. He cleared eight ships, killing many of the men, and he hanged the others. He also had a battle off the island Mon with the Vinland men, and gained a victory. He then sailed from the south and came to the eastern arm of the Gott River, and took three ships of the fleet of Thor of Vinantord, and Olaf, the son of Harald Kessia, who was Sigurd's own sister's son. For Ragenhild, the mother of Olaf, was a daughter of King Magnus Barefoot. He drove Olaf up the country. Thjostolf was at this time in Konungahela, and had collected people to defend the country, and Sigurd steered thither with his fleet. They shot at each other, but he could not effect a landing, and, on both sides, many were killed and many wounded. Ulfhedin Saxulfsson, Sigurd's folksal man, fell there. He was an Icelander, from the north quarter. 
Sigurd continued his course northwards to Viken and plundered far and wide around. Now when Sigurd lay in a harbour called Proturja on Limgard's coast, and watched the ships going to or coming from Viken to plunder them, the Tunsberg men collected an armed force against him. And came unexpectedly upon them while Sigurd and his men were on shore dividing their booty. Some of the men came down from the land, but some of the other party laid themselves with their ships right across the harbour outside of them. Sigurd ran up into his ship, and rode out against them. Vatnorm's ship was the nearest, and he let his ship fall behind the line, and Sigurd rode clear past, and thus escaped with one ship and the loss of many men. This verse was made upon Vatnorm, 1. The water serpent, people say. From Portirja slipped away. End notes. 1. Vatnorm, the name of this man, means the water serpent. And appears to have been a favorite name for warships also. Hence the pun in the lines upon Vatnorm. L. 6. The murder of Baintine. Sigurd Slembejakn sailed from thence to Denmark, and at that time a man was lost in his ship, whose name was Kolbi and Thorliatsen of Batald. He was sitting in a boat which was made fast to the vessel, and upset because she was sailing quickly. When they came south to Denmark, Sigurd's ship itself was cast away, but he got to Olleborg, and was there in winter. The summer after, A.D. 1138, Magnus and Sigurd sailed together from the south with seven ships, and came unexpectedly in the night to Lister, where they laid their ships on the land. Baintine Kolbeinsen, a courtman of King Inga, and a very brave man, was there. Sigurd and his men jumped on shore at daylight, came unexpectedly on the people, surrounded the house, and were setting fire to the buildings. But Baintine came out of a storehouse with his weapons, well armed, and stood within the door with drawn sword, his shield before him, helmet on, and ready to defend himself. The door was somewhat low. Sigurd asked which of his lads had most desire to go in against Baintine, which he called brave man's work, but none was very hurried to make ready for it. While they were discussing this matter Sigurd rushed into the house, past Baintine. Baintine struck at him, but missed him. Sigurd turned instantly on Baintine, and after exchanging blows, Sigurd gave him his deathstroke, and came out presently bearing his head in his hands. They took all the goods that were in the farmhouse, carried the booty to their ships, and sailed away. When King Inga and his friends, and also Kolbe and sons, Sigurd and Gyrd, the brothers of Baintine, heard of Baintine's murder, the king sent a great force against Sigurd Slemb and his followers. And also travelled himself, and took a ship from Hakan Paulsen Pungelta, who was a daughter's son of a slack, a son of Erling Skjolgsen of Sol, and cousin of Hakan Mage. King Inga drove Hakan and his followers up the country, and took all their gear. Sigurd Stork, a son of Eindride of Gotdal, and his brother, Eirik Hale, and Andres Kelduskit, son of Grim of Vist, all fled away into the fjords. But Sigurd Slem, Magnus the Blind and Thoriev Skiapa sailed outside the isles with three ships north to Halagaland, and Magnus was in winter, A.D. 1139, north in Jarki Isle with Vidkin Johnson. But Sigurd had the stem and stern post of his ship cut out, made a hole in her, and sank her in the inner part of Aegisfjord, and thereafter he passed the winter at Tildesen by Gljufraford in Hin. Far up the fjord there is a cave in the rock. In that place Sigurd sat with his followers, who were above twenty men, secretly, and hung a grey cloth before the mouth of the hole, so that no person could see them from the strand. Thorleif Skiapa, and Einar, son of Ogmund of Sand, and of Gudrun, daughter of Einar Erison of Rikia Holer, procured food for Sigurd during the winter. It is said that Sigurd made the Laplanders construct two boats for him during the winter up in the fjord. And they were fastened together with deer sinews, without nails, and with twigs of willow instead of knees, and each boat could carry twelve men. Sigurd was with the Laplanders while they were making the boats. And the Laplanders had good ale, with which they entertained Sigurd. Sigurd made these lines on it. In the Lapland tent. Brave days we spent. Under the grey birch tree. In bed or on bank. We knew no rank. And a merry crew were we. 
good ale went round. As we sat on the ground. Under the grey birch tree. And up with the smoke. Flew laugh and joke. And a merry crew were we. These boats were so light that no ship could overtake them in the water, according to what was sung at the time. Our skin-sewed fin boats lightly swim. Over the sea like wind they skim. Our ships are built without a nail. Few ships like ours can row or sail. In spring Sigurd and Magnus went south along the coast with the two boats which the Laplanders had made, and when they came to Vagar they killed Sven the priest and his two sons. 7. Of Sigurd Slem's Campaign Thereafter Sigurd came south to Vicar, and seized King Sigurd's lendermen, William Skinner and Thorold Kept, and killed them both. Then Sigurd turned southwards along the coast, and met Sturker Glicerofa south of Berda, as he was coming from the south from the town of Nidaros, and killed him. Now when Sigurd came south to Valsens, he met Svinagrim outside of the Ness, and cut off his right hand. From thence he went south to Moor, past the mouth of the Thrangem Fjord, where they took Hadeen Herdmich and Calf Kringluch. They let Hadeen escape, but killed Calf. When King Sigurd, and his foster father, Sadigerd, heard of Sigurd Slembejakn's proceedings, and what he was doing, they sent people to search for him, and their leader was John Cauda, a son of Calf Range. Bishop Ivor's brother, and besides the priest John Smyrel. They went on board the ship the Reindeer, which had twenty-two rowing benches, and was one of the swiftest sailing vessels, to seek Sigurd. But as they could not find him, they returned northwards with little glory, for people said that they had got sight of Sigurd and his people, and durst not attack them. Afterwards Sigurd proceeded southwards to Hordaland, and came to Hurdla, where Einar, a son of Laxapol, had a farm, and went into Hamar's fjord, to the Gangdagathing. They took all the goods that were at the farm, and a long ship of twenty-two benches which belonged to Einar, and also his son, four years old, who was living with one of his labouring people. Some wanted to kill the boy, but others took him and carried him with them. The labouring man said, It will not be lucky for you to kill the child, and it will be of no use to you to carry him away, for it is my son, and not Einar's. And on his word they let the boy remain, and went away. When Einar came home he gave the labourer money to the value of two or of gold, and thanked him for his clever invention, and promised him his constant friendship. So says Eirik Odson, who first wrote down this relation, and he heard himself Einar Paulson telling these circumstances in Bergen. Sigurd then went southward along the coast all the way east to Viken, and met Finn Sodolfsson east at Kvildar, as he was engaged in drawing in King Inga's rents and duties, and hanged him. Then they sailed south to Denmark. 8. Of King Inga's letter to King Sigurd. The people of Viken and of Bergen complained that it was wrong for King Sigurd and his friends to be sitting quietly north in the town of Nidaros. While his father's murderer was cruising about in the ordinary passage at the mouth of the Thrangem Fjord. And King Inga and his people, on the other hand, were in Viken in the midst of the danger, defending the country and holding many battles. Then King Inga sent a letter north to the merchant town Nidaros, in which were these words, King Inga Haraldson sends his brother King Sigurd, as also Sadigerd, Ogman Svipt, Otter Birding, and all lendermen, courtmen, housepeople. And all the public, rich and poor, young and old, his own and God's salutation. The misfortune is known to all men that on account of our childhoods, thou being five, and I but three years of age, we can undertake nothing without the counsel of our friends and other good men. Now I and my men think that we stand nearer to the danger and necessity common to us both, than thou and thy friends. Therefore make it so that thou, as soon as possible, come to me, and as strong in troops as possible, that we may be assembled to meet whatever may come. He will be our best friend who does all he can that we may be united, and may take an equal part in all things. But if thou refuse, and wilt not come after this message which I send thee in need, as thou hast done before, then thou must expect that I will come against thee with an armament, and let God decide between us. For we are not in a condition to sit here at so great an expense, and with so numerous a body of troops as are necessary here on account of the enemy, 
and besides many other pressing charges. Whilst thou hast half of all the land tax and other revenues of Norway. Live in the peace of God. 9. Otter Birding Speech Then Otter Birding stood up in the thing, and first of all answered thus, This is King Sigurd's reply to his brother King Inga, that God will reward him for his good salutation. And likewise for the trouble and burden which he and his friends have in this kingdom, and in matters of necessity which affect them both. Although now some think there is something sharp in King Inga's message to his brother Sigurd, yet he has in many respects sufficient cause for it. Now I will make known to you my opinion, and we will hear if King Sigurd and the other people of power will agree to it, and it is, that thou, King Sigurd, make thyself ready, with all the people who will follow thee, to defend thy country. And go as strong in men as possible to thy brother King Inga as soon as thou art prepared, in order to assist each other in all things that are for the common good, and may God Almighty strengthen and assist you both. Now, King, we will have thy words. Peter, a son of Sodolf, who was afterwards called Peter Bertersvain, bore King Sigurd to the thing. Then the king said, Ye must know that, if I am to advise, I will go as soon as possible to my brother King Inga. Then others spoke, one after the other. But although each began his speech in his own way, he ended with agreeing to what Otter Birding had proposed, and it was determined to call together the war forces, and go to the east part of the country. King Sigurd accordingly went with great armament east to Viken, and there he met his brother King Inga. 10. Fall of Magnus the Blind The same autumn, A.D. 1139, Sigurd Slemb and Magnus the Blind came from Denmark with thirty ships, manned both with Danes and Northmen. It was near to winter. When the kings heard of this, they set out with their people eastwards to meet them. They met at Valor, near home the Grey, the day after Martinus, which was a Sunday. King Inga and King Sigurd had twenty ships, which were all large. There was a great battle. But, after the first assault, the Danes fled home to Denmark with eighteen ships. On this Sigurd's and Magnus' ships were cleared. And as the last was almost entirely bare of men, and Magnus was lying in his bed, cried our Gryatgardson, who had long followed him, and been his courtman, took King Magnus in his arms, and tried to run with him on board some other ship. But Hrydar was struck by a spear, which went between his shoulders, and people say King Magnus was killed by the same spear. Hrydar fell backwards upon the deck, and Magnus upon him. And every man spoke of how honorably he had followed his master and rightful sovereign. Happy are they who have such praise. There fell, on King Magnus' ship, Loden Sopret of Linustadar, Bruce Thormodson. And the men to Sigurd Slembejakn, Ivar Kolbeinson and Halyard Fager, who had been in Sigurd Slem's forehold. This Ivar had been the first who had gone in, in the night, to King Harald, and had laid hands on him. There fell a great number of the men of King Magnus and Sigurd Slem, for Inga's men let not a single one escape if they got hold of him, but only a few are named here. They killed upon a home more than forty men, among whom were two Icelanders, the priest Sigurd Bergthorsen, a grandson of Moss, the other Clement, a son of Arain Arson. But three Icelanders obtained their lives, namely, Ivar Skrauthank, a son of Calf Range, and who afterwards was Bishop of Thrandjum, and was father of the Archbishop Eirik. Ivar had always followed King Magnus, and he escaped into his brother John Cauda's ship. John was married to Cecilia, a daughter of G.Y.R.D. Bardson, and was then in King Inga's and Sigurd's armament. There were three in all who escaped on board of John's ship. The second was Armjornam, who afterwards married Thorstein's daughter in Odsholt. The third was Ivar Dinta, a son of Stair, but on the mother's side of a Thrandjum family, a very agreeable man. When the troops came to know that these three were on board his ship, they took their weapons and assaulted the vessel, and some blows were exchanged, and the whole fleet had nearly come to a fight among themselves. But it came to an agreement, so that John ransomed his brothers Ivar and Armjorn for a fixed sum in ransom, which, however, was afterwards remitted. But Ivar Dinta was taken to the shore, and beheaded. For Sigurd and Gyrd, the sons of Kolbian, would not take any mulk for him, 
as they knew he had been at their brother Baintine's murder. Ivar the bishop said, that never was there anything that touched him so nearly, as Ivar's going to the shore under the axe, and turning to the others with the wish that they might meet in joy hereafter. Gudrid Berger's daughter, a sister of Archbishop John, told Eirik Odson that she heard Bishop Ivar say this. 11. Sigurd Slem taken prisoner. A man called Thran Gildkir was the steersman of King Inga's ship. It was come so far, that Inga's men were rowing in small boats between the ships after those who were swimming in the water, and killed those they could get hold of. Sigurd Slem threw himself overboard after his ship had lost her crew, stripped off his armor under the water, and then swam with his shield over him. Some men from Thran's vessel took prisoner a man who was swimming, and were about to kill him. But he begged his life, and offered to tell them where Sigurd Slem was, and they agreed to it. Shields and spears, dead men, weapons, and clothes, were floating all around on the sea about the ships, ye can see, said he, a red shield floating on the water, he is under it. They rode to it immediately, took him, and brought him on board of Thran's ship. Thran then sent a message to Thjostolf, Otter, and Amund. Sigurd Slem had a tinder box on him, and the tinder was in a walnut shell, around which there was wax. This is related, because it seems an ingenious way of preserving it from ever getting wet. He swam with a shield over him, because nobody could know one shield from another where so many were floating about. And they would never have hit upon him, if they had not been told where he was. When Thrand came to the land with Sigurd, and it was told to the troops that he was taken, the army set up a shout of joy. When Sigurd heard it he said, Many a bad man will rejoice over my head this day. Then Thjostolf Olason went to where Sigurd was sitting, struck from his head a silk hat with silver fringes, and said, Why wert thou so impudent, thou son of a slave? To dare to call thyself King Magnus Barefoot's son? Sigurd replied, Presume not to compare my father to a slave, for thy father was of little worth compared to mine. Hal, a son of the Dr. Thorgir Steinson, King Inga's courtman, was present at this circumstance, and told it to Eirik Odson, who afterwards wrote these relations in a book, which he called Krigjarstyk. In this book is told all concerning Harald Giel and his sons, and Magnus the Blind, and Sigurd Slembejakn, until their deaths. Eirik was a sensible man, who was long in Norway about that time. Some of his narratives he wrote down from Hakon Mage's account, some were from Lendermen of Harold's sons, who along with his sons were in all this feud, and in all the councils. Eirik names, moreover, several men of understanding and veracity, who told him these accounts, and were so near that they saw or heard all that happened. Something he wrote from what he himself had heard or seen. 12. Torture of Sigurd Slem. Hal says that the chiefs wished to have Sigurd killed instantly, but the men who were the most cruel, and thought they had injuries to avenge, advised torturing him. And for this they named Baintine's brothers, Sigurd and Gyrd, the sons of Colbian. Peter Bertersvain would also avenge his brother Finn. But the chiefs and the greater part of the people went away. They broke his shin bones and arms with an axe hammer. Then they stripped him, and would flay him alive, but when they tried to take off the skin, they could not do it for the gush of blood. They took leather whips and flogged him so long, that the skin was as much taken off as if he had been flayed. Then they stuck a piece of wood in his back until it broke, dragged him to a tree and hanged him. And then cut off his head, and brought the body and head to a heap of stones and buried them there. All acknowledge, both enemies and friends, that no man in Norway, within memory of the living, was more gifted with all perfections, or more experienced, than Sigurd, but in some respects he was an unlucky man. Hal says that he spoke little, and answered only a few, and in single words, under his tortures, although they spoke to him. Hal says further, that he never moved when they tortured him, more than if they were striking a stock or a stone. This Hal alleged as proof that he was a brave hero, who had courage to endure tortures, for he still held his tongue, and never moved from the spot. And farther he says, that he never altered his voice in the least, but spoke with as much ease as if he was sitting at the ale table, neither speaking higher nor lower, 
nor in a more tremulous voice than he was used to do. He spoke until he gave up the ghost, and sang between whiles parts of the psalm book, and which Hal considered beyond the powers and strength of ordinary men. And the priest who had the church in the neighborhood let Sigurd's body be transported thither to the church. This priest was a friend of Harold's sons, but when they heard it they were angry at him, had the body carried back to where it had been, and made the priest pay a fine. Sigurd's friends afterwards came from Denmark with a ship for his body, carried it to Olleborg, and interred it in Mary Church in that town. So said Dean Kettle, who officiated as priest at Mary Church, to Eirik, and that Sigurd was buried there. Jostolf Olesund transported Magnus the Blind's body to Oslo, and buried it in Halvard's church, beside King Sigurd his father. Loden Soprud was transported to Tunsberg, but the others of the slain were buried on the spot. 13. Eistian Haraldsson comes to Norway. When the King Sigurd and Inga had ruled over Norway about six years, Eistian, who was a son of Harald Giel, came in spring from Scotland, A.D. 1142. Arn Stella, Thorleif Brynjolfsson, and Kolbe and Hruga had sailed westward over the sea after Eistian, accompanied him to Norway, and sailed immediately with him to Thrandjum. The Thrandjum people received him well. And at the era thing of Ascension Day he was chosen king, so that he should have the third part of Norway with his brothers Sigurd and Inga. They were at this time in the east part of the country. And men went between the kings who brought about a peace, and that Eistian should have a third part of the kingdom. People believed what he said of his paternal descent, because King Harald himself had testified to it, and he did not resort to the ordeal of iron. King Eistian's mother was called Jadok, and she followed him to Norway. Magnus was the name of King Harald Giel's fourth son, who was fostered by Kirpingorm. He also was chosen king, and got a fourth part of the country, but Magnus was deformed in his feet, lived but a short time, and died in his bed. Einar Skulason speaks of them. The generous Eistian money gave. Sigurd in fight was quick and brave. Inga loved well the war alarm. Magnus to save his land from harm. No country boasts a nobler race. The battlefield, or thing, to grace. For brothers of such high pretense. The sun ne'er shone upon at once. 14. Murder of Otter Birding. After King Harald Giel's death Queen Ingerid married Otter Birding, who was a lenderman and a great chief, and of a Thrandjum family, who strengthened King Inga's government much while he was in his childhood. King Sigurd was not very friendly to Otter, because, as he thought, Otter always took King Inga's side. Otter Birding was killed north in the merchant town, Nidaros, in an assault upon him in the twilight as he was going to the evening song. When he heard the whistling of the blow he held up his cloak with his hands against it, thinking, no doubt, it was a snowball thrown at him, as young boys do in the streets. Otter fell by the stroke. But his son, Alf Rode, who just at the same moment was coming into the churchyard, saw his father's fall, and saw that the man who had killed him ran east about the church. Alf ran after him, and killed him at the corner of the choir. And people said that he had good luck in avenging his father, and afterwards was much more respected than he had been before. 15. Beginning of King Eistian King Eistian Haraldsson was in the interior of the Thrandjum district when he heard of Otter's murder, and summoned to him the Bond army, with which he proceeded to the town, and he had many men. Otter's relations and other friends accused King Sigurd, who was in the town, of having instigated this deed, and the bonds were much enraged against him. But the king offered to clear himself by the ordeal of iron, and thereby to establish the truth of his denial, and accordingly a peace was made. King Sigurd went to the south end of the country, and the ordeal was never afterwards heard of. 16. Beginning of ORM The King Brother Queen Ingerid had a son to Ivar Snaes, and he was called ORM, and got the surname of King Brother. He was a handsome man in appearance, and became a great chief, as shall be told hereafter. Ingerid afterwards married Arn of Stadrain, who was from this called King's Mate, and their children were Inga, Nicholas, Philip of Herdla, and Margaret, who was first married to Bjorn Buk, and afterwards to Simon Karasun. 17. 
Journey of Erling Skak and Earl Ragnvald. Kerpingorm and Ragenhild, a daughter of Svenk Stein Arsen, had a son called Erling. Kerpingorm was a son of Sven Sveinsen, who was a son of Erling of Gerd. Otto's mother was Ragna, a daughter of Earl Orm Ilifsen and Sigrid, a daughter of Earl Finn Arneson. The mother of Earl Orm was Ragenhild, a daughter of Earl Hakon the Great. Erling was a man of understanding, and a great friend of King Inga, by whose assistance and counsel Erling obtained in marriage Christina, a daughter of King Sigurd the Crusader and Queen Malmfred. Erling possessed a farm at Studla in South Hordaland. Erling left the country, and with him went Eindride Unge and several lendermen, who had chosen men with them. They intended to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and went across the West Sea to Orkney. Their Earl Ragnvald and Bishop William joined them. And they had in all fifteen ships from Orkney, with which they first sailed to the South Hebrides, from thence west to Valland, and then the same way King Sigurd the Crusader had sailed to Norvasund. And they plundered all around in the heathen part of Spain. Soon after they had sailed through the Norvasund, Eindride Unge and his followers, with six ships, separated from them, and then each was for himself. Earl Ragnvald and Erling Skak fell in with a large ship of burden at sea called a Dramund, and gave battle to it with nine ships. At last they laid their cutters close under the Dramund. But the heathens threw both weapons and stones, and pots full of pitch and boiling oil. Erling laid his ship so close under the Dramund, that the missiles of the heathens fell without his ship. Then Erling and his men cut a hole in the Dramund, some working below and some above the watermark, and so they boarded the vessel through it. So says Thorbjorn Skakaskald, in his poem on Erling. The axes of the Northmen bold. A door into the huge ship's hold. Hewed through her high and curved side. As snug beneath her bulge they ride. Their spears bring down the astonished foe. Who cannot see from whence the blow? The eagles pray, they, man by man. Fall by the Northmen's daring plan. Audenrod, Erling's foxel man, was the first man who got into the Dramund. Then they carried her, killing an immense number of people, making an extraordinarily valuable booty, and gaining a famous victory. Earl Ragnvald and Erling Skak came to Palestine in the course of their expedition, and all the way to the River Jordan. From thence they went first to Constantinople, where they left their ships, traveled northwards by land, and arrived in safety in Norway, where their journey was highly praised. Erling Skak appeared now a much greater man than before, both on account of his journey and of his marriage. Besides he was a prudent sensible man, rich, of great family, eloquent, and devoted to King Inga by the strictest friendship more than to the other royal brothers. 18. Birth of Hakon Hertebraid King Sigurd went to a feast east in Viking along with his court, and rode past a house belonging to a great bond called Simon. While the king was riding past the house, he heard within such beautiful singing that he was quite enchanted with it, and rode up to the house, and saw a lovely girl standing at the hand mill and grinding. The king got off his horse, and went to the girl and courted her. When the king went away, the bond Simon came to know what the object of the king's visit had been. The girl was called Thora, and she was Simon the bond's servant girl. Simon took good care of her afterwards, and the girl brought forth a male child, A.D. 1047, who was called Hakon, and was considered King Sigurd's son. Hakon was brought up by Simon Thorbergsen and his wife Gunhild. Their own sons also, Anand and Andreas, were brought up with Hakon, and were so dear to him that death only could have parted them. 19. Eistian and the Peasants of Heising Isle While King Eistian Haraldson was in Viking, he fell into disputes with the bonds of rain and the inhabitants of Heising Isle, who assembled to oppose him. But he gave them battle at a place called Leekberg, and afterwards burnt and destroyed all around in Heising, so that the bonds submitted to his will, paid great fines to the king, and he took hostages from them. So says Einar Skulison. The Viking men won't strive again. With words or blows. The king to oppose. None safety found. On Viking's ground. Till all, afraid. Pledge and scat paid. 
and further. The king came near. He who is dear to all good men came down the glen by Leekburg Hill. They who do ill, the rain folk, fly or quarter cry. 20. War Expedition of King Haraldson Soon after King Eistian began his journey out of the country over sea to the west, A.D. 1153, and sailed first to Caithness. Here he heard that Earl Harold Madad's son was in Thursa, to which he sailed directly in three small boats. The Earl had a ship of thirty banks of oars, and nearly eighty men in her. But they were not prepared to make resistance, so that King Eistian was able to board the ship with his men. And he took the Earl prisoner and carried him to his own ship, but the earl ransomed himself with three marks of gold, and thus they parted. Einar Skulison tells of it thus. Earl Harold in his stout ship lay. On the bright sand in Thursa Bay. With fourscore men he had no fear. Nor thought the Norse king was so near. He who provides the eagle's meals. In three small boats alongshore steals. And Madad's son must ransom pay. For his bad outlook that fair day. From thence King Eistian sailed south along the east side of Scotland, and brought up at a merchant town in Scotland called Aberdeen, where he killed many people, and plundered the town. So says Einar Skulison. At Aberdeen, too, I am told. Fell many by our Norsemen bold. Peace was disturbed, and blue swords broke with many a hard and bloody stroke. The next battle was at Hartlepool in the south, with a party of horsemen. The king put them to flight, and seized some ships there. So says Einar. At Hartlepool, in rank and row, the king's courtmen attacked the foe. The king's sharp sword in blood was red. Blood dropped from every Norse spearhead. Ravens rejoice o'er the warm food. Of English slain, each where he stood. And in the ships their thirst was quenched. The decks were in the foe's blood drenched. Then he went southwards to England, and had his third battle at Whitby, and gained the victory, and burnt the town. So says Einar. The ring of swords, the clash of shields, were loud in Whitby's peaceful fields. For here the king stirred up the strife. Dot. Man against man, for death or life. O'er roof and tower, rose on high. The red wrath fire in the sky. House after house the red fiend burns. By blackened walls the poor man mourns. Thereafter he plundered wide around in England, where Stephen was then the king. After this King Eistian fought with some cavalry at Scarpasker. So says Einar. At Scarpasker the English horse. Retire before the Norse king's force. The arrow shower like snowdrift flew. And the shield covered foemen slew. He fought next at Palavik, and gained the victory. So says Einar. At Palavik the wild wolf feeds. Well furnished by the king's brave deeds. He poured upon the grass green plain. A red shower from the Perth men slain. On westwards in the sea he urges. With fire and sword the country purges. Langtown he burns, the country rang. For sword on shield incessant clang. Here they burnt Langaton, a large village. And people say that the town has never since risen to its former condition. After this King Eistian left England in autumn, and returned to Norway. People spoke in various ways about this expedition. 21. Of Harold's Sons there was good peace maintained in Norway in the first years of the government of Harold's sons, and as long as their old counselors were alive, there was some kind of unanimity among them. While Inga and Sigurd were in their childhood, they had a court together, but Eistian, who was come to age of discretion, had a court for himself. But when Inga's and Sigurd's counselors were dead, namely, Satajurd Bard's son, Otter Birding, Amun Jurd's son, Thjostolf Alla's son, Ogman Svipter, and Ogman Denger, a brother of Erling Skak, Erling was not much looked up to while Ogman lived. The two kings, Inga and Sigurd divided their courts. King Inga then got great assistance from Gregorius Dagson, 
a son of Dag Ilifsen by Ragenhild a daughter of Skaptiag Munson. Gregorius had much property, and was himself a thriving, sagacious man. He presided in the governing the country under King Inga, and the king allowed him to manage his property for him according to his own judgment. 22. Habits and Manners of Harold's Sons When King Sigurd grew up he was a very ungovernable, restless man in every way, and so was King Eistian, but Eistian was the more reasonable of the two. King Sigurd was a stout and strong man, of a brisk appearance. He had light brown hair, an ugly mouth, but otherwise a well-shaped countenance. He was polite in his conversation beyond any man, and was expert in all exercises. Einar Skulason speaks of this. Sigurd, expert in every way. To wield the sword in bloody fray. Showed well that to the bold and brave. God always luck and victory gave. In speech, as well as bloody deeds. The king all other men exceeds. And when he speaks we think that none. Has said a word but he alone. King Eistian was dark and dingy in complexion, of middle height, and a prudent able man. But what deprived him of consideration and popularity with those under him were his avarice and narrowness. He was married to Ragna, a daughter of Nicholas Mays. King Inga was the handsomest among them in countenance. He had yellow but rather thin hair, which was much curled. His stature was small, and he had difficulty in walking alone, because he had one foot withered, and he had a hump both on his back and his breast. He was of cheerful conversation, and friendly towards his friends, was generous, and allowed other chiefs to give him counsel in governing the country. He was popular, therefore, with the public. And all this brought the kingdom and the mass of the people on his side. King Harald Gilles' daughter Brigida was first married to the Swedish King Inga Holsteinsen, and afterwards to Earl Karl Sonnesen, and then to the Swedish King Magnus. She and King Inga Haraldsson were cousins by the mother's side. At last Brigida married Earl Berger Brose, and they had four sons, namely, Earl Philip, Earl Canute, Folke, and Magnus. Their daughters were Ingegerd, who was married to the Swedish King Sortver, and their son was King John, a second daughter was called Kristen, and a third Margaret. Harald Gilles' second daughter was called Maria, who was married to Simon Scalp, a son of Hockelhook, and their son was called Nicholas. King Harald Gilles' third daughter was called Margaret, who was married to John Hockelson, a brother of Simon. Now many things occurred between the brothers which occasion differences and disputes, but I will only relate what appears to me to have produced the more important events. 23. Cardinal Nicholas comes to the country. In the days of Harold's sons Cardinal Nicholas came from Rome to Norway, being sent there by the Pope. The Cardinal had taken offence at the brothers Sigurd and Eistian, and they were obliged to come to a reconciliation with him. But, on the other hand, he stood on the most affectionate terms with King Inga, whom he called his son. Now when they were all reconciled with him, he moved them to let John Bergerson be consecrated Archbishop of Thrandjum and gave him a vestment which is called a pallium. And settled moreover that the Archbishop's seat should be in Nidaros, in Christ Church, where King Olaf the Saint reposes. Before that time there had only been common bishops in Norway. The Cardinal introduced also the law, that no man should go unpunished who appeared with arms in the merchant town, excepting the twelve men who were in attendance on the king. He improved many of the customs of the Northmen while he was in the country. There never came a foreigner to Norway whom all men respected so highly, or who could govern the people so well as he did. After some time he returned to the south with many friendly presents, and declared ever afterwards that he was the greatest friend of the people of Norway. When he came south to Rome the former Pope died suddenly, and all the people of Rome would have Cardinal Nicholas for Pope, and he was consecrated under the name of Adrian. And according to the report of men who went to Rome in his days, he had never any business, however important, to settle with other people, but he would break it off to speak with the Northmen who desired to see him. He was not long Pope, and is now considered a saint. 24. Miracle of King Olaf in the time of Harald Gilles' sons, it happened that a man called Halder fell into the hands of the Vinland people, who took him and mutilated him, cut open his neck, 
took out the tongue through the opening, and cut out his tongue root. He afterward sought out the holy King Olaf, fixed his mind entirely on the holy man, and weeping besought King Olaf to restore his speech and health. Thereupon he immediately recovered his speech by the good king's compassion, went immediately into his service for all his life, and became an excellent trustworthy man. This miracle took place a fortnight before the last Olafsmas, upon the day that Cardinal Nicholas set foot on the land of Norway. 25. Miracles of King Olaf on Richard In the uplands were two brothers, men of great family, and men of fortune, Einar and Andres, sons of Guthorm Grabert, and brothers of King Sigurd Haraldson's mother, and they had great properties and Udal estates in that quarter. They had a sister who was very handsome, but did not pay sufficient regard to the scandal of evil persons, as it afterwards appeared. She was on a friendly footing with an English priest called Richard, who had a welcome to the house of her brothers, and on account of their friendship for him she did many things to please him, and often to his advantage. But the end of all this was, that an ugly report flew about concerning this girl. When this came into the mouth of the public all men threw the blame on the priest. Her brothers did the same, and expressed publicly, as soon as they observed it, that they laid the blame most on him. The great friendship that was between the earl and the priest proved a great misfortune to both, which might have been expected, as the brothers were silent about their secret determination, and let nothing be observed. But one day they called the priest to them, who went, expecting nothing but good from them, enticed him from home with them, saying that they intended to go to another district, where they had some needful business, and inviting him to go with them. They had with them a farm servant who knew their purpose. They went in a boat along the shore of a lake which is called Rand's Lake, and landed at a nest called Skiptisand, where they went on shore and amused themselves a while. Then they went to a retired place, and commanded their servant man to strike the priest with an axe hammer. He struck the priest so hard that he swooned, but when he recovered he said, Why are ye playing so roughly with me? They replied, Although nobody has told thee of it before, thou shalt now find the consequence of what thou hast done. They then upbraided him, but he denied their accusations, and besought God and the holy king Olaf to judge between them. Then they broke his leg bones, and dragged him bound to the forest with them, and then they put a string around his head, and put a board under his head and shoulders, and made a knot on the string, and bound his head fast to the board. Then the elder brother, Einar, took a wedge, and put it on the priest's eye, and the servant who stood beside him struck upon it with an axe, so that the eye flew out, and fell upon the board. Then he set the pin upon the other eye, and said to the servant, Strike now more softly. He did so, and the wedge sprang from the eye stone, and tore the eyelid loose. Then Einar took up the eyelid in his hand, and saw that the eye stone was still in its place, and he set the wedge on the cheek, and when the servant struck it the eye stone sprang out upon the cheekbone. Thereafter they opened his mouth, took his tongue and cut it off, and then untied his hands and his head. As soon as he came to himself, he thought of laying the eye stones in their place under the eyelids, and pressing then with both hands as much as he could. Then they carried him on board, and went to a farm called Seheimrad, where they landed. They sent up to the farm to say that a priest was lying in the boat at the shore. While the message was going to the farm, they asked the priest if he could talk, and he made a noise and attempted to speak. Then said Einar to his brother, If he recover and the stump of his tongue grow, I am afraid he will get his speech again. Thereupon they seized the stump with a pair of tongs, drew it out, cut it twice, and the third time to the very roots, and left him lying half dead. The housewife in the farm was poor. But she hastened to the place with her daughter, and they carried the priest home to their farm in their cloaks. They then brought a priest, and when he arrived he bound all his wounds, and they attended to his comfort as much as they were able. And thus lay the wounded priest grievously handled, but trusting always to God's grace, and never doubting, and although he was speechless, he prayed to God in thought with a sorrowful mind, but with the more confidence the worse he was. He turned his thoughts also to the mild King Olaf the Saint, God's dear favorite, of whose excellent deeds he had heard so much told, and trusted so much more zealously on him with all his heart for help in his necessity. As he lay there lame, and deprived of all strength, he wept bitterly, 
moaned, and prayed with a sore heart that the dear King Olaf would help him. Now when this wounded priest was sleeping after midnight, he thought he saw a gallant man coming to him, who spoke these words, Thou art Olaf, friend Richard, and thy strength is little. He thought he replied to this assentingly. Then the man accosted him again, Thou requirest compassion. The priest replies, I need the compassion of Almighty God and the Holy King Olaf. He answered, Thou shalt get it. Thereupon he pulled the tongue stump so hard that it gave the priest pain, then he stroked with his hands his eyes, and legs, and other wounded members. Then the priest asked who he was. He looked at him, and said, Olaf, come here from Thrandjum. And then disappeared. But the priest awoke altogether sound, and thus he spoke, Happy am I, and thanks be to the Almighty God and the Holy King Olaf, who have restored me. Dreadfully mishandled as he had been, yet so quickly was he restored from his misfortune that he scarcely thought he had been wounded or sick. His tongue was entire, both his eyes were in their places, and were clear-sighted. His broken legs and every other wound were healed, or were free from pain, and, in short, he had got perfect health. But as a proof that his eyes had been punched out, there remained a white scar on each eyelid, in order that this dear king's excellence might be manifest on the man who had been so dreadfully misused. 26. King Inga and Sigurd hold a thing. King Eystein and King Sigurd had quarreled, because King Sigurd had killed King Eystein's courtman Harold, the Viking man, who owned a house in Bergen, and also the priest John Tappert, a son of Jarn Sigurdsson. On account of this affair, a conference to settle it was appointed in winter in the uplands. The two sat together in the conference for a long time, and so much was known of their conference that all three brothers were to meet the following summer in Bergen. It was added, that their conference was to the effect that King Inga should have two or three farms, and as much income as would keep thirty men beside him, as he had not health to be a king. When King Inga and Gregorius heard this report, they came to Bergen with many followers. King Sigurd arrived there a little later, and was not nearly so strong in men. Sigurd and Inga had then been nineteen years kings of Norway, A.D. 1155. King Eystein came later still from the south than the other two from the north. Then King Inga ordered the thing to be called together on the home by the sound of trumpet, and Sigurd and Inga came to it with a great many people. Gregorius had two long ships, and at the least ninety men, whom he kept in provisions. He kept his housemen better than other lendermen. For he never took part in any entertainment where each guest brings his liquor, without having all his housemen to drink with him. He went now to the thing in a gold-mounted helmet, and all his men had helmets on. Then King Inga stood up, and told the assembly what he had heard, how his brothers were going to use him, and depose him from his kingdom, and asked for their assistance. The assembled people made a good return to his speech, and declared they would follow him. 27. Of Gregorius Dagson. Then King Sigurd stood up and said it was a false accusation that King Inga had made against him and his brother, and insisted that Gregorius had invented it. And insinuated that it would not be long, if he had his will, before they should meet so that the golden helmet should be doffed, and ended his speech by hinting that they could not both live. Gregorius replied, that Sigurd need not long so much for this, as he was ready now, if it must be so. A few days after, one of Gregorius's housemen was killed out upon the street, and it was Sigurd's housemen who killed him. Gregorius would then have fallen upon King Sigurd and his people, but King Inga, and many others, kept him back. But one evening, just as Queen Ingerid, King Inga's mother, was coming from Vespers, she came past where Sigurd Skriderna, a courtman of King Inga, lay murdered. He was then an old man, and had served many kings. King Sigurd's courtmen, Halyard Gunnarsson, and Sigurd, a son of Eystein Trafael, had killed him, and people suspected it was done by order of King Sigurd. She went immediately to King Inga, and told him he would be a little king if he took no concern, but allowed his court men to be killed, the one after the other, like swine. The king was angry at her speech. And while they were scolding about it, came Gregorius in helmet and armor, and told the king not to be angry, for she was only saying the truth. 
And I am now, says he, come to thy assistance, if thou wilt attack King Sigurd. And here we are, above one hundred men in helmets and armor, and with them we will attack where others think the attack may be worst. But the most dissuaded from this course, thinking that Sigurd would pay the mulk for the slaughter done. Now when Gregorius saw that there would be no assault, he accosted King Inga thus, Thou wilt frighten thy men from thee in this way. For first they lately killed my houseman, and now thy courtman, and afterwards they will chase me, or some other of thy lender men whom thou wouldst feel the loss of, when they see that thou art indifferent about such things. And at last, after thy friends are killed, they will take the royal dignity from thee. Whatever thy other lender men may do, I will not stay here longer to be slaughtered like an ox. But Sigurd the king and I have a business to settle with each other tonight, in whatever way it may turn out. It is true that there is but little help in thee on account of thy ill health, but I should think thy will should not be less to hold thy hand over thy friends, and I am now quite ready to go from hence to meet Sigurd. And my banner is flying in the yard. Then King Inga stood up, and called for his arms, and ordered every man who wished to follow him to get ready, declaring it was of no use to try to dissuade him, for he had long enough avoided this, but now steel must determine between them. 28. Of King Sigurd's Fall King Sigurd sat and drank in Sigurd Sayeda's house ready for battle, although people thought it would not come to an assault at all. Then came King Inga with his men down the road from the smithy shops, against the house. Arn, the king's brother-in-law, came out from the sand bridge, a slack Erlinson from his own house, and Gregorius from the street where all thought the assault would be worst. King Sigurd and his men made many shots from the holes in the loft, broke down the fireplaces, and threw stones on them. Gregorius and his men cut down the gates of the yard. And there in the port fell Einar, a son of Laxapal, who was of Sigurd's people, together with Halvard Gunnarsson, who was shot in a loft, and nobody lamented his death. They hewed down the houses, and many of King Sigurd's men left him, and surrendered for quarter. Then King Sigurd went up into a loft, and desired to be heard. He had a gilt shield, by which they knew him, but they would not listen to him, and shot arrows at him as thick as snow in a snow shower, so that he could not stay there. As his men had now left him, and the houses were being hewn down, he went out from thence, and with him his courtman Thord Husfrija from Viking. They wanted to come where King Inga was to be found, and Sigurd called to his brother King Inga, and begged him to grant him life and safety, but both Thord and Sigurd were instantly killed, and Thord fell with great glory. King Sigurd was interred in the old Christ church out on the home. King Inga gave Gregorius the ship King Sigurd had owned. There fell many of King Sigurd's and King Inga's men, although I only name a few, but of Gregorius's men there fell four and also some who belonged to no party, but were shot on the piers, or out in the ships. It was fought on a Friday, and fourteen days before St. John the Baptist's Day, June 10, 1155. Two or three days after King Eistian came from the eastward with thirty ships, and had along with him his brother's son Hakon, a son of King Sigurd. Eistian did not come up to the town, but lay in Floravager, and good men went between to get a reconciliation made. But Gregorius wanted that they should go out against him, thinking there never would be a better opportunity. And offered to be himself the leader. For thou, king, shalt not go, for we have no want of men. But many dissuaded from this course, and it came to nothing. King Eistian returned back to Viken, and King Inga to Thrangem, and they were in a sort reconciled, but they did not meet each other. 29. Of Gregorius Dagson. Somewhat later than King Eistian, Gregorius Dagson also set out to the eastward and came to his farm Bratsburg in Hofund. But King Eistian was up in the fjord at Oslo, and had his ships drawn above two miles over the frozen sea, for there was much ice at that time in Viking. King Eistian went up to Hofund to take Gregorius. But he got news of what was on foot, and escaped to Thelemark with ninety men, from thence over the mountains, and came down in Hardinja and at last to Studla in Etni, to Erling Skak's farm. Erling himself had gone north to Bergen. But his wife Kristen, a daughter of King Sigurd, was at home, and offered Gregorius all the assistance he wanted, and he was hospitably received. 
He got a long ship there which belonged to Erling, and everything else he required. Gregorius thanked her kindly, and allowed that she had behaved nobly, and as might have been expected of her. Gregorius then proceeded to Bergen, where he met Erling, who thought also that his wife had done well. 30. Reconciliation of Eistian and Inga. Then Gregorius went north to Thrandjum, and came there before Yule. King Inga was rejoiced at his safety, and told him to use his property as freely as his own, King Eistian having burnt Gregorius's house, and slaughtered his stock of cattle. The ship docks which King Eistian the Elder had constructed in the merchant town of Nidaros, and which had been exceedingly expensive, were also burnt this winter, together with some good vessels belonging to King Inga. This deed was ascribed to King Eistian and Philip Jurdson, King Sigurd's foster brother, and occasioned much displeasure and hatred. The following summer King Inga went south with a very numerous body of men. And King Eistian came northwards, gathering men also. They met in the east, A.D. 1156, at the Seelys, near to the Nays, but King Inga was by far the strongest in men. It was nearly coming to a battle. But at last they were reconciled on these conditions, that King Eistian should be bound to pay forty-five marks of gold, of which King Inga should have thirty marks, because King Eistian had occasioned the burning of the docks and ships. And, besides, that Philip, and all who had been accomplices in the deed, should be outlawed. Also that the men should be banished the country, against whom it could be proved that they gave blow or wound to King Sigurd. For King Eistian accused King Inga of protecting these men, and that Gregorius should have fifteen marks of gold for the value of his property burnt by King Eistian. King Eistian was ill-pleased with these terms, and looked upon the treaty as one forced upon him. From that meeting King Inga went eastward to Viken, and King Eistian north to Thrandjum. And they had no intercourse with each other, nor were the messages which passed between them very friendly, and on both sides they killed each other's friends. King Eistian, besides, did not pay the money. And the one accused the other of not fulfilling what was promised. King Inga and Gregorius enticed many people from King Eistian. Among others, Bard Standale Brynjolfsson, Simon Scalp, a son of Hockel Hook, Halder Brynjolfsson, John Hockelson, and many other lendermen. 31. Of Eistian and Inga. Two years after King Sigurd's fall, A.D. 1157, both kings assembled armaments. Namely, King Inga in the east of the country, where he collected eighty ships, and King Eistian in the north, where he had forty-five, and among these the great dragon, which King Eistian Magnusson had built after the long serpent. And they had on both sides many and excellent troops. King Inga lay with his ships south at Master Isle, and King Eistian a little to the north in Greeningassand. King Eistian sent the young Aslak Johnson, and Arn Stella, a son of Snabejorn, with one ship to meet King Inga, but when the king's men knew them, they assaulted them, killed many of their people, and took all that was in the ship belonging to them. Aslak and Arn and a few more escaped to the land, went to King Eistian, and told him how King Inga had received them. Thereupon King Eistian held a house thing, and told his followers how ill King Inga had treated his men, and desired the troops to follow him. I have, said he, so many, and such excellent men, that I have no intention to fly, if ye will follow me. But this speech was not received with much favor. Hockel Hook was there, but both his sons, Simon and John, were with King Inga. Hockel replied, so loud that many heard him, Let thy chests of gold follow thee, and let them defend thy land. 32. King Eistian's Death In the night many of King Eistian's ships rode secretly away, some of them joining King Inga, some going to Bergen, or up into the fjords, so that when it was daylight in the morning the king was lying behind with only ten ships. Then he left the great dragon, which was heavy to row, and several other vessels behind, and cut and destroyed the dragon, started out the ale, and destroyed all that they could not take with them. King Eistian went on board of the ship of Eindried, a son of John Morner, sailed north into San, and then took the land road eastwards to Viken. King Inga took the vessels, and sailed with them outside of the isles to Viken. King Eistian had then got east as far as Fold, and had with him one thousand two hundred men, 
but when they saw King Inga's force, they did not think themselves sufficiently strong to oppose him, and they retired to the forest. Every one fled his own way, so that the king was left with but one man. King Inga and his men observed King Eistian's flight, and also that he had but few people with him, and they went immediately to search for him. Simon Scalp met the king just as he was coming out of a willow bush. Simon saluted him. God save you, sire, said he. The king replied, I do not know if thou art not sire here. Simon replied, That is as it may happen. The king begged him to conceal him, and said it was proper to do so. For there was long friendship between us, although it has now gone differently. Simon replied, It could not be. Then the king begged that he might hear mass before he died, which accordingly took place. Then Eistian laid himself down on his face on the grass, stretched out his hands on each side, and told them to cut the sign of the cross between his shoulders, and see whether he could not bear steel as King Inga's followers had asserted of him. Simon told the man who had to put the king to death to do so immediately, for the king had been creeping about upon the grass long enough. He was accordingly slain, and he appears to have suffered manfully. His body was carried to Furs, and lay all night under the hill at the south side of the church. King Eistian was buried in Furs church, and his grave is in the middle of the church floor, where a fringed canopy is spread over it, and he is considered a saint. Where he was executed, and his blood ran upon the ground, sprang up a fountain, and another under the hill where his body lay all night. From both these waters many think they have received a cure of sickness and pain. It is reported by the Viking people that many miracles were wrought at King Eistian's grave, until his enemies poured upon it soup made of boiled dog's flesh. Simon's scalp was much hated for this deed, which was generally ascribed to him. But some said that when King Eistian was taken Simon sent a message to King Inga, and the king commanded that King Eistian should not come before his face. So King Svera has caused it to be written. But Einar Skulason tells of it thus. Simon Scalp, the traitor bold. For deeds of murder known of old. His king betrayed, and ne'er will he. God's blessed face hereafter see. Saga of Hakan Hurtabrade, Hakan the Broad-Shouldered, 1. Preliminary Remarks. This saga describes the feud between Hakan Sigurdsson and his uncle Inga. The only skald quoted is Einar Skulason. End Notes, 1. The period is from A.D. 1157 to 1161. L. 1. Beginning of Hakan Hurtabrade. Hakan, King Sigurd's son, was chosen chief of the troop which had followed King Eistian, and his adherents gave him the title of king. He was ten years old. At that time he had with him Sigurd, a son of Halvard Hald of Rare, and Andreas and Anand, the sons of Simon, his foster brothers, and many chiefs friends of King Sigurd and King Eistian, and they went first up to Gotland. King Inga took possession of all the estates they had left behind, and declared them banished. Thereafter King Inga went to Viken, and was sometimes also in the north of the country. Gregorius Dagson was in Conungahela, where the danger was greatest, and had beside him a strong and handsome body of men, with which he defended the country. 2. Of Gregorius Dagson the summer after, A.D. 1158, Hakan came with his men, and proceeded to Conungahela with a numerous and handsome troop. Gregorius was then in the town, and summoned the bonds and townspeople to a great thing, at which he desired their aid. But he thought the people did not hear him with much favor, so he did not much trust them. Gregorius set off with two ships to Viken, and was very much cast down. He expected to meet King Inga there, having heard he was coming with a great army to Viken. Now when Gregorius had come but a short way north he met Simon Scalp, Halder Brynjolfsson, and Gyrd Amundsen, King Inga's foster brothers. Gregorius was much delighted at this meeting, and turned back with them, being all in one body, with eleven ships. As they were rowing up to Conungahela, Hakan, with his followers, was holding a thing without the town, and saw their approach. And Sigurd of Rare said, Gregorius must be fey to be throwing himself with so few men into our hands. 
Gregorius landed opposite the town to wait for King Inga, for he was expected, but he did not come. King Hakon put himself in order in the town, and appointed Thorley at Skafaskal, who was a viking and a robber, to be captain of the men in the merchant ships that were afloat in the river. And King Hakon and Sigurd were within the town, and drew up the men on the piers, for all the townspeople had submitted to King Hakon. 3. King Hakon's Flight Gregorius rode up the river, and let the ship drive down with the stream against Thorliot. They shot at each other a while, until Thorliot and his comrades jumped overboard, and some of them were killed, some escaped to the land. Then Gregorius rode to the piers, and let a gangway be cast on shore at the very feet of Hakon's men. There the man who carried his banner was slain, just as he was going to step on shore. Gregorius ordered Hal, a son of Auden Hal's son, to take up the banner, which he did, and bore the banner up to the pier. Gregorius followed close after him, held his shield over his head, and protected him as well as himself. As soon as Gregorius came upon the pier, and Hakon's men knew him, they gave way, and made room for him on every side. Afterwards more people landed from the ships, and then Gregorius made a severe assault with his men. And Hakon's men first moved back, and then ran up into the town. Gregorius pursued them eagerly, drove them twice from the town, and killed many of them. By the report of all men, never was there so glorious an affair as this of Gregorius. For Hakon had more than four thousand men, and Gregorius not full four hundred. After the battle, Gregorius said to Hal Adunson, Many men, in my opinion, are more agile in battle than ye Icelanders are, for ye are not so exercised as we Norwegians. But none, I think, are so bold under arms as ye are. King Inga came up soon after, and killed many of the men who had taken part with Hakon. Made some pay heavy fines, burnt the houses of some, and some he drove out of the country, or treated otherwise very ill. Hakon fled at first up to Gotland with all his men, but the winter after, A.D. 1159, he proceeded by the upper road to Thrandjum, and came there before Easter. The Thrandjum people received him well, for they had always served under that shield. It is said that the Thrandjum people took Hakon as king, on the terms that he should have from Inga the third part of Norway as his paternal heritage. King Inga and Gregorius were in Viking, and Gregorius wanted to make an expedition against the party in the north, but it came to nothing that winter, as many dissuaded from it. 4. Fall of Gyrd and Havard King Hakon left Thrandjum in spring with thirty ships nearly, and some of his men sailed before the rest with seven ships, and plundered in North and South Moor. No man could remember that there ever before had been plundering between the two towns, Bergen and Nidaros. John the son of Hockelhook collected the bonds in arms, and proceeded against them. Took Colby and Ode prisoner, killed every woman son of them in his ship. Then they searched for the others, found them all assembled in seven ships, and fought with them. But his father Hockel not coming to his assistance as he had promised, many good bonds were killed, and John himself was wounded. Hakon proceeded south to Bergen with his forces. But when he came to Styronvelta, he heard that King Inga and Gregorius had arrived a few nights before from the east at Bergen, and therefore he did not venture to steer thither. They sailed the outer course southwards past Bergen, and met three ships of King Inga's fleet, which had been outsailed on the voyage from the east. On board of them were Gyrd Amundsen, King Inga's foster brother, who was married to Gyrid a sister of Gregorius, and also Lagman Gyrd Gunhildsen, and Havard Kleining. King Hakon had Gyrd Amundsen and Havard Kleining put to death. But took Lagman Gyrd southwards, and then proceeded east to Viken. 5. Of the Consultations of King Inga When King Inga heard of this he sailed east after them, and they met east in the Got River. King Inga went up the north arm of the river, and sent out spies to get news of Hakon and his fleet, but he himself landed at Heising, and waited for his spies. Now when the spies came back they went to the king, and said that they had seen King Hakon's forces, and all his ships which lay at the stakes in the river, and Hakon's men had bound the stems of their vessels to them. They had two great east country trading vessels, which they had laid outside of the fleet, and on both these were built high wooded stages, castles. 
When King Inga heard the preparations they had made, he ordered a trumpet to call a house thing of all the men. And when the thing was seated he asked his men for counsel, and applied particularly to Gregorius Dagson, his brother-in-law Erling Skak, and other lendermen and ship commanders, to whom he related the preparations of Hakon and his men. Then Gregorius Dagson replied first, and made known his mind in the following words, Sometimes we and Hakon have met, and generally they had the most people, but, notwithstanding, they fell short in battle against us. Now, on the other hand, we have by far the greatest force. And it will appear probable to the men who a short time ago lost gallant relations by them, that this will be a good occasion to get vengeance, for they have fled before us the greater part of the summer. And we have often said that if they waited for us, as appears now to be the case, we would have a brush with them. Now I will tell my opinion, which is, that I will engage them, if it be agreeable to the king's pleasure. For I think it will go now as formerly, that they must give way before us if we attack them bravely, and I shall always attack where others may think it most difficult. The speech was received with much applause, and all declared they were ready to engage in battle against Hakon. Then they rode with all the ships up the river, until they came in sight of each other, and then King Inga turned off from the river current under the island. Now the king addressed the lendermen again, and told them to get ready for battle. He turned himself especially to Erling Skak, and said, what was true, that no man in the army had more understanding and knowledge in fighting battles, although some were more hot. The king then addressed himself to several of the lendermen, speaking to them by name, and ended by desiring that each man should make his attack where he thought it would be of advantage, and thereafter all would act together. 6. Erling's Speech Erling Skak replied thus to the king's speech, It is my duty, sire, not to be silent, and I shall give my advice, since it is desired. The resolution now adopted is contrary to my judgment. For I call it foolhardy to fight under these circumstances, although we have so many and such fine men. Supposing we make an attack on them, and row up against this river current. Then one of the three men who are in each half-room must be employed in rowing only, and another must be covering with the shield the man who rows, and what have we then to fight with but one-third of our men? It appears to me that they can be of little use in the battle who are sitting at their oars with their backs turned to the enemy. Give me now some time for consideration, and I promise you that before three days are over I shall fall upon some plan by which we can come into battle with advantage. It was evident from Erling's speech that he dissuaded from an attack. But, notwithstanding, it was urged by many who thought that Hakon would now, as before, take to the land. And then, said they, we cannot get hold of him, but now they have but few men, and we have their fate in our own hands. Gregorius said but little, but thought that Erling rather dissuaded from an attack that Gregorius's advice should have no effect, than that he had any better advice to give. 7. Of Hakon's Fleet Then said King Inga to Erling, Now we will follow thy advice, brother, with regard to the manner of attacking, but seeing how eager our counsellors are for it, we shall make the attack this day. Erling replied, All the boats and light vessels we have should row outside the island, and up the east arm of the river, and then down with the stream upon them, and try if they cannot cut them loose from the piles. Then we, with the large ships, shall row from below here against them, and I cannot tell until it be tried, if those who are now so furiously warm will be much brisker at the attack than I am. This counsel was approved by all. There was a nest stretched out between their fleet and Hakon's, so that they could not see each other. Now when Hakon and his men, who had taken counsel with each other in a meeting, saw the boat squadron rowing down the river, some thought King Inga intended to give them battle. But many believed they did not dare, for it looked as if the attack was given up, and they, besides, were very confident, both in their preparations and men. There were many great people with Hakon, there were Sigurd of Rare, and Simon's sons. Nicholas Skjaldvarsson, Eindride, a son of John Morneff, who was the most gallant and popular man in the Thrandjum country, and many other lendermen and warriors. Now when they saw that King Inga's men with many ships were rowing out of the river, Hakon and his men believed they were going to fly. 
and therefore they cut their land ropes with which they lay fast at the piles, seized their oars, and rowed after them in pursuit. The ships ran fast down with the stream. But when they came further down the river, abreast of the Ness, they saw King Inga's main strength lying quiet at the island Hysing. King Inga's people saw Hakon's ships underway, and believed they were coming to attack them. And now there was great bustle and clash of arms, and they encouraged each other by a great war shout. Hakon with his fleet turned northwards a little to the land, where there was a turn in the bight of the river, and where there was no current. They made ready for battle, carried land ropes to the shore, turned the stems of their ships outwards, and bound them all together. They laid the large east country traders without the other vessels, the one above, the other below, and bound them to the long ships. In the middle of the fleet lay the king's ship, and next to it Sigurds. And on the other side of the king's ship lay Nicholas, and next to him Endride Johnson. All the smaller ships lay farther off, and they were all nearly loaded with weapons and stones. 8. Sigurd of Rare's Speech Then Sigurd of Rare made the following speech, Now there is hope that the time is come which has been promised us all the summer, that we shall meet King Inga in battle. We have long prepared ourselves for this. And many of our comrades have boasted that they would never fly from or submit to King Inga and Gregorius, and now let them remember their words. But we who have sometimes got the toothache in our conflicts with them, speak less confidently. For it has happened, as all have heard, that we very often have come off without glory. But, nevertheless, it is now necessary to fight manfully, and stand to it with steadiness, for the only escape for us is in victory. Although we have somewhat fewer men than they, yet luck determines which side shall have the advantage, and God knows that the right is on our side. Inga has killed two of his brothers. And it is obvious to all men that the Mulkti intends to pay King Hakon for his father's murder is to murder him also, as well as his other relations, which will be seen this day to be his intent. King Hakon desired from the beginning no more of Norway than the third part, which his father had possessed, and which was denied him. And yet, in my opinion, King Hakon has a better right to inherit after his father's brother, King Eistian, than Inga or Simon Scalp, or the other men who killed King Eistian. Many of them who would save their souls, and yet have defiled their hands with such bloody deeds as Inga has done, must think it a presumption before God that he takes the name of king, and I wonder God suffers such monstrous wickedness as his. But it may be God's will that we shall now put him down. Let us fight then manfully, and God will give us victory, and, if we fall, will repay us with joys unspeakable for now allowing the might of the wicked to prevail over us. Go forth then in confidence, and be not afraid when the battle begins. Let each watch over his own and his comrade's safety, and God protect us all. There went a good report abroad of this speech of Sigurd, and all promised fairly, and to do their duty. King Hakon went on board of the great east country ship, and a shield bulwark was made around him. But his standard remained on the long ship in which it had been before. 9. Of King Inga's Men now must we tell about King Inga and his men. When they saw that King Hakon and his people were ready for battle, and the river only was between them, they sent a light vessel to recall the rest of the fleet which had rowed away. And in the meantime the king waited for them, and arranged the troops for the attack. Then the chiefs consulted in presence of the army, and told their opinions, first, which ships should lie nearest to the enemy, and then where each should attack. Gregorius spoke thus, We have many and fine men, and it is my advice, King Inga, that you do not go to the assault with us, for everything is preserved if you are safe. And no man knows where an arrow may hit, even from the hands of a bad bowman. And they have prepared themselves so, that missiles and stones can be thrown from the high stages upon the merchant ships, so that there is less danger for those who are farthest from them. They have not more men than we lender men can very well engage with. I shall lay my ship alongside their largest ship, and I expect the conflict between us will be but short. For it has often been so in our former meetings, although there has been a much greater want of men with us than now. All thought well of the advice that the king himself should not take part in the battle. Then Erling Skak said, I agree also to the counsel that you, 
sire, should not go into the battle. It appears to me that their preparations are such, that we require all our precaution not to suffer a great defeat from them. And whole limbs are the easiest cured. In the council we held before today many opposed what I said, and ye said then that I did not want to fight. But now I think the business has altered its appearance, and greatly to our advantage, since they have hauled off from the piles, and now it stands so that I do not dissuade from giving battle. For I see, what all are sensible of, how necessary it is to put an end to this robber band who have gone over the whole country with pillage and destruction, in order that people may cultivate the land in peace. And serve a king so good and just as King Inga who has long had trouble and anxiety from the haughty unquiet spirit of his relations, although he has been a shield of defense for the whole people. And has been exposed to manifold perils for the peace of the country. Erling spoke well and long, and many other chiefs also, and all to the same purpose, all urging to battle. In the meantime they waited until all the fleet should be assembled. King Inga had the ship Bikazudin. And, at the entreaty of his friends, he did not join the battle, but lay still at the island. 10. Beginning of the Battle When the army was ready they rode briskly against the enemy, and both sides raised a warshout. Inga's men did not bind their ships together, but let them be loose, for they rode right across the current, by which the large ships were much swayed. Erling Skak laid his ship beside King Hakon's ship, and ran the stem between his and Sigurd's ship, by which the battle began. But Gregorius's ship swung upon the ground, and heeled very much over, so that at first she could not come into the battle, and when Hakon's men saw this they laid themselves against her, and attacked Gregorius's ship on all sides. Ivar, Hakon Mage's son, laid his ship so that the stem struck together. And he got a boat hook fastened on Gregorius, on that part of his body where the waist is smallest, and dragged him to him, by which Gregorius stumbled against the ship's rails. But the hook slipped to one side, or Gregorius would have been dragged overboard. Gregorius, however, was but little wounded, for he had on a plate coat of armor. Ivar called out to him, that he had a thick bark. Gregorius replied, that if Ivar went on so he would require it all, and not have too much. It was very near then that Gregorius and his men had sprung overboard, but a slack unge threw an anchor into their ship, and dragged them off the ground. Then Gregorius laid himself against Ivar's ship, and they fought a long while, but Gregorius's ship being both higher-sided and more strongly manned, many people fell in Ivar's ship, and some jumped overboard. Ivar was so severely wounded that he could not take part in the fight. When his ship was cleared of the men, Gregorius let Ivar be carried to the shore, so that he might escape and from that time they were constant friends. 11. King Hakon's Flight When King Inga and his men saw that Gregorius was aground, he encouraged his crew to row to his assistance. It was, he said, the most imprudent advice that we should remain lying here, while our friends are in battle. For we have the largest and best ship in all the fleet. But now I see that Gregorius, the man to whom I owe the most, is in need of help so we must hasten to the fight where it is sharpest. It is also most proper that I should be in the battle. For the victory, if we win it, will belong to me. And if I even knew beforehand that our men were not to gain the battle, yet our place is where our friends are. For I can do nothing if I lose the men who are justly called the defense of the country, who are the bravest, and have long ruled for me and my kingdom. Thereupon he ordered his banner to be set up, which was done, and they rode across the river. Then the battle raged, and the king could not get room to attack, so close lay the ships before him. First he lay under the east country trading ship, and from it they threw down upon his vessel spears, iron-shod stakes, and such large stones that it was impossible to hold out longer there, and he had to haul off. Now when the king's people saw that he was come they made place for him, and then he laid alongside of Eindried Johnson's ship. Now King Hakon's men abandoned the small ships, and went on board the large merchant vessels. But some of them sprang on shore. Erling Skak and his men had a severe conflict. Erling himself was on the forecastle, and called his forecastlemen, and ordered them to board the king's ship. But they answered, this was no easy matter, for there were beams above with an iron comb on them. 
Then Erling himself went to the bow, and stayed there a while, until they succeeded in getting on board the king's ship, and then the ship was cleared of men on the bows, and the whole army gave way. Many sprang into the water, many fell, but the greater number got to the land. So says Einar Skulison. Men fall upon the slippery deck. Men roll off from the blood-drenched wreck. Dead bodies float down with the stream. And from the shores which ravens scream. The cold blue river now runs red. With the warm blood of warriors dead. And stains the waves in carmed sound. With the last drops of the death wound. All down the stream, with unmanned prow. Floats many an empty longship now. Ship after ship, shout after shout. Tell that King Hacken can't hold out. The bowmen ply their bows of elm. The red swords flash o'er broken helm. King Hacken's men rush to the strand. Out of their ships, up through the land. Einar composed a song about Gregorius Dagson, which is called the River Song. King Inga granted life and peace to Nicholas Skjaldvarsson when his ship was deserted, and thereupon he went into King Inga's service, and remained in it as long as the king lived. Eindride Johnson leaped on board of King Inga's ship when his own was cleared of men, and begged for his life. King Inga wished to grant it, but Havard Kleining's son ran up, and gave him a mortal wound, which was much blamed. But he said Eindride had been the cause of his father's death. There was much lamentation at Eindride's death, but principally in the Throngem district. Many of Hakon's people fell here, but not many chiefs. Few of King Inga's people fell, but many were wounded. King Hakon fled up the country, and King Inga went north to Viken with his troops, and he, as well as Gregorius, remained in Viken all winter, A.D. 1160. When King Inga's men, Bergliot and his brothers, sons of Ivar of Elda, came from the battle to Bergen, they slew Nicholas Skegg, who had been Hakon's treasurer, and then went north to Throngem. King Hakon came north before Yule, and Sigurd was sometimes home at Rare, for Gregorius, who was nearly related to Sigurd, had obtained for him life and safety from King Inga, so that he retained all his estates. King Hakon was in the merchant town of Nidaros in Yule, and one evening in the beginning of Yule his men fought in the room of the court, and in this affray eight men were killed, and many were wounded. The eighth day of Yule, King Hakon's man Alf Rode, son of Otter Birding, with about eighty men, went to Elda, and came in the night unexpectedly on the people, who were very drunk, and set fire to the room. But they went out, and defended themselves bravely. There fell Bergliot, Ivor's son, and Ogmund, his brother, and many more. They had been nearly thirty altogether in number. In winter died, north in the merchant town, Andre Simonson, King Hakon's foster brother, and his death was much deplored. Erling Skak and Inga's men, who were in Bergen, threatened that in winter they would proceed against Hakon and his men. But it came to nothing. Gregorius sent word from the east, from Conungahela, that if he were so near as Erling and his men, he would not sit quietly in Bergen while Hakon was killing King Inga's friends and their comrades in war north in the Throngem country. 12. The Conflict Upon the Piers King Inga and Gregorius left the east in spring, and came to Bergen, but as soon as Hakon and Sigurd heard that Inga had left Viken, they went there by land. When King Inga and his people came to Bergen, a quarrel arose between Halder Brynjolfsson and Bjorn Nikolaisen. Bjorn's houseman asked Halders when they met at the pier, why he looked so pale. He replied, because he had been bled. I could not look so pale if I tried, at merely being bled. I again think, retorted the other, that thou wouldst have borne it worse, and less manfully. And no other beginning was there for their quarrel than this. Afterwards one word followed another, till from brawling they came to fighting. It was told to Halder Brynjolfsson, who was in the house drinking, that his houseman was wounded down on the pier and he went there immediately. But Bjorn's houseman had come there before, and as Halder thought his houseman had been badly treated, he went up to them and beat them and it was told to Bjorn Buk that the people of Viken were beating his housemen on the pier. Then Bjorn and his housemen took their weapons, hurried down to the pier, and would avenge their men, and a bloody strife began. 
It was told Gregorius that his relation Halder required assistance, and that his housemen were being cut down in the street, on which Gregorius and his men ran to the place in their armor. Now it was told Erling Skak that his sister's son Bjorn was fighting with Gregorius and Halder down on the piers, and that he needed help. Then he proceeded thither with a great force, and exhorted the people to stand by him. Saying it would be a great disgrace never to be wiped out, if the Viking people should trample upon them in their own native place. There fell thirteen men, of whom nine were killed on the spot, and four died of their wounds, and many were wounded. When the word came to King Inga that Gregorius and Erling were fighting down on the piers, he hastened there, and tried to separate them, but could do nothing, so mad were they on both sides. Then Gregorius called to Inga, and told him to go away. For it was in vain to attempt coming between them, as matters now stood. He said it would be the greatest misfortune if the king mixed himself up with it. For he could not be certain that there were not people in the fray who would commit some great misdeed if they had opportunity. Then King Inga retired. And when the greatest tumult was over, Gregorius and his men went to Nicholas Church, and Erling behind them, calling to each other. Then King Inga came a second time, and pacified them, and both agreed that he should mediate between them. When King Inga and Gregorius heard that King Hakon was in Viken, they went east with many ships, but when they came King Hakon fled from them, and there was no battle. Then King Inga went to Oslo, and Gregorius was in Konungahela. 13. Munin's Death Soon after Gregorius heard that Hakon and his men were at a farm called Sorbi, which lies up beside the forest. Gregorius hastened there, came in the night. And supposing that King Hakon and Sigurd would be in the largest of the houses, set fire to the buildings there. But Hakon and his men were in the smaller house, and came forth, seeing the fire, to help their people. Their Munin fell, a son of Aeol Askend, a brother of King Sigurd Hakon's father. Gregorius and his men killed him, because he was helping those whom they were burning within the house. Some escaped, but many were killed. Asbjorn Jalda, who had been a very great Viking, escaped from the house, but was grievously wounded. A bond met him, and he offered the man money to let him get away, but the bond replied, he would do what he liked best. And, adding that he had often been in fear of his life for him, he slew him. King Hakon and Sigurd escaped, but many of their people were killed. Thereafter Gregorius returned home to Konungahela. Soon after King Hakon and Sigurd went to Halder Brynjolfsson's farm of Vetteland, set fire to the house, and burnt it. Halder went out, and was cut down instantly with his housemen, and in all there were about twenty men killed. Sigurd, Halder's wife, was a sister of Gregorius, and they allowed her to escape into the forest in her night shift only. But they took with them Amund, who was a son of Gyrd Amundison and of Gyrid Dag's daughter, and a sister's son of Gregorius, and who was then a boy about five years old. 14. Of the Fall of Gregorius Dagson When Gregorius heard the news he took it much to heart, and inquired carefully where they were. Gregorius set out from Conungahela late in Yule, and came to Furs the thirteenth day of Yule, where he remained a night, and heard Vespers the last day of Yule, which was a Saturday, and the Holy Evangel was read before him. When Gregorius and his followers saw the men of King Hakon and Sigurd, the king's force appeared to them smaller than their own. There was a river called Bifia between them, where they met. And there was unsound ice on the river, for there went a stream under the ice from it. King Hakon and his men had cut a rent in the ice, and laid snow over it, so that nobody could see it. When Gregorius came to the ice on the river the ice appeared to him unsound, he said, and he advised the people to go to the bridge, which was close by, to cross the river. The Bond troops replied, that they did not know why he should be afraid to go across the ice to attack so few people as Hakon had, and the ice was good enough. Gregorius said it was seldom necessary to encourage him to show bravery, and it should not be so now. Then he ordered them to follow him, and not to be standing on the land while he was on the ice, and he said it was their counsel to go out upon the dangerous ice, but he had no wish to do so, or to be led by them. Then he ordered the banner to be advanced, and immediately went out on the ice with the men. 
As soon as the bonds found that the ice was unsound they turned back. Gregorius fell through the ice, but not very deep, and he told his men to take care. There were not more than twenty men with him, the others having turned back. A man of King Hakon's troop shot an arrow at Gregorius, which hit him under the throat, and thus ended his life. Gregorius fell, and ten men with him. It is the talk of all men that he had been the most gallant lenderman in Norway that any man then living could remember, and also he behaved the best towards us Icelanders of any chief since King Eistian the Elder's death. Gregorius's body was carried to Hofund, and interred at Gimsi Isle, in a nunnery which is there, of which Gregorius's sister, Bogiad, was then the abbess. 15. King Inga Hears of Gregorius's Fall Two bailiffs went to Oslo to bring the tidings to King Inga. When they arrived they desired to speak to the king, and he asked, what news they brought. Gregorius Dagson's death, said they. How came that misfortune, asked the king. When they had told him how it happened, he said, they gave advice who understood the least. It is said he took it so much to heart that he cried like a child. When he recovered himself he said, I wanted to go to Gregorius as soon as I heard of Halder's murder, for I thought that Gregorius would not sit long before thinking of revenge. But the people here would think nothing so important as their Yule feasts, and nothing could move them away. And I am confident that if I had been there, he would either have proceeded more cautiously, or I and Gregorius would now have shared one lodging. Now he is gone, the man who has been my best friend, and more than any other has kept the kingdom in my hands and I think it will be but a short space between us. Now I make an oath to go forth against Hakon, and one of two things shall happen, I shall either come to my death, or shall walk over Hakon and his people. And such a man as Gregorius is not avenged, even if all were to pay the penalty of their lives for him. There was a man present who replied, Ye need not seek after them, for they intend to seek you. Kristen, King Sigurd's daughter and King Inga's cousin, was then in Oslo. The king heard that she intended going away. He sent a message to her to inquire why she wished to leave the town. She thought it was dangerous and unsafe for a female to be there. The king would not let her go. For if it go well with me, as I hope, you will be well here, and if I fall, my friends may not get leave to dress my body. But you can ask permission, and it will not be denied you, and you will thereby best requite what I have done for you. 16. Of King Inga On St. Blasius Day, February 3, 1161, in the evening, King Inga's spies brought him the news that King Hakon was coming towards the town. Then King Inga ordered the warhorns to call together all the troops up from the town. And when he drew them up he could reckon them to be nearly four thousand men. The king let the array be long, but not more than five men deep. Then some said that the king should not be himself in the battle, as they thought the risk too great. But that his brother Orm should be the leader of the army. The king replied, I think if Gregorius were alive and here now, and I had fallen and was to be avenged, he would not lie concealed, but would be in the battle. Now, although I, on account of my ill health, am not fit for the combat as he was, yet will I show as good will as he would have had and it is not to be thought of that I should not be in the battle. People say that Gunhild, who was married to Simon, King Hakon's foster brother, had a witch employed to sit out all night and procure the victory for Hakon. And that the answer was obtained, that they should fight King Inga by night, and never by day, and then the result would be favorable. The witch who, as people say, sat out was called Thorda Skegia. But what truth there may be in the report I know not. Simon's scalp had gone to the town, and was gone to sleep, when the war shouts awoke him. When the night was well advanced, King Inga's spies came to him, and told him that King Hakon and his army were coming over the ice, for the ice lay the whole way from the town to Hofad Isle. 17. King Inga's Speech Thereupon King Inga went with his army out on the ice, and he drew it up in order of battle in front of the town. Simon's scalp was in that wing of the array which was towards Thraloburg. And on the other wing, which was towards the nunnery, was Gudrod, the king of the South Hibudes, a son of Olaf Kleining, and John, a son of Sven Bergthor Buk. 
When King Hakon and his army came near to King Inga's array, both sides raised a war shout. Gudrod and John gave King Hakon and his men a sign, and let them know where they were in the line, and as soon as Hakon's men in consequence turned thither, Gudrod immediately fled with one thousand five hundred men. And John, and a great body of men with him, ran over to King Hakon's army, and assisted them in the fight. When this news was told to King Inga, he said, such is the difference between my friends. Never would Gregorius have done so in his life. There were some who advised King Inga to get on horseback, and ride from the battle up to Romerike, where, said they, you would get help enough, even this very day. The king replied, he had no inclination to do so. I have heard you often say, and I think truly, that it was of little use to my brother, King Eistian, that he took to flight, and yet he was a man distinguished for many qualities which adorn a king. Now I, who labor under so great decrepitude, can see how bad my fate would be, if I betook myself to what proved so unfortunate for him, with so great a difference as there is between our activity, health, and strength. I was in the second year of my age when I was chosen king of Norway, and I am now twenty-five, and I think I have had misfortune and sorrow under my kingly dignity, rather than pleasure and peaceful days. I have had many battles, sometimes with more, sometimes with fewer people, and it is my greatest luck that I have never fled. God will dispose of my life, and of how long it shall be, but I shall never betake myself to flight. 18. King Inga's Fall now as John and his troop had broken the one wing of King Inga's array, many of those who were nearest to him fled, by which the whole array was dispersed, and fell into disorder. But Hakon and his men went briskly forwards. And now it was near daybreak. An assault was made against King Inga's banner, and in this conflict King Inga fell, but his brother Orm continued the battle, while many of the army fled up into the town. Twice Orm went to the town after the king's fall to encourage the people, and both times returned, and went out again upon the ice to continue the battle. Hakon's men attacked the wing of the array which Simon Scalp led. And in that assault fell of King Inga's men his brother-in-law, Gudbrand Skafhoxen. Simon Scalp and Halvard Hiker went against each other with their troops, and fought while they drew aside past Threleberg. And in this conflict both Simon and Halvard fell. Orm, the king's brother, gained great reputation in this battle, but he at last fled. Orm the winter before had been contracted with Ragna, a daughter of Nicholas Mays, who had been married before to King Eistian Haraldson, and the wedding was fixed for the Sunday after St. Blasius's Mass, which was on a Friday. Orm fled east to Svithjad, where his brother Magnus was then king, and their brother Ragnvald was an earl there at that time. They were the sons of Queen Ingerid and Henrik Halt, who was a son of the Danish king Sven Sveinsson. The princess Kristin took care of King Inga's body, which was laid on the stone wall of Halvard's church, on the south side without the choir. He had then been king for twenty-three years, A.D. 1137-1161. In this battle many fell on both sides, but principally of King Inga's men. Of King Hakon's people fell Arn Fryrkson. Hakon's men took all the feast and victuals prepared for the wedding, and a great booty besides. 19. Of King Hakon and Queen Kristin. Then King Hakon took possession of the whole country, and distributed all the offices among his own friends, both in the towns and in the country. King Hakon and his men had a meeting in Halvard's church, where they had a private conference concerning the management of the country. Kristen the princess gave the priest who kept the church keys a large sum of money to conceal one of her men in the church, so that she might know what Hakon and his counselors intended. When she learned what they had said, she sent a man to Bergen to her husband Erling Skak, with the message that he should never trust Hakon or his men. 20. Of Olaf's Miracle It happened at the Battle of Stikelstad, as before related, that King Olaf threw from him the sword called Nieder when he received his wound. A Swedish man, who had broken his own sword, took it up, and fought with it. When this man escaped with the other fugitives he came to Svithjad, and went home to his house. From that time he kept the sword all his days, and afterwards his son, and so relation after relation. And when the sword shifted its owner, 
the one told to the other the name of the sword and where it came from. A long time after, in the days of Kerjalax the emperor of Constantinople, when there was a great body of Varynx in the town, it happened in the summer that the emperor was on a campaign, and lay in the camp with his army. The Varynx who had the guard, and watched over the emperor, lay on the open plain without the camp. They changed the watch with each other in the night, and those who had been before on watch lay down and slept, but all completely armed. It was their custom, when they went to sleep, that each should have his helmet on his head, his shield over him, sword under the head, and the right hand on the sword handle. One of these comrades, whose lot it was to watch the latter part of the night, found, on awakening towards morning, that his sword was gone. He looked after it, and saw it lying on the flat plain at a distance from him. He got up and took the sword, thinking that his comrades who had been on watch had taken the sword from him in a joke, but they all denied it. The same thing happened three nights. Then he wondered at it, as well as they who saw or heard of it. And people began to ask him how it could have happened. He said that his sword was called Meter, and had belonged to King Olaf the Saint, who had himself carried it in the Battle of Stikelstad. And he also related how the sword since that time had gone from one to another. This was told to the emperor, who called the man before him to whom the sword belonged, and gave him three times as much gold as the sword was worth. And the sword itself he had laid in St. Olaf's church, which the Vering supported, where it has been ever since over the altar. There was a lenderman of Norway while Harald Giel's sons, Eistian, Inga, and Sigurd lived, who was called Eindreid Unge, and he was in Constantinople when these events took place. He told these circumstances in Norway, according to what Einar Skullason says in his song about King Olaf the Saint, in which these events are sung. 21. Olaf's Miracle in Favor of the Varings It happened once in the Greek country, when Kerjalax was emperor there, that he made an expedition against Blokamaniland. When he came to the Pezina Plains, a heathen king came against him with an innumerable host. He brought with him many horsemen, and many large wagons, in which were large loopholes for shooting through. When they prepared for their night quarters they drew up their wagons, one by the side of the other, without their tents, and dug a great ditch without, and all which made a defense as strong as a castle. The heathen king was blind. Now when the Greek king came, the heathens drew up their array on the plains before their wagon fortification. The Greeks drew up their array opposite, and they rode on both sides to fight with each other. But it went on so ill and so unfortunately, that the Greeks were compelled to fly after suffering a great defeat, and the heathens gained a victory. Then the king drew up an array of Franks and Flemings, who rode against the heathens, and fought with them, but it went with them as with the others, that many were killed, and all who escaped took to flight. Then the Greek king was greatly incensed at his men at arms, and they replied, that he should now take his wine bags, the Varings. The king says that he would not throw away his jewels, and allow so few men, however bold they might be, to attack so vast an army. Then Thor Helsefig, who at that time was leader of the Varings, replied to the king's words, If there was burning fire in the way, I and my people would run into it, if I knew the king's advantage required it. Then the king replied, Call upon your holy king Olaf for help and strength. The Varings, who were four hundred and fifty men, made a vow with hand and word to build a church in Constantinople, at their own expense and with the aid of other good men, and have the church consecrated to the honor and glory of the holy king Olaf. And thereupon the Varings rushed into the plain. When the heathens saw them, they told their king that there was another troop of the Greek king's army come out upon the plain, but they were only a handful of people. The king says, Who is that venerable man riding on a white horse at the head of the troop? They replied, We do not see him. There was so great a difference of numbers, that there were sixty heathens for every Christian man. But notwithstanding the Varings went boldly to the attack. As soon as they met terror and alarm seized the army of the heathens, and they instantly began to fly, but the Varings pursued, and soon killed a great number of them. When the Greeks and Franks who before had fled from the heathens saw this, they hastened to take part, and pursue the enemy with the others. Then the Varings had reached the wagon fortification, where the greatest defeat was given to the enemy. 
The heathen king was taken in the flight of his people, and the Varings brought him along with them, after which the Christians took the camp of the heathens, and their wagon fortification. Magnus Erlingsson's Saga Preliminary Remarks With this saga, which describes a series of conflicts, Snor's Heimskringla ends. King Eistian died in 1177, but Magnus Erlingsson continued to reign until his death in 1184. The conflicts continued until the opposition party was led to victory by King Svera. The only skald quoted is Thorbjorn Skakaskald. 1. Of Magnus Erlingsson's Beginning When Erling got certain intelligence of the determinations of Hakon and his counselors, he sent a message to all the chiefs who he knew had been steady friends of King Inga, and also to his court men and his retinue, who had saved themselves by flight, and also to all Gregorius's housemen, and called them together to a meeting. When they met and conversed with each other, they resolved to keep their men together, and which resolution they confirmed by oath and handshake to each other. Then they considered whom they should take to be king. Erling Skak first spoke, and inquired if it was the opinion of the chiefs and other men of power that Simon Scalp's son, the son of the daughter of King Harold Giel, should be chosen king, and John Hockelson be taken to lead the army. But John refused it. Then it was inquired if Nicholas Skjeldvarsson, a sister's son of King Magnus Barefoot, would place himself at the head of the army. But he answered thus, it was his opinion that someone should be chosen king who was of the royal race, and, for leader of the troops, someone from whom help and understanding were to be looked for, and then it would be easier to gather an army. It was now tried whether Arne would let any of his sons, King Inga's brothers, be proclaimed king. Arne replies, that Kristen's son, she was the daughter of King Sigurd the Crusader, was nearest by propinquity of descent to the crown of Norway. And here is also a man to be his adviser, and whose duty it is to take care of him and of the kingdom, and that man is his father Erling, who is both prudent, brave, experienced in war, and an able man in governing the kingdom. He wants no capability of bringing this counsel into effect, if luck be with him. Many thought well of this advice. Erling replied to it, As far as I can see or hear in this meeting, the most will rather be excused from taking upon themselves such a difficult business. Now it appears to me altogether uncertain, provided we begin this work, whether he who puts himself at the head of it will gain any honor. Or whether matters will go as they have done before when any one undertakes such great things, that he loses all his property and possibly his life. But if this counsel be adopted, there may be men who will undertake to carry it through. But he who comes under such an obligation must seek, in every way, to prevent any opposition or enmity from those who are now in this council. All gave assurance that they would enter into this confederacy with perfect fidelity. Then said Erling, I can say for myself that it would almost be my death to serve King Hakon. And however dangerous it may be, I will rather venture to adopt your advice, and take upon me to lead this force, if that be the will, counsel, and desire of you all, and if you will all bind yourselves to this agreement by oath. To this they all agreed, and in this meeting it was determined to take Erling's son Magnus to be king. They afterwards held a thing in the town, and at this thing Magnus Erlingsson, then five years old, was elected king of the whole country. All who had been servants of King Inga went into his service, and each of them retained the office and dignity he had held under King Inga, AD 1161. 2. King Magnus goes to Denmark. Erling Skak made himself ready to travel, fitted out ships, and had with him King Magnus, together with the household men who were on the spot. In this expedition were the king's relatives, Arne, Ingerid, King Inga's mother, with her two sons. Besides John Katiza, a son of Sigurd Stork, and Erling's housemen, as well as those who had been Gregorius's housemen, and they had in all ten ships. They went south to Denmark to King Valdemar and Bereis Heinrexen, King Inga's brother. King Valdemar was King Magnus' blood relation, for Ingebjorg, mother of King Valdemar, and Malmfred, mother of Kristen, King Magnus' mother, were cousins. The Danish king received them hospitably, and he and Erling had private meetings and consultations, and so much was known of their counsels. 
that King Valdemar was to aid King Magnus with such help as might be required from his kingdom to win and retain Norway. On the other hand, King Valdemar should get that domain in Norway which his ancestors Harald Gormson and Sven Forkbeard had possessed, namely, the whole of Viking as far north as Regiarbit. This agreement was confirmed by oath and a fixed treaty. Then Erling and King Magnus made themselves ready to leave Denmark, and they sailed out of Vendelskage. 3. Battle of Tunsberg King Hakon went in spring, after the Easter week, north to Thrandjum, and had with him the whole fleet that had belonged to King Inga. He held a thing there in the merchant town, and was chosen king of the whole country. Then he made Sigurd of Rare an earl, and gave him an earldom, and afterwards proceeded southwards with his followers all the way to Viking. The king went to Tunsberg. But sent Earl Sigurd east to Konungahela, to defend the country with a part of the forces in case Erling should come from the south. Erling and his fleet came to Agder, and went straight north to Bergen, where they killed Arn Brigderskal, King Hakon's officer, and came back immediately against King Hakon. Earl Sigurd, who had not observed the journey of Erling and his followers from the south, was at that time east in the Gott River, and King Hakon was in Tunsberg. Erling brought up at Hrossanes, and lay there some nights. In the meantime King Hakon made preparations in the town. When Erling and his fleet were coming up to the town, they took a merchant vessel, filled it with wood and straw, and set fire to it. And the wind blowing right towards the town, drove the vessel against the piers. Erling had two cables brought on board the vessel, and made fast to two boats, and made them row along as the vessel drove. Now when the fire was come almost abreast of the town, those who were in the boats held back the vessel by the ropes, so that the town could not be set on fire. But so thick a smoke spread from it over the town, that one could not see from the piers where the king's array was. Then Erling drew the whole fleet in where the wind carried the fire, and shot at the enemy. When the townspeople saw that the fire was approaching their houses, and many were wounded by the bowmen, they resolved to send the priest rolled, the long-winded speaker, to Erling, to beg him to spare them and the town. And they dissolved the array in favor of Hakon, as soon as Rold told them their prayer was granted. Now when the array of townspeople had dispersed, the men on the piers were much thinned, however, some urged Hakon's men to make resistance, but Anne and Simonson, who had most influence over the army, said. I will not fight for Earl Sigurd's earldom, since he is not here himself. Then Anon fled, and was followed by all the people, and by the king himself, and they hastened up the country. King Hakon lost many men here. And these verses were made about it. Anon declares he will not go. In battle, gainst Earl Sigurd's foe. If Earl Sigurd does not come. But with his housemen sits at home. King Magnus' men rush up the street. Eager with Hakon's troop to meet. But Hakon's war hawks, somewhat shy. Turn quick about, and off they fly. Thorbjorn Skakaskald also said. The Tunsberg men would not be slow. In thy good cause to risk a blow. And well they knew the chief could stain. The wolves' mouths on a battle plain. But the town champion rather fears. The sharp bright glance of leveled spears. Their steel clad warrior loves no fight. Where bowstring twangs, or fire flies bright. King Hakon then took the land road northwards to Thrandjum. When Earl Sigurd heard of this, he proceeded with all the ships he could get the seaway northwards, to meet King Hakon there. 4. Of Erling and Hakon. Erling Skak took all the ships in Tunsberg belonging to King Hakon, and there he also took the Bikazudden which had belonged to King Inga. Then Erling proceeded, and reduced the whole of Viking in obedience to King Magnus, and also the whole country north wheresoever he appeared up to Bergen, where he remained all winter. There Erling killed Ingebjorn Sippel, King Hakon's lenderman of the north part of the Fjord district. In winter, A.D. 1162, King Hakon was in Thrandjum, but in the following spring he ordered a levy, and prepared to go against Erling. He had with him Earl Sigurd, John Sveinsen, Eindreid Unge, Anand Simonsen, Philip Peterson, Philip Jurdson, Ragnvald Kunta, Sigurd Kappa, Sigurd Huppa, Freirek Kaina, Aspjorn of Forland, Thorbjorn, 
a son of Gunnar the treasurer, and Stradjarn. 5. Of Erling's people. Erling was in Bergen with a great armament, and resolved to lay a sailing prohibition on all the merchant vessels which were going north to Nidaros. For he knew that King Hakon would soon get tidings of him, if ships were sailing between the towns. Besides, he gave out that it was better for Bergen to get the goods, even if the owners were obliged to sell them cheaper than they wished than that they should fall into the hands of enemies and thereby strengthen them. And now a great many vessels were assembled at Bergen, for many arrived every day, and none were allowed to go away. Then Erling let some of the lightest of his vessels be laid ashore, and spread the report that he would wait for Hakon, and, with the help of his friends and relations, oppose the enemy there. He then one day called a meeting of the shipmasters, and gave them and all the merchant ships and their steersmen leave to go where they pleased. When the men who had charge of the cargoes, and were all ready to sail away with their goods, some for trade, others on various business, had got leave from Erling Skak to depart. There was a soft and favorable wind for sailing north along the coast. Before the evening all who were ready had set sail, and hastened on as fast as they could, according to the speed of their vessels, the one vying with the other. When this fleet came north to Moor, Hakon's fleet had arrived there before them, and he himself was there fully engaged in collecting people, and summoning to him the lendermen, and all liable to serve in the levy. Without having for a long time heard any news from Bergen. Now, however, they heard, as the latest news, that Erling Skak had laid his ships up in Bergen, and there they would find him, and also that he had a large force with him. King Hakon sailed from thence to V, and sent away Earl Sigurd and Anand Simonson to gather people, and sent men also to both the Moor districts. After King Hakon had remained a few days at the town he sailed farther, and proceeded to the south, thinking that it would both promote his journey and enable new levies to join him sooner. Erling Skak had given leave on Sunday to all the merchant vessels to leave Bergen. And on Tuesday, as soon as the early mass was over, he ordered the warhorns to sound, summoned to him the men-at-arms and the townsmen, and let the ships which were laid up on shore be drawn down into the water. Then Erling held a house thing with his men and the people of the levy, told them his intentions, named ship commanders, and had the names called over of the men who were to be on board of the king's ship. This thing ended with Erling's order to every man to make himself ready in his berth wherever a place was appointed him, and declared that he who remained in the town after the Bikazudden was hauled out, should be punished by loss of life or limb. O.R.M., the king's brother, laid his ships out in the harbour immediately that evening, and many others, and the greater number were afloat before. 6. Of Erling Skak on Wednesday, before mass was sung in the town, Erling sailed from Bergen with all his fleet, consisting of twenty-one ships, and there was a fresh breeze for sailing northwards along the coast. Erling had his son King Magnus with him, and there were many lendermen accompanied by the finest men. When Erling came north, abreast of the fjord district, he sent a boat on shore to John Hockelson's farm, and took Nicholas, a son of Simon Scalp and of Maria, Harold Giel's daughter and brought him out to the fleet. And put him on board the king's ship. On Friday, immediately after Madden's, they sailed to Steinevag, and King Hakon, with thirteen ships, was lying in the harbour in the neighbourhood. He himself and his men were up at play upon the island, and the lendermen were sitting on the hill, when they saw a boat rowing from the south with two men in it, who were bending back deep towards the keel, and taking hasty strokes with their oars. When they came to the shore they did not belay the boat, but both ran from it. The great men, seeing this, said to each other, These men must have some news to tell, and got up to meet them. When they met, Anand Simonson asked, Have ye any news of Erling Skak, that ye are running so fast? They answered, As soon as they could get out the words, for they had lost their breath, Here comes Erling against you, sailing from the south, with twenty-one ships, or thereabouts, of which many are great enough. And now ye will soon see their sails. Then said Eindride Unge, too near to the nose, said the peasant, when his eye was knocked out. They went in haste now to where the games were playing, and immediately the warhorns resounded, and with the battle call all the people were gathered down to the ships in the greatest haste. It was just the time of day when their meat was nearly cooked. 
all the men rushed to the ships, and each ran on board the vessel that was nearest to him, so that the ships were unequally manned. Some took to the oars. Some raised the masts, turned the heads of the vessels to the north, and steered for V, where they expected much assistance from the towns. 7. Fall of King Hakon. Soon after they saw the sails of Erling's fleet, and both fleets came in sight of each other. Eindreid Unge had a ship called Draglon, which was a large bus-like longship, but which had but a small crew. For those who belonged to her had run on board of other ships, and she was therefore the hindmost of Hakon's fleet. When Eindreid came abreast of the island Sek, the Bikazudden, which Erling Skak himself commanded, came up with her. And these two ships were bound fast together. King Hakon and his followers had arrived close to V, but when they heard the warhorn they turned again to assist Eindreid. Now they began the battle on both sides, as the vessels came up. Many of the sails lay midships across the vessels, and the ships were not made fast to each other, but they lay side by side. The conflict was not long before there came disorder in Hakon's ship, and some fell, and others sprang overboard. Hakon threw over him a grey cloak, and jumped on board another ship, but when he had been there a short time he thought he had got among his enemies, and when he looked about him he saw none of his men nor of his ships near him. Then he went into the Bikazudden to the forecastle men, and begged his life. They took him in their keeping, and gave him quarter. In this conflict there was a great loss of people, but principally of Hakon's men. In the Bikazudden fell Nicholas, Simon Scalp's son. And Erling's men are accused of having killed him themselves. Then there was a pause in the battle, and the vessels separated. It was now told to Erling that Hakon was on board of his ship. That the forecastle men had taken him, and threatened that they would defend him with arms. Erling sent men forwards in the ship to bring the forecastle men his orders to guard Hakon well, so that he should not get away. He at the same time let it be understood that he had no objection to giving the king life and safety, if the other chiefs were willing, and a peace could be established. All the forecastle men gave their chief great credit and honor for these words. Then Erling ordered anew a blast of the war horns, and that the ships should be attacked which had not lost their men. Saying that they would never have such another opportunity of avenging King Inga. Thereupon they all raised a war shout, encouraged each other, and rushed to the assault. In this tumult King Hakon received his death wound. When his men knew he had fallen they rode with all their might against the enemy, threw away their shields, slashed with both hands, and cared not for life. This heat and recklessness, however, proved soon a great loss to them. For Erling's men saw the unprotected parts of their bodies, and where their blows would have effect. The greater part of Hakon's men who remained fell here. And it was principally owing to the want of numbers, as they were not enough to defend themselves. They could not get quarter, also accepting those whom the chiefs took under their protection and bound themselves to pay ransom for. The following of Hakon's people fell, Sigurd Kappa, Sigurd Huppa, and Ragnvald Kunta, but some ships' crews got away, rowed into the fjords, and thus saved their lives. Hakon's body was carried to Romsdal, and buried there. But afterwards his brother, King Svera, had the body transported north to the merchant town Nidaros, and laid in the stone wall of Christ Church south of the choir. 8. Flight of the Chiefs of Hakon's Men Earl Sigurd, Eindreid Unge, Anand Simonson, Freirek Kaina, and other chiefs kept the troop together, left the ships in Romsdal, and went up to the uplands. King Magnus and his father Erling sailed with their troops north to Nidaros in Thrandjum, and subdued the country as they went along. Erling called together an era thing, at which King Magnus was proclaimed king of all Norway. Erling, however, remained there but a short time, for he thought the Thrandjum people were not well affected towards him and his son. King Magnus was then called king of the whole country. King Hakon had been a handsome man in appearance, well grown, tall and thin, but rather broad shouldered, on which account his men called him Hurtabraid. As he was young in years, his lender men ruled for him. He was cheerful and friendly in conversation, playful and youthful in his ways, and was much liked by the people. 9. Of King Sigurd's Beginning There was an upland man called Marcus of Skog, 
who was a relation of Earl Sigurd. Marcus brought up a son of King Sigurd Munn, who was also called Sigurd. This Sigurd was chosen king, A.D. 1162, by the upland people, by the advice of Earl Sigurd and the other chiefs who had followed King Hakon. They had now a great army, and the troops were divided in two bodies, so that Marcus and the king were less exposed where there was anything to do, and Earl Sigurd and his troop, along with the lender men, were most in the way of danger. They went with their troops mostly through the uplands, and sometimes eastwards to Viking. Erling Skak had his son King Magnus always with him, and he had also the whole fleet and the land defence under him. He was a while in Bergen in autumn. But went from thence eastward to Viken, where he settled in Tunsberg for his winter quarters, A.D. 1163, and collected in Viken all the taxes and revenues that belonged to Magnus as king, and he had many and very fine troops. As Earl Sigurd had but a small part of the country, and kept many men on foot, he soon was in want of money. And where there was no chief in the neighborhood he had to seek money by unlawful ways, sometimes by unfounded accusations and fines, sometimes by open robbery. 10. Earl Sigurd's Condemnation At that time the realm of Norway was in great prosperity. The bonds were rich and powerful, unaccustomed to hostilities or violence, and the oppression of roving troops so that there was soon a great noise and scandal when they were despoiled and robbed. The people of Viken were very friendly to Erling and King Magnus, principally from the popularity of the late King Inga Haraldsson. For the Viking people had always served under his banner. Erling kept a guard in the town, and twelve men were on watch every night. Erling had things regularly with the bonds, at which the misdeeds of Sigurd's people were often talked over. And by the representations of Erling and his adherents, the bonds were brought unanimously to consider that it would be a great good fortune if these bands should be rooted out. Arne, the king's relation, spoke well and long on this subject, and at last severely. And required that all who were at the thing, men at arms, bonds, townsmen, and merchants, should come to the resolution to sentence according to law Earl Sigurd and all his troop, and deliver them to Satan, both living and dead. From the animosity and hatred of the people, this was agreed to by all, and thus the unheard of deed was adopted and confirmed by oath, as if a judgment in the case was delivered there by the thing according to law. The priest rolled the long-winded, who was a very eloquent man, spoke in the case, but his speech was to the same purpose as that of others who had spoken before. Erling gave a feast at Yule in Tunsberg, and paid the wages of the men-at-arms at Candlemas. 11. Of Erling. Earl Sigurd went with his best troops down to Viken, where many people were obliged to submit to his superior force, and many had to pay money. He drove about thus widely higher up the country, penetrating into different districts. But there were some in his troop who desired privately to make peace with Erling. But they got back the answer, that all who asked for their lives should obtain quarter, but they only should get leave to remain in the country who had not been guilty of any great offences against Erling. And when Sigurd's adherents heard that they would not get leave to remain in the country, they held together in one body, for there were many among them who knew for certain that Erling would look upon them as guilty of offences against him. Philip Jurdson made terms with Erling, got his property back, and went home to his farm, but soon after Sigurd's men came there, and killed him. They committed many crimes against each other, and many men were slain in their mutual persecution. But here what was committed by the chiefs only is written down. 12. Erling gets news of Earl Sigurd. It was in the beginning of Lent that news came to Erling that Earl Sigurd intended to come upon him. And news of him came here and there, sometimes nearer, sometimes farther off. Erling sent out spies in all quarters around to discover where they were. Every evening he assembled all the men at arms by the warhorn out of the town. And for a long time in the winter they lay under arms all night, ready to be drawn up in array. At last Erling got intelligence that Sigurd and his followers were not far distant, up at the farm re. Erling then began his expedition out of the town, and took with him all the town's people who were able to carry arms and had arms, and likewise all the merchants, and left only twelve men behind to keep watch in the town. Erling went out of the town on Thursday afternoon, in the second week of Lent. February 19, 
and every man had two days' provisions with him. They marched by night, and it was late before they got out of the town with the men. Two men were with each shield and each horse, and the people, when mustered, were about one thousand two hundred men. When they met their spies, they were informed that Sigurd was at Re, in a house called Rathens, and had five hundred men. Then Erling called together his people, told them the news he had received, and all were eager to hasten their march, fall on them in the houses, or engage them by night. Erling replied to them thus, It is probable that we and Earl Sigurd shall soon meet. There are also many men in this band whose handiwork remains in our memories. Such as cutting down King Inga, and so many more of our friends, that it would take long to reckon them up. These deeds they did by the power of Satan, by witchcraft, and by villainy. For it stands in our laws and country rights, that however highly a man may have been guilty, it shall be called villainy and cowardly murder to kill him in the night. This band has had its luck hitherto by following the counsel of men acquainted with witchcraft and fighting by night, and not in the light of day. And by this proceeding have they been victorious hitherto over the chiefs whose heads they have laid low on the earth. Now we have often seen, and proved, how unsuitable and improper it is to go into battle in the night time. Therefore let us rather have before our eyes the example of chiefs better known to us, and who deserve better to be imitated, and fight by open day in regular battle array, and not steal upon sleeping men in the night. We have people enough against them, so few as they are. Let us, therefore, wait for day and daylight, and keep together in our array in case they attack us. Thereafter the whole army sat down. Some opened up bundles of hay, and made a bed of it for themselves, some sat upon their shields, and thus waited the day dawn. The weather was raw, and there was a wet snowdrift. 13. Of Earl Sigurd's Battle Array Earl Sigurd got the first intelligence of Erling's army, when it was already near to the house. His men got up, and armed themselves, but not knowing how many men Erling had with him, some were inclined to fly, but the most determined to stand. Earl Sigurd was a man of understanding, and could talk well, but certainly was not considered brave enough to take a strong resolution, and indeed the Earl showed a great inclination to fly, for which he got many stinging words from his men-at-arms. As day dawned, they began on both sides to draw up their battle array. Earl Sigurd placed his men on the edge of a ridge between the river and the house, at a place at which a little stream runs into the river. Erling and his people placed their array on the other side of the river, but at the back of his array were men on horseback well armed, who had the king with them. When Earl Sigurd's men saw that there was so great a want of men on their side, they held a council, and were for taking to the forest. But Earl Sigurd said, Ye alleged that I had no courage, but it will now be proved. And let each of you take care not to fail, or fly, before I do so. We have a good battlefield. Let them cross the bridge, but as soon as the banner comes over it let us then rush down the hill upon them, and none desert his neighbor. Earl Sigurd had on a red-brown kirtle, and a red cloak, of which the corners were tied and turned back, shoes on his feet, and a shield and sword called Bastard. The Earl said, God knows that I would rather get at Erling Skak with a stroke of Bastard, than receive much gold. 14. Earl Sigurd's Fall Erling Skak's army wished to go on to the bridge. But Erling told them to go up along the river, which was small, and not difficult to cross, as its banks were flat, and they did so. Earl Sigurd's array proceeded up along the ridge right opposite to them. But as the ridge ended, and the ground was good and level over the river, Erling told his men to sing a paternoster, and beg God to give them the victory who best deserved it. Then they all sang aloud, Kyrie Eleison, and struck with their weapons on their shields. But with this singing three hundred men of Erling's people slipped away and fled. Then Erling and his people went across the river, and the Earl's men raised the war shout, but there was no assault from the ridge down upon Erling's array, but the battle began upon the hill itself. They first used spears then edge weapons. And the Earl's banner soon retired so far back, that Erling and his men scaled the ridge. The battle lasted but a short time before the Earl's men fled to the forest, which they had close behind them. 
This was told Earl Sigurd, and his men bade him fly, but he replied, Let us on while we can. And his men went bravely on, and cut down on all sides. In this tumult fell Earl Sigurd and John Sveinson, and nearly sixty men. Erling lost few men, and pursued the fugitives to the forest. There Erling halted his troops, and turned back. He came just as the king's slaves were about stripping the clothes off Earl Sigurd, who was not quite lifeless. He had put his sword in the sheath, and it lay by his side. Erling took it, struck the slaves with it, and drove them away. Then Erling, with his troops, returned, and sat down in Tunsberg. Seven days after Earl Sigurd's fall Erling's men took Eindride Unge prisoner, and killed him, with all his ship's crew. 15. Marcus of Skog, and Sigurd Sigurdsson. Marcus of Skog, and King Sigurd, his foster son, rode down to Viking toward spring, and there got a ship, but when Erling heard it he went eastwards against them, and they met at Konungahela. Marcus fled with his followers to the island Hysing. And there the country people of Hysing came down in swarms, and placed themselves in Marcus's and Sigurd's array. Erling and his men rode to the shore, but Marcus's men shot at them. Then Erling said to his people, Let us take their ships, but not go up to fight with a land force. The Heisingers are a bad set to quarrel with, hard, and without understanding. They will keep this troop but a little while among them, for Heising is but a small spot. This was done, they took the ships, and brought them over to Konungahela. Marcus and his men went up to the forest district, from which they intended to make assaults, and they had spies out on both sides. Erling had many men at arms with him, whom he brought from other districts, and they made attacks on each other in turn. 16. Beginning of Archbishop Eistian. Eistian, a son of Erland Himade, was selected to be Archbishop, after Archbishop John's death, and he was consecrated the same year King Inga was killed. Now when Archbishop Eistian came to his see, he made himself beloved by all the country, as an excellent active man of high birth. The Thrangem people, in particular, received him with pleasure. For most of the great people in the Thrangem district were connected with the archbishop by relationship or other connection, and all were his friends. The archbishop brought forward a request to the bonds in a speech, in which he set forth the great want of money for the sea, and also how much greater improvement of the revenues would be necessary to maintain it suitably. As it was now of much more importance than formerly when the bishop's see was first established. He requested of the bonds that they should give him, for determining lawsuits, an or of silver value, instead of what they had before paid, which was an or of judgment money, of that kind which was paid to the king in judging cases. And the difference between the two kinds of or was, that the or he desired was a half greater than the other. By help of the archbishop's relations and friends, and his own activity, this was carried. And it was fixed by law in all the Thrangem district, and in all the districts belonging to his archbishopric. 17. Of Marcus and King Sigurd. When Sigurd and Marcus lost their ships in the Gott River, and saw they could get no hold on Erling, they went to the uplands, and proceeded by land north to Thrangem. Sigurd was received there joyfully, and chosen king at an era thing. And many gallant men, with their sons, attached themselves to his party. They fitted out ships, rigged them for a voyage, and proceeded when summer came southwards to moor, and took up all the royal revenues wheresoever they came. At this time the following lender men were appointed in Bergen for the defense of the country, Nicholas Sigurdsson, Nock v. Palsun, and several military leaders, as Thorolf Dierweil, Thorbjorn Jaldkir, and many others. As Marcus and Sigurd sailed south, they heard that Erling's men were numerous in Bergen, and therefore they sailed outside the coast rocks, and southwards past Bergen. It was generally remarked, that Marcus's men always got a fair wind, wherever they wished to sail to. 18. Marcus and King Sigurd killed. As soon as Erling Skak heard that Sigurd and Marcus had sailed southwards, he hastened to Viken, and drew together an armed force, and he soon had a great many men, and many stout ships. But when he came farther in Viken, he met with a strong contrary wind, which kept him there in port the whole summer. Now when Sigurd and Marcus came east to Lister, they heard that Erling had a great force in Viken. 
so they turned to the north again. But when they reached Hordaland, with the intention of sailing to Bergen, and came opposite the town, Nicholas and his men rode out against them, with more men and larger ships than they had. Sigurd and Marcus saw no other way of escaping but to row away southwards. Some of them went out to sea, others got south to the sound, and some got into the fjords. Marcus, and some people with him, sprang upon an isle called Scarpa. Nicholas and his men took their ships, gave John Hockelson and a few others quarter, but killed the most of them they could get hold of. Some days after Eindride Heidefilja found Sigurd and Marcus, and they were brought to Bergen. Sigurd was beheaded outside of Grafdal, and Marcus and another man were hanged at Hvarfsons. This took place on Michaelmas Day, September 29, 1163, and the band which had followed them was dispersed. 19. Erling and the people of Heising Isle. Freirek Kaina and Jarn the Bad, Anand Simonson and Ornolf Skorpa had rowed out to sea with some ships, and sailed outside along the land to the east. Wheresoever they came to the land they plundered, and killed Erling's friends. Now when Erling heard that Sigurd and Marcus were killed, he gave leave to the lendermen and people of the levy to return home. But he himself, with his men, set his course eastward across the Folden Fjord, for he heard of Marcus's men there. Erling sailed to Conungahela, where he remained the autumn. And in the first week of winter Erling went out to the island Heising with his men, and called the bonds to a thing. When the Heising people came to the thing, Erling laid his lawsuit against them for having joined the bands of Sigurd and Marcus, and having raised men against him. A sir was the name of one of the greatest of the bonds on the island, and he answered Erling on account of the others. The thing was long assembled. But at the close the bonds gave the case into Erling's own power, and he appointed a meeting in the town within one week, and named fifteen bonds who should appear there. When they came, he condemned them to pay a penalty of three hundred head of cattle. And the bonds returned home ill-pleased at this sentence. Soon after the Gott River was frozen, and Erling's ships were fast in the ice, and the bonds kept back the mulct, and lay assembled for some time. Erling made a Yule feast in the town. But the Heising people had joint feasts with each other, and kept under arms during Yule. The night after the fifth day of Yule Erling went up to Heising, surrounded a sir's house, and burnt him in it. He killed one hundred men in all, burnt three houses, and then returned to Conungahela. The bonds came then, according to agreement, to pay the mulct. 20. Death of Freirek Kaina and Jarn Erling Skak made ready to sail in spring as soon as he could get his ships afloat for ice, and sailed from Conungahela, for he heard that those who had formerly been Marcus's friends were marauding in the north of Viking. Erling sent out spies to learn their doings, searched for them, and found them lying in a harbour. Anand Simonson and Ornolf Skorpa escaped, but Freirek Kaina and Jarn the Bad were taken, and many of their followers were killed. Erling had Freirek bound to an anchor and thrown overboard, and for that deed Erling was much detested in the Thrandjum country, for the most powerful men there were relatives of Freirek. Erling ordered Jarn the Bad to be hanged. And he uttered, according to his custom, many dreadful imprecations during his execution. Thorbjorn Skakaskald tells of this business. East of the fjord beyond the land. Unnoticed by the pirate band. Erling stole on them ere they knew. And seized and killed all Kaina's crew. Kaina, fast to an anchor bound. Was thrown into the deep blue sound. And Jarn swung high on gallows tree. A sight all good men loved to see. Anand and Arnulf, with the band that had escaped, fled to Denmark. But were sometimes in Gotland, or in Viking. 21. Conference between Erling and Eistian. Erling Skak sailed after this to Tunsberg, and remained there very long in spring, A.D. 1164. But when summer came he proceeded north to Bergen, where at that time a great many people were assembled. There was the legate from Rome, Stephanus, the Archbishop Eistian, and other bishops of the country. There was also Bishop Brand, who was consecrated Bishop of Iceland, and John Lopson, a daughter's son of King Magnus Barefoot, and on this occasion King Magnus and John's other relations acknowledged the relationship with him. 
Archbishop Eistian and Erling Skak often conversed together in private. And, among other things, Erling asked one day, Is it true, sir, what people tell me, that you have raised the value of the ore upon the people north in Thrandjum, in the law cases in which money fees are paid you? It is so, said the archbishop, that the bonds have allowed me an advance on the ore of law casualties. But they did it willingly, and without any kind of compulsion, and have thereby added to their honor for God and the income of the bishopric. Erling replies, Is this according to the law of the holy Olaf? Or have you gone to work more arbitrarily in this than is written down in the law book? The archbishop replies, King Olaf the holy fixed the laws, to which he received the consent and affirmative of the people. But it will not be found in his laws that it is forbidden to increase God's right. Erling, if you augment your right, you must assist us to augment as much the king's right. The archbishop, thou hast already augmented enough thy son's power and dominion. And if I have exceeded the law in taking an increase of the or from the Thrangian people, it is, I think, a much greater breach of the law that one is king over the country who is not a king's son, and which has neither any support in the law. Nor in any precedent here in the country. Erling, when Magnus was chosen king, it was done with your knowledge and consent, and also of all the other bishops here in the country. Archbishop, you promised then, Erling, that provided we gave our consent to electing Magnus king, you would, on all occasions, and with all your power, strengthen God's rights. Erling, I may well admit that I have promised to preserve and strengthen God's commands and the laws of the land with all my power, and with the king's strength. And now I consider it to be much more advisable, instead of accusing each other of a breach of our promises, to hold firmly by the agreement entered into between us. Do you strengthen Magnus in his dominion, according to what you have promised? And I will, on my part, strengthen your power in all that can be of advantage or honor. The conversation now took a more friendly turn. And Erling said, Although Magnus was not chosen king according to what has been the old custom of this country, yet can you with your power give him consecration as king, as God's law prescribes, by anointing the king to sovereignty. And although I be neither a king, nor of kingly race, yet most of the kings, within my recollection, have not known the laws or the constitution of the country so well as I do. Besides, the mother of King Magnus is the daughter of a king and queen born in lawful wedlock, and Magnus is son of a queen and a lawfully married wife. Now if you will give him royal consecration, no man can take royalty from him. William Bastard was not a king's son, but he was consecrated and crowned king of England, and the royalty in England has ever since remained with his race, and all have been crowned. Sven son was not a king's son in Denmark, and still he was a crowned king, and his sons likewise, and all his descendants have been crowned kings. Now we have here in Norway an archiepiscopal seat, to the glory and honor of the country. Let us also have a crowned king, as well as the Danes and Englishmen. Erling and the archbishop afterwards talked often of this matter, and they were quite agreed. Then the archbishop brought the business before the legate, and got him easily persuaded to give his consent. Thereafter the archbishop called together the bishops, and other learned men, and explained the subject to them. They all replied in the same terms, that they would follow the counsels of the archbishop, and all were eager to promote the consecration as soon as the archbishop pleased. 22. King Magnus' Consecration Erling Skak then had a great feast prepared in the king's house. The large hall was covered with costly cloth and tapestry, and adorned with great expense. The courtmen and all the attendants were there entertained, and there were numerous guests, and many chiefs. Then King Magnus received the royal consecration from the Archbishop Eistian. And at the consecration there were five other bishops and the legate, besides a number of other clergy. Erling Skak, and with him twelve other lendermen, administered to the king the oath of the law. And the day of the consecration the king and Erling had the legate, the archbishop, and all the other bishops as guests, and the feast was exceedingly magnificent, and the father and son distributed many great presents. King Magnus was then eight years of age, and had been king for three years. 23. King Valdemar's Embassy 
When the Danish king Valdemar heard the news from Norway that Magnus was become king of the whole country, and all the other parties in the country were rooted out, he sent his men with a letter to King Magnus and Erling. And reminded them of the agreement which Erling had entered into, under oath, with King Valdemar, of which we have spoken before. Namely, that Viking from the east to Regiarbit should be ceded to King Valdemar, if Magnus became the sole king of Norway. When the ambassadors came forward and showed Erling the letter of the Danish king, and he heard the Danish king's demand upon Norway, he laid it before the other chiefs by whose counsels he usually covered his acts. All, as one man, replied that the Danes should never hold the slightest portion of Norway, for never had things been worse in the land than when the Danes had power in it. The ambassadors of the Danish king were urgent with Erling for an answer, and desired to have it decided. But Erling begged them to proceed with him east to Viken, and said he would give his final answer when he had met with the men of most understanding and influence in Viken. 24. Erling and the People of Viken Erling Skak proceeded in autumn to Viken, and stayed in Tunsberg, from whence he sent people to Sarpsborg to summon a thing, one, of four districts, and then Erling went there with his people. When the thing was seated Erling made a speech in which he explained the resolutions which had been settled upon between him and the Danish king, the first time he collected troops against his enemies. I will, said Erling, keep faithfully the agreement which we then entered into with the king, if it be your will and consent, bonds, rather to serve the Danish king than the king who is now consecrated and crowned king of this country. The bonds replied thus to Erling's speech, Never will we become the Danish king's men, as long as one of us Viking men is in life. And the whole assembly, with shouts and cries, called on Erling to keep the oath he had taken to defend his son's dominions, should we even all follow thee to battle. And so the thing was dissolved. The ambassadors of the Danish king then returned home, and told the issue of their errand. The Danes abused Erling, and all Northmen, and declared that evil only proceeded from them. And the report was spread, that in spring the Danish king would send out an army and lay waste Norway. Erling returned in autumn north to Bergen, stayed there all winter, and gave their pay to his people. End notes. 1. This reference to a thing of the people in the affairs of. The country is a striking example of the right of the things. Being recognized, in theory at least, as fully as the right. Of our parliaments in later times. L. 25. Letters of the Thrangem people. The same winter, A.D. 1165, some Danish people came by land through the uplands, saying they were to go, as was then the general practice, to the Holy King Olaf's festival. But when they came to the Thrangem country, they went to many men of influence, and told their business. Which was, that the Danish king had sent them to desire their friendship, and consent, if he came to the country, promising them both power and money. With this verbal message came also the Danish king's letter and seal, and a message to the Thrangem people that they should send back their letters and seals to him. They did so, and the most of them received well the Danish king's message. Whereupon the messengers returned back towards Lent. Erling was in Bergen. And towards spring Erling's friends told him the loose reports they had heard by some merchant vessels that had arrived from Thrangem, that the Thrangem people were in hostility openly against him and had declared that if Erling came to Thrangem, he should never pass Agdanes in life. Erling said this was mere folly and idle talk. Erling now made it known that he would go to Anarheim to the Gangdag thing, and ordered a cutter of twenty rowing benches to be fitted out, a boat of fifteen benches, and a provision ship. When the vessels were ready, there came a strong southerly gale. On the Thursday of the Ascension week, Erling called his people by sound of trumpet to their departure, but the men were loath to leave the town, and were ill inclined to row against the wind. Erling brought his vessels to Biskupshafen. Well, said Erling, since ye are so unwilling to row against the wind, raise the mast, hoist the sails, and let the ship go north. They did so, and sailed northwards both day and night. On Wednesday, in the evening, they sailed and passed Agdanes, where they found a fleet assembled of many merchant vessels, rowing craft, and boats, all going towards the town to the celebration of the festival, some before them. Some behind them, 
so that the townspeople paid no attention to the long ship's coming. 26. Erling and the people of Thrandjum. Erling came to the town just as Vespers was being sung in Christ Church. He and his men ran into the town, to where it was told them that the lenderman, Alf Rode, a son of Otter Birding, was still sitting at table, and drinking with his men. Erling fell upon them, and Alf was killed, with almost all his men. Few other men were killed, for they had almost all gone to church, as this was the night before Christ's Ascension Day. In the morning early, Erling called all the people by sound of trumpet to a thing out upon Ever. At the thing Erling laid a charge against the Thrandjum people, accusing them of intending to betray the country, and take it from the king. And named Bard Standale, Pal Andreessen, and Razabard, who then presided over the town's affairs, and many others. They, in their defense, denied the accusation. But Erling's writer stood up, produced many letters with seals, and asked if they acknowledged their seals which they had sent to the Danish king, and thereupon the letters were read. There was also a Danish man with Erling who had gone with the letters in winter, and whom Erling for that purpose had taken into his service. He told to these men the very words which each of them had used. And you, Razabard, spoke, striking your breast, and the very words you used were, Out of this breast are all these counsels produced. Bard replied, I was wrong in the head, sirs, when I spoke so. There was now nothing to be done but to submit the case entirely to the sentence Erling might give upon it. He took great sums of money from many as fines, and condemned all those who had been killed as lawless, and their deeds as lawless. Making their deaths thereby not subject to mulct. Then Erling returned south to Bergen. 27. King Valdemar's Expedition to Norway The Danish King Valdemar assembled in spring, A.D. 1165, a great army, and proceeded with it north to Viking. As soon as he reached the dominions of the King of Norway, the bonds assembled in a great multitude. The king advanced peacefully. But when they came to the mainland, the people shot at them even when there were only two or three together, from which the ill will of the country people towards them was evident. When they came to Tunsberg, King Valdemar summoned a Hogathing. But nobody attended it from the country parts. Then Valdemar spoke thus to his troops, It is evident that all the country people are against us. And now we have two things to choose, the one to go through the country, sword in hand, sparing neither man nor beast, the other is to go back without affecting our object. And it is more my inclination to go with the army to the east against the heathens, of whom we have enough before us in the east country, than to kill Christian people here, although they have well deserved it. All the others had a greater desire for a foray, but the king ruled, and they all returned back to Denmark without affecting their purpose. They pillaged, however, all around in the distant islands, or where the king was not in the neighborhood. They then returned south to Denmark without doing anything. 28. Erling's Expedition to Jutland As soon as Erling heard that a Danish force had come to Viking, he ordered a levy through all the land, both of men and ships, so that there was a great assemblage of men in arms, and with this force he proceeded eastward along the coast. But when he came to Ladandisens, he heard that the Danish army had returned south to Denmark, after plundering all around them in Viking. Then Erling gave all the people of the levy permission to return home. But he himself and some lender men, with many vessels, sailed to Jutland after the Danes. When they came to a place called Dursa, the Danes who had returned from the expedition lay there with many ships. Erling gave them battle, and there was a fight, in which the Danes soon fled with the loss of many people, and Erling and his men plundered the ships and the town, and made a great booty, with which they returned to Norway. Thereafter, for a time, there was hostility between Norway and Denmark. 29. Erling's Expedition to Denmark The Princess Crisfin went south in autumn, A.D. 1165, to Denmark, to visit her relation King Valdemar, who was her cousin. The king received her kindly, and gave her fiefs in his kingdom, so that she could support her household well. She often conversed with the king, who was remarkably kind towards her. In the spring following, A.D. 1166, Kristen sent to Erling, and begged him to pay a visit to the Danish king, and enter into a peace with him. 
In summer Erling was in Viking, where he fitted out a long ship, manned it with his finest lads, and sailed, a single ship, over to Jutland. When he heard that the Danish king Valdemar was in Randeros, Erling sailed thither, and came to the town just as the king sat at the dinner table, and most of the people were taking their meal. When his people had made themselves ready according to Erling's orders, set up the ship tents, and made fast the ship, Erling landed with twelve men, all in armor, with hats over their helmets, and swords under their cloaks. They went to the king's lodging, where the doors stood open, and the dishes were being carried in. Erling and his people went in immediately, and drew up in front of the high seat. Erling said, Peace and safe conduct we desire, king, both here and to return home. The king looked at him, and said, Art thou here, Erling? He replies, Here is Erling, and tell us, at once, if we shall have peace and safe conduct. There were eighty of the king's men in the room, but all unarmed. The king replies, Peace ye shall have, Erling, according to thy desire, for I will not use force or villainy against a man who comes to visit me. Erling then kissed the king's hand, went out, and down to his ship. Erling stayed at Randero some time with the king, and they talked about terms of peace between them and between the countries. They agreed that Erling should remain as hostage with the Danish king, and that as Bjorn Snara, Bishop Absalon's brother, should go to Norway as hostage on the other part. 30. King Valdemar and Erling In a conference which King Valdemar and Erling once had together. Erling said, Sire, it appears to me likely that it might lead to a peace between the countries if you got that part of Norway which was promised you in our agreement. But if it should be so, what chief would you place over it? Would he be a Dane? No, replied the king, no Danish chief would go to Norway, where he would have to manage an obstinate hard people, when he has it so easy here with me. Erling, it was on that very consideration that I came here, for I would not on any account in the world deprive myself of the advantage of your friendship. In days of old other men, Hakan Ivarsson and Finn Arneson, came also from Norway to Denmark, and your predecessor, King Sven, made them both earls. Now I am not a man of less power in Norway than they were then, and my influence is not less than theirs, and the king gave them the province of Halland to rule over, which he himself had and owned before. Now it appears to me, sire, that you, if I become your man and vassal, can allow me to hold of you the fief which my son Magnus will not deny me, by which I will be bound in duty, and ready, to undertake all the service belonging to that title. Erling spoke such things, and much more in the same strain, until it came at last to this, that Erling became Valdemar's man and vassal. And the king led Erling to the earl's seat one day, and gave him the title of earl, and Viking as a fief under his rule. Earl Erling went thereafter to Norway, and was Earl afterwards as long as he lived. And also the peace with the Danish king was afterwards always preserved. Earl Erling had four sons by his concubines. The one was called Hrydar, the next Ogmund. And these by two different mothers, the third was called Finn. The fourth Sigurd, these were younger, and their mother was Asa the Fair. The Princess Kristen and Earl Erling had a daughter called Ragenhild, who was married to John Thorbergsen of Randeburg. Kristen went away from the country with a man called Grim Russell, and they went to Constantinople, where they were for a time, and had some children. 31. Beginning of Olaf Olaf, a son of Gudbrand Skafhog, and Maria, a daughter of King Eystein Magnusson, were brought up in the house of Sigurd Agenhot in the uplands. While Earl Erling was in Denmark, A.D. 1166, Olaf and his foster father gathered a troop together, and many upland people joined them, and Olaf was chosen king by them. They went with their bands through the uplands, and sometimes down to Viken, and sometimes east to the forest settlements, but never came on board of ships. Now when, Earl Erling got news of this troop, he hastened to Viken with his forces. And was there in summer in his ships, and in Oslo in autumn, A.D. 1167, and kept Yule there. He had spies up the country after this troop, and went himself, along with O.R.M., the king brother, up the country to follow them. Now when they came to a lake called. 1. They took all the vessels that were upon the lake. End notes. 1. 
the name of the lake not given. 32. Of Erling. The priest who performed divine service at a place called Ridiocal, close by the lake, invited the earl to a feast at Candlemas. The earl promised to come. And thinking it would be good to hear mass there, he rode with his attendants over the lake the night before Candlemas Day. But the priest had another plan on hand. He sent men to bring Olaf news of Earl Erling's arrival. The priest gave Erling strong drink in the evening, and let him have an excessive quantity of it. When the Earl wished to lie down and sleep, the beds were made ready in the drinking room. But when they had slept a short time the Earl awoke, and asked if it was not the hour for matins. The priest replied, that only a small part of the night was gone, and told him to sleep in peace. The Earl replied, I dream of many things tonight, and I sleep ill. He slumbered again, but awoke soon, and told the priest to get up and sing Mass. The priest told the Earl to sleep, and said it was but midnight. Then the Earl again lay down, slept a little while, and, springing out of bed, ordered his men to put on their clothes. They did so, took their weapons, went to the church, and laid their arms outside while the priest was singing Matins. 33. Battle at Ridiocal. As Olaf got the message in the evening, they traveled in the night six miles, which people considered an extraordinarily long march. They arrived at Ridiocal while the priest was still singing mass, and it was pitch dark. Olaf and his men went into the room, raised a war shout, and killed some of the Earl's men who had not gone to the early mass. Now when Erling and his men heard the war shout, they ran to their weapons, and hastened down to their ships. Olaf and his men met them at a fence, at which there was a sharp conflict. Erling and his men retreated along the fence, which protected them. Erling had far fewer men, and many of them had fallen, and still more were wounded. What helped Earl Erling and his men the most was, that Olaf's men could not distinguish them, it was so dark, and the Earl's men were always drawing down to their ships. Arthur Gerson, father of Bishop Gudmund fell there, and many other of Erling's court men. Erling himself was wounded in the left side, but some say he did it himself in drawing his sword. Orm the king brother was also severely wounded. And with great difficulty they escaped to their ships, and instantly pushed off from land. It was generally considered as a most unlucky meeting for Olaf's people, as Earl Erling was in a manner sold into their hands, if they had proceeded with common prudence. He was afterwards called Olaf the Unlucky. But others called his people Hatlads. They went with their bands through the uplands as before. Erling again went down to Viking to his ships, and remained there all summer. Olaf was in the uplands, and sometimes east in the forest districts, where he and his troop remained all the next winter, A.D. 1168. 34. Battle at Stanger the following spring the Hatlads went down to Viking, and raised the king's taxes all around, and remained there long in summer. When Earl Erling heard this, he hastened with his troops to meet them in Viking, and fell in with them east of the fjord, at a place called Stangar, where they had a great battle, in which Erling was victorious. Sigurd Agnhat, and many others of Olaf's men, fell there, but Olaf escaped by flight, went south to Denmark, and was all winter, A.D. 1169, in Olleborg in Jutland. The following spring Olaf fell into an illness which ended in death, and he was buried in the Maria Church, and the Danes call him a saint. 35. Harold's Death King Magnus had a lenderman called Nicholas Cufung, who was a son of Pal Skaptison. He took Harold prisoner, who called himself a son of King Sigurd Haraldson and the Princess Kristen, and a brother of King Magnus by the mother's side. Nicholas brought Harold to Bergen, and delivered him into Earl Erling's hands. It was Erling's custom when his enemies came before him, that he either said nothing to them, or very little, and that in all gentleness, when he had determined to put them to death. Or rose with furious words against them, when he intended to spare their lives. Erling spoke but little to Harold, and many, therefore, suspected his intentions, and some begged King Magnus to put in a good word for Harold with the Earl. And the King did so. The Earl replies, Thy friends advise thee badly. Thou wouldst govern this kingdom but a short time in peace and safety, 
if thou wert to follow the counsels of the heart only. Earl Erling ordered Harold to be taken to Nordens, where he was beheaded. 36. Eistian Eisteinsen and the Birkbanes. There was a man called Eistian, who gave himself out for a son of King Eistian Haraldson. He was at this time young, and not full grown. It is told of him that he one summer appeared in Svithjad, and went to Earl Berger Brosa, who was then married to Brigida, Eistian's aunt, a daughter of King Harald Gil. Eistian explained his business to him, and asked their assistance. Both Earl Berger and his wife listened to him in a friendly way, and promised him their confidence, and he stayed with them a while. Earl Berger gave him some assistance of men, and a good sum for traveling expenses, and both promised him their friendship on his taking leave. Thereafter Eistian proceeded north into Norway, A.D. 1174, and when he came down to Viking people flocked to him in crowds, and Eistian was their proclaimed king, and he remained in Viken in winter. As they were very poor in money, they robbed all around, wherefore the lendermen and bonds raised men against them, and being thus overpowered by numbers, they fled away to the forests and deserted hill grounds, where they lived for a long time. Their clothes being worn out, they wound the bark of the birch tree about their legs, and thus were called by the bonds birkbanes. They often rushed down upon the settled districts, pushed on here or there, and made an assault where they did not find many people to oppose them. They had several battles with the bonds with various success. And the Birkbanes held three battles in regular array, and gained the victory in them all. At Krokoskog they had nearly made an unlucky expedition, for a great number of bonds and men-at-arms were assembled there against them. But the Birkbanes felled brushwood across the roads, and retired into the forest. They were two years, A.D. 1175-1176, in Viking before they showed themselves in the northern parts of the country. 37. Birkbanes, King Eistian, and Skak. Magnus had been king for thirteen years when the Birkbanes first made their appearance. They got themselves ships in the third summer, A.D. 1176, with which they sailed along the coast gathering goods and men. They were first in Viking. But when summer advanced they proceeded northwards, and so rapidly that no news preceded them until they came to Thrandjum. The Birkbane's troop consisted principally of hillmen and elfgrims, and many were from Thelemark, and all were well armed. Their king, Eistian, was a handsome man, and with a little but good countenance, and he was not of great stature, for his men called him Eistian Mela. King Magnus and Earl Erling were in Bergen when the Birkbane's sailed past it to the north. But they did not hear of them. Earl Erling was a man of great understanding and power, an excellent leader in war, and an able and prudent ruler of the country, but he had the character of being cruel and severe. The cause of this was principally that he never allowed his enemies to remain in the country, even when they prayed to him for mercy, and therefore many joined the bands which were collected against him. Erling was a tall strong-made man, somewhat short-necked and high-shouldered, had a long and sharp countenance of a light complexion, and his hair became very grey. He bore his head a little on one side, was free and agreeable in his manners. He wore the old fashion of clothes, long body pieces and long arms to his coats, foreign cloak, and high shoes. He made the king wear the same kind of dress in his youth, but when he grew up, and acted for himself, he dressed very sumptuously. King Magnus was of a light turn of mind, full of jokes, a great lover of mirth, and not less of women. 38 of Nicholas. Nicholas was a son of Sigurd Franesson and of Skialdver, a daughter of Brynjolf Ulfold, and a sister of Halder Brynjolfsson by the father's side, and of King Magnus Barefoot by the mother's side. Nicholas was a distinguished chief, who had a farm at Ongol in Halagaland, which was called Stieg. Nicholas had also a house in Nidaros, below St. John's Church, where Thorgir the scribe lately dwelt. Nicholas was often in the town, and was president of the townspeople. Skialdver, Nicholas's daughter, was married to Eirik Arneson, who was also a lenderman. 39. Of Eirik and Nicholas. As the people of the town were coming from Madden's the last day of Merry Mass, September 8, Eirik came up to Nicholas, and said, Here are some fishermen come from the sea, 
who report that some long ships are sailing into the fjord. And people conjecture that these may be the Birkbanes. It would be advisable to call the townspeople together with the war horns, to meet under arms out on Arar. Nicholas replies, I don't go after fishermen's reports. But I shall send out spies to the fjord, and in the meantime hold a thing today. Eirik went home, but when they were ringing to high mass, and Nicholas was going to church, Eirik came to hint again, and said, I believe the news to be true. For here are men who say they saw them under sail, and I think it would be most advisable to ride out of town, and gather men with arms, for it appears to me the townspeople will be too few. Nicholas replies, Thou art mixing everything together. Let us first hear Mass, and then take our resolution. Nicholas then went into the church. When the Mass was over Eirik went to Nicholas, and said, My horses are saddled, I will ride away. Nicholas replies, Farewell, then, we will hold a thing today on the Arar, and examine what force of men there may be in the town. Eirik rode away, and Nicholas went to his house, and then to dinner. 40. The Fall of Nicholas The meat was scarcely put on the table, when a man came into the house to tell Nicholas that the Birkbanes were roving up the river. Then Nicholas called to his men to take their weapons. When they were armed Nicholas ordered them to go up into the loft. But that was a most imprudent step, for if they had remained in the yard, the townspeople might have come to their assistance. But now the Birkbanes filled the whole yard, and from thence scrambled from all sides up to the loft. They called to Nicholas, and offered him quarter, but he refused it. Then they attacked the loft. Nicholas and his men defended themselves with bow shot, hand shot, and stones of the chimney, but the Birkbanes hewed down the houses, broke up the loft, and returned shot for shot from bow or hand. Nicholas had a red shield in which were gilt nails, and about it was a border of stars. The Birkbanes shot so that the arrows went in up to the arrow feather. Then said Nicholas, My shield deceives me. Nicholas and a number of his people fell, and his death was greatly lamented. The Birkbanes gave all the townspeople their lives. 41. Eistian proclaimed king. Eistian was then proclaimed king, and all the people submitted to him. He stayed a while in the town, and then went into the interior of the Thrangem land, where many joined him, and among them Thorfinn Svart of Snows with a troop of people. When the Birkbanes, in the beginning of winter, A.D. 1177, came again into the town, the sons of Gudrun from Saltons, John Ketling, Sigurd, and William, joined them, and when they proceeded afterwards from Nidaros up or Cadel, they could number nearly two thousand men. They afterwards went to the uplands, and on to Thoten and Hadeland, and from thence to Ringerike, and subdued the country where Suver they came. 42. The Fall of King Eistian King Magnus went eastward to Viken in autumn with a part of his men and with him O.R.M., the king's brother, but Earl Erling remained behind in Bergen to meet the Birkbanes in case they took the sea route. King Magnus went to Tunsberg, where he and O.R.M. held their Yule, A.D. 1177. When King Magnus heard that the Birkbanes were up in Rhee, the king and O.R.M. proceeded thither with their men. There was much snow, and it was dreadfully cold. When they came to the farm they left the beaten track on the road, and drew up their array outside of the fence, and trod a path through the snow with their men, who were not quite fifteen hundred in number. The Birkbanes were dispersed here and there in other farms, a few men in each house. When they perceived King Magnus' army they assembled, and drew up in regular order. And as they thought their force was larger than his, which it actually was, they resolved to fight. But when they hurried forward to the road only a few could advance at a time, which broke their array, and the men fell who first advanced upon the beaten way. Then the Birkbane's banner was cut down. Those who were nearest gave way and some took to flight. King Magnus' men pursued them, and killed one after the other as they came up with them. Thus the Birkbanes could never form themselves in array. And being exposed to the weapons of the enemy singly, many of them fell, and many fled. It happened here, as it often does, that although men be brave and gallant, if they have once been defeated and driven to flight, they will not easily be brought to turn round. 
Now the main body of the Birkbanes began to fly, and many fell. Because Magnus' men killed all they could lay hold of, and not one of them got quarter. The whole body became scattered far and wide. Eistian in his flight ran into a house, and begged for his life, and that the bond would conceal him. But the bond killed him, and then went to King Magnus, whom he found at Rathens, where the king was in a room warming himself by the fire along with many people. Some went for the corpse, and bore it into the room, where the king told the people to come and inspect the body. A man was sitting on a bench in the corner, and he was a Birkbine, but nobody had observed him. And when he saw and recognized his chief's body he sprang up suddenly and actively, rushed out upon the floor, and with an axe he had in his hands made a blow at King Magnus' neck between the shoulders. A man saw the axe swinging, and pulled the king to a side, by which the axe struck lower in the shoulder, and made a large wound. He then raised the axe again, and made a blow at O.R.M., the king brother, who was lying on a bench, and the blow was directed at both legs. But O.R.M., seeing the man about to kill him, drew in his feet instantly, threw them over his head, and the blow fell on the bench, in which the axe stuck fast, and then the blows at the birkbine came so thick that he could scarcely fall to the ground. It was discovered that he had dragged his entrails after him over the floor, and this man's bravery was highly praised. King Magnus' men followed the fugitives, and killed so many that they were tired of it. Thorfinn of Snows, and a very great number of Thrangem people, fell there. 43. Of the Birkbanes. The faction which called itself the Birkbanes had gathered together in great numbers. They were a hardy people, and the boldest of men under arms but wild, and going forward madly when they had a strong force. They had few men in their faction who were good counselors, or accustomed to rule a country by law, or to head an army. And if there were such men among them who had more knowledge, yet the many would only allow of those measures which they liked, trusting always to their numbers and courage. Of the men who escaped many were wounded, and had lost both their clothes and their arms, and were altogether destitute of money. Some went east to the borders, some went all the way east to Svithjod. But the most of them went to Thelemark, where they had their families. All took flight, as they had no hope of getting their lives from King Magnus or Earl Erling. 44. Of King Magnus Erlingson. King Magnus then returned to Tunsberg, and got great renown by this victory, for it had been an expression in the mouths of all, that Earl Erling was the shield and support of his son and himself. But after gaining a victory over so strong and numerous a force with fewer troops, King Magnus was considered by all as surpassing other leaders, and that he would become a warrior as much greater than his father, Earl Erling, as he was younger.